Red button. Red buttons. My gavel is over the red button. Okay. I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is a scheduled meeting of the State Board of Canvassers. I'm Norm Shankel. And the agenda, uh, as passed out, is uh, a little bit different in format because of the nature of this meeting. We have today 32 staff reports on petitions uh, for folks to get on the ballot. It's and these are reports of sufficiency or insufficiency to appear on the ballot. So it's like 32 small contest trials, if you would. And we're trying to get through them today efficiently. So we can't have everybody who wants to speak and everyone speak. So what we've done is we front end loaded the agenda with public comment. So if you're not the candidate or the a challenger authorized by the candidate, so we have a one speaker for the candidate, one speaker, the challenger candidate, so two speakers per, per staff report, in addition to staff, they're gonna speak. So if you're not one of those two people, if you wanna talk on it, you gotta talk under public comment, which is the first thing on our agenda. That would be the white uh, form that says public on it. Fill one of these out, get it up here. We have several up here right now. We're gonna give a 90 seconds for every person who wants to speak under public comment. Except for the first one, the gentleman is representing the Republican Party. I told him he can have an extra minute. Uh, Paul Cordes, you're the first person I'm calling up. Uh, we have a witness. Stand. You can actually sit. Usually, Paul, when uh, we're doing this, uh, you have to stand up. But today you can sit. Under public comment, uh, 
who's representing us? Uh, Heather's down there. Do I need to swear them in if they're under public comment? Okay, uh, Paul, raise your right hand, please. You saw me swear what you're about to say. Today's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you, God. And we just, for you, for the record, to state and spell your name. The red button. Paul Cordes. <laughs> P-A-U-L-C-O-R-D-E-S. Um, good morning. I am uh, the chief of staff of the Michigan Republican Party. I appreciate your time this morning, um, as well as your service on this board. Um, I'm here today to urge you to reject the recommendations of the Secretary of State's office to disqualify five Republican gubernatorial candidates from the ballot. Um, I want to start with the law and Secretary Benson's guidance regarding the evaluation of signatures. The state has a duty to determine whether each one of the signatures on a nominating petition are valid and genuine. By statute, the board shall verify the genuineness of a signature by comparing the petition signature with the digitized signatures in the qualified voter file. In plain English, the board has an obligation to verify the genuineness of each and every signature on a nominating petition by comparing it to the digitized signature in the QVS. That was not done here. Secretary Benson has further instructed the Bureau of Elections and the members of the board that when canvassing nominating petitions, they must perform their signature verification duties with the presumption that a voter's petition signature is his or her genuine signature. And in comparing signatures, the board and the Bureau should treat the signature as valid if there are any redeeming qualities in the petition signature as compared to the signature on file. That was not the standard that was followed. You cannot have two sets of rules. You cannot change the rules midway through the game. I don't refute that systematic fraud occurred, but both the law and Secretary Benson's own guidance on evaluating signatures prohibits the wholesale rejection of pages of petitions and tens of thousands of signatures without any review. The opposite was done here. It is especially important these rules be followed given the fact that candidates have no access to the signature files and did not receive a line-by-line -line account of every rejected signature to contest what many times is a subjective decision by a BOE staff member. Candidates have no way to defend their signatures, which is why the burden is placed on the challengers and on the state. The burden has not been met. Frankly, the public interest is not being served here either. Disqualifying two of the highest polling candidates in this primary, as well as three others who have expended significant resources in their campaigns, is disenfranchising to Republican voters who ultimately should be the decision makers in who their candidate for government is this cycle. I'm leaving behind a memo written by our general counsel, which I would ask that each of the canvassers read prior to any votes today. I strongly and respectfully urge the Board of Canvassers to reject the recommendations of the staff and vote in favor of allowing all five GOP candidates for governor to be on the ballot. Thank you for your time. Okay. Any questions from the witness? Paul, thanks for coming in. I still read, I'm still read, I can speak. Okay, uh, next witness, uh, I, oh, thank you. I'd like to call on uh, Hattie Abozed, A-B-O-U-Z-E-I-D. And you're a licensed attorney in Michigan, so uh, please, for the record, uh, state and spell your name. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Hattie Abouzaid, H-A-D-D-Y. Last name A-B-O-U-Z-E-I-D, is in David. Good morning to this esteemed panel. Before I begin, I would like to state for the record that I am speaking here today in my professional capacity, or not in my professional capacity, but rather in my personal capacity as a friend and concerned citizen and longtime resident of the state of Michigan. I have known Michael Tenney for over 10 years. During this decade, I have come to know him as a person of integrity and strong character, a hard worker, a public servant, a father, a husband, and a tremendous friend, a person that has had a long-standing dream to become a lawyer and a judge, and now places his faith in this panel to render a decision consistent with fundamental fairness and reasonableness. In reference to judicial candidate Michael Tinney, it has been recommended by the Bureau of Elections that his petition is insufficient due to a mere heading defect, nothing more. No fraud, no authenticity issues with signatures, nothing else but a simple heading defect. If this esteemed panel follows such an inflexible recommendation given the particular circumstances in this matter, it would effectively bar him from the election ballot and would eliminate him as the only other option for the citizens of Taylor, Michigan to consider in selecting who they wish to represent them as a judge in the 23rd District Court. I sincerely urge this panel to pause and seriously consider the equity in this case. The challenge to Mr. Tinney's petition can be aptly described as a mere clerical error 
and should not be or should not result in an elimination of his judicial candidacy this term. In accordance with Michigan law, equity, quote, allows complete justice to be done in a case by, quote, adapting its judgments to the special circumstances of the case. There are four important considerations I'd like this panel to consider. One, there was no intent to mislead. This was a clerical error uh, equivalent to a typo, essentially. No allegation of fraudulent obtainment of signatures was in this case. Third, no question as to the authenticity of the signatures. And four, there is no reasonable opportunity to cure any heading defect in this particular matter. I again strongly urge this esteemed panel to certify Michael Tinney to the ballot in this year's election in the 23rd District Court. To do otherwise, given the circumstances, would be patently unfair to a person that has spent the overwhelming majority of his legal career in public service and simply wishes to have the potential opportunity to serve his community in a different capacity. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thanks for coming in. We'll take uh, your comments into consideration when we get to Mr. Tenney's uh, spot on our agenda. Next, I'd like to call on uh, Michael Glenn. G-L-Y-N-N-E. I can spell it better than I can pronounce it. Oh, you did a great job. Okay. <laughs> well, yours was okay. Uh, the previous witness was a little more difficult. And uh, seeing you're a licensed attorney, please, uh, for the record, uh, state and spell your name. Yes, sir. My first name is Michael. It, and actually, in, in the bar, it's, it's Michal, but Michael is the American way of saying the Irish Michael. So it's M-I-C-H-E-A-L is my legal spelling. My last name, G-L-Y-N-N-E. And just like Mr. Abu Zaid, I'm not speaking in my professional capacity. I'm speaking as a concerned citizen and uh, a friend of Michael Tenney, which would be item 36. Um, I, I can't speak as eloquently as my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Abu Zaid, but I can say that, you know, equity is, is truth in action. And the truth is, is that if you deny Mike Tenney the ability to be on the ballot, 63,409 citizens of the, the city of Taylor will be denied an option. The only other option to the status quo if this continues, this moves forward. But you ask yourself, what is equity? Well, equity is objectively fairness and justice. And, and what would be fair in this case? What would be the truth in this case? The truth is, is that if you knock Mike Tenney off the ballot, Michael Tenney, then the citizens of Taylor don't have a choice. You've effectively disenfranchised their right to vote. You're not giving them the ability. I mean, they have two options. They can either show up and vote or they can't because when they do show up and vote, there's only one option. And we all know that the, the option for a write-in candidate in a general election in November is just is simply unattainable. A lot of money, resources, and time has been put into this campaign by Mr. Tenney. And like my colleague, Mr. Abizade said, there's no evidence of fraud. The signatures were validly obtained. They were validly submitted. There was no time to cure any defect. But the truth is, is that, you know, did Mike mess up? Sure. But in equity, which is fairness, using an objective standard of, of justice, allowing Mike Tinney to stay on the ballot would be the only thing that should matter. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I know that you do a great job and you have a very difficult job, but your job allows discretion. And that's what we're asking for today. And I'm gonna leave you with this quote, look, being good is easy, but what is difficult is being just. All I ask for you is to be just and allow Mike Tinney to stay on the ballot. That's the only thing you can do for the citizens of Taylor. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Michael. I'd like to call on now uh, James Fleming. And James, you're a licensed attorney in Michigan. So just for the record, state and spell your name. Thank you. Good morning, James Fleming. F-L-E-M-I-N-G. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is James Fleming with Clark Hill. Speaking today on behalf of challenger Barbara Van Sickle. As this board is aware, my client is challenging the eligibility of Judge Carl Merligna and his eligibility to appear on the ballot for Michigan's 10th Congressional District. Judge, Marlig Judge Marligna's candidacy runs in direct contravention of Article 6, Section 21 
of the Michigan Constitution of 1963. That constitutional mandates, mandate prohibits judges from running for any non-judicial elective office while serving as a judge or for one year thereafter. Judge Marligna has argued that Article 6, Section 21 does not apply to congressional office. However, Article 6, Section 21 clearly applies to any non-judicial elective office. Clearly, Congress is an elective office. The Bureau of Elections has suggested that this body should ignore the plain text of the Constitution based on a 1942 Attorney General opinion. That opinion is inapplicable here. First, it predates the 1963 Constitution by 21 years. Second, that opinion fails to recognize that the, that the 1963 Constitution distinguishes, distinguishes between state and federal elective office. This distinction is critical because Article 6, Section 21 does not distinguish between state and federal elective office. It says any non-judicial elective office. Respectfully, this body is under the obligation to follow the Constitution and must disqualify Judge Marligna. Until Article 6, Section 21 is struck down by a court or the Attorney General offers an opinion to the contrary, Judge Marligna must be disqualified based on, based on the plain text of the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fleming. Uh, Jonathan, a question to you. Uh, this is not on our agenda. So uh, what would Mr. Fleming, uh, what is his route to go if he wants to pursue this matter? Um, Chair Schinkel, this was a challenge to the affidavit of identity to the candidate rather than to the nominating petitions. And the Board of State Canvassers does not consider affidavit of identity challenges. That's handled by the Secretary of State. So we've informed uh, the challenger that we will not be disqualifying Mr. Marlinga on the basis of his affidavit of identity. And the proper route to challenge that would be to file a lawsuit in court. The court of claims? I can't speak to the jurisdiction. That would be a decision for their lawyer, but they need to go to court. There's no appeal to this court. <laughs> We're not going to give them legal advice. Okay. Anyway, you heard it. Mr. Fleming, thanks for coming in. Thank you. I'd like to call on uh, Fred Neenstedt. Fred, have a seat, please. Well, you can stand if you like. Uh, would you raise your right hand for me? You saw me swear what you're about to say. Today's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you, God. I do. Thank you. Uh, is the button pressed, the red button? Do you see it red? As long as it's red, uh, state and spell your name for the record, please. I, I do not. Oh, it's blue. Okay. Yeah. My name is Fred Neenstead. Fred, F R E D, Neenstead, N I E N S T E D T. Okay. Speak right into that microphone. And yes. It's all yours. It, it, I'm a citizen of Michigan my whole life. I've never seen such an assault on our elective process by a body in our uh, uh, administering the election of our state. Uh, the intent of this is to disturb the election process, not to reinforce the good judgment. Citizens don't want to have their elections uh, bruised or the integrity of the election tainted by an adversarial judgment or a harsh uh, interpretation of the rules involved. So to me, the candidates all took good faith to do their jobs, to do what they were required to do. And the state is taking a very strict interpretation of all. So the candidates deserve to be heard in or on the ballot by the citizens and not to be disturbed of the process of getting their uh, candidacy before the voters. You know, so the voters have the final choice. Um, I do hope that the Secretary of State understands that 
she has to administer what she took an oath in fairness, that the same standard be applied to her actions as is applied to the determinations in all of these cases that are gonna stop a candidate from being put on a ballot. I, I thank you for my time. And I offer that you, you look at the book, Gospel of John chapter 16. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, come in. Next, I'd like to call on uh, Gabby Manalach. Did you fill out a yellow uh, card? Okay. My next card is for Jeff Nielsen. For permission, I'd like to end up. Uh... And that's sure. in my comments. You have my permission. I got two. So, uh, sorry. Uh, your licensed attorney. So just for the records, uh, state and spell your name for us, please. Uh, Jeffrey Nielsen, N-E-I-L-S-O-N. -E -I, I am here in a professional capacity on behalf of Michael J. McClory, who filed for an open probate court judgeship in Wayne County, Michigan, whose, sign whose uh, signatures were deemed insufficient by the Wayne County clerk. What I've handed you is her staff report where after turning in 5,437 facially valid signatures, none of which, by the way, were collected in any way, shape, or form by the fraudulent circulators identified in the Elections Bureau staff. She decided that she questioned the validity of these signatures. She totally ignored her obligations under the law to do any comparison of any of the signatures on the petition with the qualified voter file. And in the end, she simply says, final result, signatures questioned for validity and genuineness. That is absurd. It turns the cart before the horse that and somehow it totally violates the presumptive validity of these signatures. Milton Mack, former chief judge, probate judge of the Wayne County Circuit Court and chair of the Wayne County Election Commission for 18 years has authorized to indicate he's very familiar with the situation. He's never seen something so outrageous in such a blatant act of arbitrary and capricious application of rules that are not sanctioned under the law. It is a clear abuse of discretion and in a time where we are concerned, well, let me say this, of the 3,351 signatures that she wishes to invalidate, 90% of those signatures are from citizens of the city of Detroit. And in an era where we're always concerned about voter suppression and able to express their will and intentions, this is an outrageous example of such an action. And it's a violation of my client's constitutional rights. It turns everything upside down. So I understand because it went to the county clerk, and then you know there's an appeal pending, the reality of the situation is I believe this board has the inherent authority to certify when you get to item seven, where you're certifying all of the other candidates to the ballot, that you have the ability to add Mr. Mc to basically, as a facially disregard this erroneous determination and add Mr. McClory to the list of candidates that would be certified for the primary ballot and save a whole lot of time with dealing with an appeal of the Bureau of Elections or saving me the trouble of having to go to a court and get a mandamus. But I thank you for your time and uh, thank you very okay. much. Mr. Nielsen, thank you. Uh, uh, Heather, if you can uh, just answer this question. This is a Wayne County issue uh, under appeal in Wayne County. Do we have authority on this issue? Member Schinkel, I'm actually going to have um, Director Brader address this. Okay, Jonathan, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this has been appealed to the Secretary of State. It's a determination of a uh, county clerk with regard to the sufficiency of nominating petitions. That appeal is pending before the Secretary. We have not made a determination on that. So I am not aware of any authority the Board of State Canvassers should have to consider that appeal. I just had one additional comment. After you make a determination, Jonathan, where does it go from there? At that point, anybody who disagreed with the Department of State's determination would have to file a lawsuit in court. Okay, it bypasses us then. Yes. Okay. My, my concern, however, is that because this eliminated both candidates in the race, they are now collecting signatures. People are out collecting signatures for a 
contest that if I prevail in the appeal or in court will render them all moot. Candidates are going out and spending money with circulators to collect signatures on something that will be a non-entity to the extent I prevail in the appeal or prevail in court. So I think the timeliness of resolution of the appeal, which is something you do have control over, would be beneficial. But thank you very much. And I would commend the election staff for the massive volume of work they've had to deal with through this process. Okay. Chair Schinkel. Yes, Mr. Don. I'm, I'm having trouble hearing some of these people who are speaking. Yeah. At, so we, if you come up here, speak, kind of lean in and speak into the mic, because if I can't hear, folks in the back probably can't hear either. Okay, I want to call on Matt Maddock. Representative Matt Maddock, I should say. Representative, uh, if you would for me, raise your right hand. Yes, I'm sorry what you're about to say. Say the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Stuff you got. Yes, I do. Mr. Thank you Chair. very much. And for the record, please spell your name. Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, Maddock, M-A-D-D-O-C-K. It's all yours. The legislature has made countless decisions and exemptions and changes because of COVID during the last two years uh, for, for, for a myriad of reasons, uh, reasonable exemptions and changes to laws and statutes. And there were many circumstances because of COVID that prevented the normal gathering of signatures. I think we all realize that today. Uh, I don't need to go into details of why the signatures were hard to get. Even the court recognized this in the case of Ashaki versus Whitmer. This honorable board has plenary power to make decisions and exemptions and reasonable, reasonable changes to fix this problem today. And I think the Michigan voters deserve to have these candidates on the ballot. I don't think it's reasonable to have perhaps ask for all of the, all these exemptions to be um, honored. However, I do believe that situations where candidates did not get adequate signatures, I think this board has plenary power in order to make those changes to accommodate these candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Next, I'd like to call on uh, Adam Clements. Uh, Adam Clements, are you out there? Oh, there you are. Adam, would you raise your hand for me to solemnly swear what you're about to say today's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, stuff you got? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. And for the record, state and spell your name. Uh, yes, my name is Adam, A-D-A-M. My last name is Clements, C-L-E-M-E-N-T-S. Go ahead, it's all yours. Well, I'll start off by indicating I am a licensed and practicing attorney in the state of Michigan. I'm here as a passionate and zealous advocate on behalf of Ms. Chastity Youngblood, who is a candidate for the Third Circuit Court. Uh, we received information that it was recommended that her petition be uh, deemed to be insufficient as a result of fraudulent or uh, what it uh, seems to be dubious or manufactured signatures. What we would suggest and ask that you consider in this particular regard is that this is a candidate who's dedicated her entire life to public service, her professional life. This is an individual in this particular regard who tried to go, who tried to be above board, to follow each and every condition that was set before her in order to have an opportunity to be on the ballot so that the candidates, so that people, citizens of Wayne County could have an opportunity to vote for her. What we would submit as it relates to the allegations that have been levied regarding the petitions is that we haven't had an opportunity to evaluate any evidence that would suggest that this is accurate. For it to be suggested that 3,900 of the signatures were either fraudulent or dubious without having an opportunity to be presented with which signatures specifically are being challenged to have to not have the opportunity to get them independently evaluated or do to in, or do an independent assessment of what is being labeled as fraudulent places her in in an unenviable position and that's be putting it lightly what i'm asking you to do what i'm asking um, you to assess in this particular regard is 
how can a candidate have an opportunity to defend themselves against this position if you're not being presented with the actual evidence to support the allegation that's being levied against you? What I'm asking you to do is to give the citizens of Wayne County what they've asked for, and that's for her to be placed on the ballot. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, don't we give uh, these candidates the uh, petitions that are found to be fraudulent? Yes, and just to clarify that the basis, if we could talk about this on the agenda item, if you prefer in greater detail, Chair Schickel, but the, the basis on which um, Ms. Youngblood's petitions were deemed insufficient was not fraud. It was based on required elements not being visible. Um, there's language that was cut off. Uh, on the copying of the petitions. And I would also note that the candidate does have access to copies of all of their petition sheets. Okay. Thank the you. only thing that, if I, may I respond to that or no? Because the only point of clarity that I, that I wanted to provide is that specifically when we look at the breakdown of the number of signatures that were deemed to be invalid, we were given a specific number of 3,900. And then from that point on, there was, there was, there's language in the parentheses that specifically state that these signatures appear to be fraudulent. Well, there's no information submitted to the candidate of 3,900 signatures. There's no specific signatures that are given to her so that she can do an independent verification. So I do agree with the honorable board member that we were given some information. In fact, we were given very specific information from the actual challenge. But the, the 3,900, that specific number, we were not given those signatures in any way, shape, or form to be able to do independent verification. And we're asking for that opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, can we have this discussion under the, this item on the agenda to allow the time for the public to make comment, please? What, what uh, item number <clears throat> she referring to? Second. 37? 27. 27. 27. Okay, are there any other uh, witnesses to come before us right now under public comment? Seeing none, we're going to move on with the agenda. Let me see if I can get back to the agenda. What's that? Consideration of minutes, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> buried my agenda somewhere. Let me just borrow yours for a second. Okay, we're going to consideration of the minutes for the uh, May 2nd, 2022 meeting. They've been delivered to everybody. What's the board's wishes? Here it is. Mr. Chair, I know that I was uh, absent at the last meeting, but I would make a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting held on May 2nd, 2022. Support. It's been moved and supported that we approve the minutes of May 2nd, 2022. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion passes four to nothing. The next item on the agenda is recording of the results of the May 3rd, 2022 special election for the Office of State Rep 15, District Partial Term. Jonathan. Thank you, Chair Shingle. So this was a special election to fill a vacancy in the State House of Representatives. We had four of these. I will just say that I would like to commend all of the clerks and election workers for an excellent job conducting these elections. It was an extra difficult step for them to have this election in this spring um, of an already busy election year in the middle of redistricting. Um, and the election was extremely well conducted uh, in all four counties. In this election, uh, Jeffrey Pepper won the election with 4,628 votes. Okay. What is the board's pleasure? Mr. Chair, I move that the board record the results of the May 3rd, 2022 special election for the Office of State Representative 15th District as certified by the Wayne County Board of Canvassers on May 6th, 2022. Support. Move and support it. We certify that election. Further discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, the motion passes four to nothing. Next item on the agenda. Recording the results of the May 3rd special election for the Office of State Rep 36th District Partial Term. Jonathan? This was a special election to fill a vacancy uh, in State Representative 36th District in Macomb County. Terrence Mikowski, uh, Republican, won the election with 7,834 votes. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair, I move 
You got me. <laughs> I move that the board record the results of the May 3rd, 2022 special election for the Office of State Representative 36th District as certified by the Macomb County Board of Canvassers on May 4th, 2022. Support. Support that. Moved by Tony, supported by Mary Ellen. Oh, Jeanette, sorry. I'm getting my supports uh, confused. Uh, this is uh, we're on item number four to approve the election uh, for the 36th district partial term. Further discussion on the motion, seeing none, all those in favor of signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye, all those opposed, passes four to nothing. Last is results of the May 3rd special election for the 43rd, not the last, but almost last, 43rd special uh, district partial term. Jonathan. This was a special election to fill a vacancy in state representative 43rd district in Oakland County. Uh, Mike Harris, Republican, won the election with 7,583 votes. Okay. Mr. Chair, I move that the board record the results of the May 3rd, 2022 special election for the Office of State Representative 43rd District as certified by the Oakland County Board of Canvassers on May 5th, 2022. Support moved by Jeanette, supported by Tony, moved to approve the uh, results of the, from the 43rd District partial term election. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion passes four to nothing. Uh, number six on the agenda, recording uh, the results of the May 3rd, 2022 special election for the 74th district partial term. This was a special election to fill a vacancy in the state representative 74th district in Kent County. Claire, uh, Carol Glanville, Democrat, won the election with 7,288 votes. Mr. Chair, I move that the board record the results of the May 3rd, 2022 special election for the Office of State Representative 74th District as certified by the Kent County Board of Canvassers on May 6th, 2022. Support. Been moved by Jen, supported by Tony. Approved item number uh, six on our calendar. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, see by saying aye. Aye. Aye, all those opposed. The motion passes, four to nothing. Uh, number seven. A report on a review of nominating petition secretary of state's office August 2nd, 2022 primary. Wow, that sounds like a big item there, Jonathan. Are you to take it away? Sure. So the list uh, for this motion, which you have before you, contains the names of candidates who have filed a nominating petition found to be sufficient under a review carried out by the staff and who have no challenges pending. The candidates are seeking nomination to the offices of governor, representative in Congress, state senator, state representative, judge of the Court of Appeals, judge of the circuit court, and judge of the district court. Um, these candidates, uh, the other candidates who do have matters regarding the sufficiency of their nominating petitions, either because staff determined that they didn't have enough or that they were challenged or both uh, are, on a, are on separate individual items. But prior to addressing those individually, uh, petition sufficiency issues, staff recommends that the board adopt a motion finding the petitions filed by the candidates whose names appear on the uh, list here uh, to be sufficient. Okay, so Jonathan, do you uh, suggest we just move on with the agenda then? We have a motion uh, for the board to approve these. Okay, Mr. Chair, I have a question regarding sure. this process. Tony, just it, as we said about approving this listing, I'll use uh, Mr. Marlinga as an example, where in this instance, we are offering support based on the determinations made to this point. If the individuals challenging under the issue brought forward earlier, if they are, if they take that to court and are successful, how is that addressed? So what the board would be saying with this motion is that these candidates have a sufficient number of signatures on their nominating petitions. The board is not determining that they uh, qualify based on their affidavit of identity. That's a decision that's made by the filing official, which is the secretary of state. So that challenge would still remain viable in the courts, but it would be based on the affidavit of identity, not based on the number of valid signatures on their petitions. Thank you. So how many, uh... Petitions, does this motion affect? I will try to get you that number. Five hundred and eighty-three candidate nominating petitions. 
583 and, and none of those petitions are on our agenda? Those are not on the agenda individually because there's no staff determination of insufficiency and there's no challenge. Okay. Any further discussion? We made a motion, right? Motion's this, been made. All Ms. Those, all Mr. Those, Chair, all I have an actual motion, motion to read. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I move that we accept staff recommendation and find that the petitions filed with the Secretary of State by the candidates appearing on the list sufficient with the understanding that this list does not contain the names of the 32 specified candidates who have petition sufficiency issues pending before the board. I further move that the candidates who filed a sufficient petition with the Secretary of State for the offices of Governor, Representative in Congress, State Senator, State Representative, Judge of the Court of Appeals, Judge of the Circuit Court, and Judge of the District Court be certified to the Secretary of State for the August 2nd, 2022 primary ballot. This certification is to include any additional candidates who we find to have filed sufficient petitions under today's hearing. Support. Who supported? Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, seeing them up saying aye. 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 All those opposed. The motion passes four to nothing. We're going to move on with the agenda. We're down to Chair Schenkel, if I might. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Wait a second. Number seven. Yeah. We, just, we just did number seven. Yeah. If I might, Chair Schenkel, before we move on to number eight, we did have one public comment uh, remotely that we have not uh, taken yet. Uh, we have James Gallant who's uh, speaking, seeking to speak during public comment. Before we jump to number eight, Jeffrey Nelson had number seven on this card and I didn't catch it. Jeffrey, you wanna make a comment on what we just Hello. voted? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, bef before we get to number eight, Jonathan, uh, you had somebody who wanted to do remotely, what's the, uh, the witness's name? James Gallant. James Gallant, is yes. he out there? He should be on. Okay, the uh, chair recognizes screen. James Gallant. But Mr. Chairman, just one question. As I heard, none of the probate court judgeships were before the board of, uh, that's something that falls within the auspices of the county clerks, correct? Correct. Thank you. So do we have Mr. Gallant? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay. I can't hear you. Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Mr. Gallant. Hello. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. Uh, this is James Gallant, Marquette County Suicide Prevention Coalition, and these are my opinions. And I spoke recently with the Supreme Court concerning your rules of procedure here and due process, whether the Constitution protects my due process here and where you got to follow the rules here, which is the process is due to me as a participant and everybody else. And now I see in your proposed minutes that as presented, it suggests that you may have wrongfully amended your rules of procedure at your last meeting without prior notice and without actually voting. And according as, as required by the OMA, you have to have a rule that has approved by the board for or public comment, reasonable rule, approved rule, okay, which you do not have. I have not been able to get any approved rules by you folks, just administrative rules from 1997. So what I'd like to say is uh, please consider scheduling a special meeting with a public hearing to identify the legitimately approved rules of procedure from before the administrative rules in 1997. They had to have used rules. You, you started in 1850. So they had to use rules to initiate that administrative rules process. Now, my prediction here is that during the sufficiency hearings today, the chair will assign the floor to Mr. Brader without a proper motion pending, which is required, page 366, line eight, Robert's Rules of Order. And Mr. Rader will then give a report and recommendation, and then you will just open up debate, and there will be two options. You're gonna to motion to determine that the petition is sufficient or determine that it's insufficient. So you're gonna have all the debate, and then you're gonna make the motion, negotiate the motion at the end, which is a direct violation of the general fundamental principles of parliamentary law in America and in Michigan. And so please, please schedule a public meeting with a public hearing so you can go through all this and determine this. It appears that your agreements for this rule, three minutes, discussion of the chair, and now you have more discretion of the chair, that was not voted on. So that agreement is between you members and Mr. Brader as the election official. 
not between you members, between each other. So you got a majority vote. See, now I still can't find an Adam Fikasi has still not been able to identify where is the meeting minutes where you approved where it says three minutes discretion of the chair. I don't believe that exists because he can't find it. And um, but we're looking for the idea that the Constitution protects our due process here. And this ain't it. <laughs> this isn't what we're supposed to be getting. You're supposed to be getting you get a commotion. Everyone, every all you members have a right to know what you're going to vote on next. So when you do these sufficiency hearings, you start and you're going to do all your discussion, but you don't know what the motion is going to be at the end. Is it going to be for sufficiency or insufficiency? Well, no, it should be motion to approve as sufficient. And you vote no, you vote it down. There's only got one vote. There's only one question to be answered here. Is it sufficient? Yes or no? And this is where the everybody's just making it up. And, you know, Robert, General Henry Romer said, where there is no law and everybody just does whatever they want, like you're doing today, there is the least amount of liberty. And that's why we got such problems in Michigan. I think that's why we got all these racial tensions in Michigan also, because some of you folks are just aren't following the rules. And I don't blame them for being upset. And I don't blame anybody for, for having a problem with it, because the rules are rules. And, you know, you got a bunch of attorneys here. And we need Dana Nessel to give her opinion. She's your attorney, not a attorney, because Jonathan. Okay, we're all set then. We're going to continue with our agenda. We're, we're down to item number eight. And uh, I'll ask, this is the beginning of our review of candidates. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jonathan to, to start us off with this process. Thank you, Chair Schnickel. And if I might, I'm going to at this time talk about in general the, the staff report on the fraudulent petition circulators because it affects several candidates individually. Um, the, the, this candidate being one of them. Um, so uh, I'm just going to describe how we find ourselves here, what, what the staff's recommendations are based on in general, and then we can talk about that individual with each candidate. Um, and, and obviously, they will want to make their, uh, their case as well. Um, First, I just want to express immense gratitude to the staff of the Bureau of Elections um, for their tireless work on this. In order to produce these recommendations, uh, it has taken a lot of late nights and weekends. Um, we have 32 staff reports, which involved extensive review. We reviewed thousands and thousands of lines and signatures in QVF, more than we'd ever done before. And all of this was uh, trying to get you the best, most comprehensive recommendation and accurate recommendation possible so that Michigan voters have candidates that should be on the ballot based on the requirements of the election law. Second, um, just in general, the, the unprecedented posture that we're dealing with here at today's meeting, even putting aside the issue of the fraudulent petition circulators, um, not even counting the candidates affected by that, there are still 24 other staff reports um, that we have prepared um, because of either they don't have valid signatures sufficiently or because they're challenged. The final thing I just want to note um, about the process here is that the timeline is critical um, for our elections to run smoothly. Um, the board needs to get through decisions on these candidates. Um, there's much to discuss on, and both sides are going to argue their case strongly, uh, but we do need a decision because no matter what the board does, we are going to have lawsuits. That is a certainty. Um, and it's important to give the courts time to decide these issues for everybody's sake by June 3rd. Um, June 3rd, we need to have our ballots set because we need to start getting them ready for voters. June 3rd triggers a two week process where all the ballots across the state need to be programmed. They need to be proofed at the state, county and local level for 5,000 different ballot styles. And then we have to have them all printed and proofed again and shipped to 1,500 different locations so they can be ready to go out to our military and overseas voters on June 18th, and then everyone else who's asked for one on June 23rd. So there's an enormous amount of work that starts on June 3rd, and if we don't have a decision then, or we don't have finality then, we're not going to be able to get ballots to voters um, on time. So now, in, in terms of the staff report that, that we uh, provided on the fraudulent petition circulators in general, um, I want to clarify that this was a different approach because of the unprecedented scale of the fraud we saw here. In the past, we've had uh, the ability with very little difficulty um, to process a relatively small number of dubious signatures that we see uh, in the ordinary course of processing the petitions. They're scattered throughout the petitions and we can look them up as we get to them. There was no possible way to do that approach here and get an accurate recommendation to the board. So instead we did a comprehensive review of all of the uh, 
suspicious and then ultimately determined to be fraudulent petitions that we saw. First, where we saw obvious indi indicators of fraud, which are described in the staff report, we separated those circulators petitions from the rest of the circulators petitions in each drive. We then looked at every single page, every single line of each petition uh, of that category to confirm that we were still seeing what did not look like legitimate signatures there. If we saw one, uh, a page, we saw signatures that looked legitimate, we took them out of that fraudulent circulator category and put them back in with the rest. Uh, then after that, uh, just to do as much as possible to make sure there were not any legitimate signatures mixed in there, we then, uh, after having already looked at every line, we then looked up as many signatures as we, as we possibly could in QVF, in the qualified voter file. So we looked up signatures for every circulator, for every candidate, every combination, um, on all different sheets in a targeted way to make sure we were not systematically missing things that were at the top of sheets, at the bottom of sheets, that we were not missing sheets at the back of the stack. We looked at about 7,000 of these in total uh, in QVF across all the circulators. And we did not find a single registered voter with a matching signature for any of those circulators for any candidate of the ones we looked at. If we found even a small number that looked legitimate, we took them out of the fraudulent circulators category and they are not reflected in this report. So for example, there's a circulator in one of the candidates uh, reports referred to as Diallo Danieli. That, that petition looked very suspicious. It appeared to have a significant amount of fraud in it, um, but we did see some signatures that arguably were valid. So in an abundance of caution, we took it out of the category of petition circulators that were fraudulent and put it back in with the general total. So we've spent as much time as possible on that extra verification step to make sure there are not actually legitimate uh, signatures and legitimate registered voters uh, mixed in with these fraudulent petitions. And what we are left with is that we are confident in telling you that these fraudulent circulator petitions for the, for the circulators that are mentioned in the report consist of fraudulent signatures. It's not similar to what we've seen in the past where we have some dubious or doubtful signatures that we check in QVF. In those cases, there may be doubt uh, in the past because the signatures may have some redeeming qualities. Um, one person may have signed weird because of the angle of a clipboard or maybe a circulator was out there and collected signatures and somebody signed with a fake name or a signature and the circulator wouldn't know that. This is not like that. It's not a mix of good signatures that are in there with bad ones. Um, the circulators here committed fraud. They used the names of people who either weren't registered or they were registered and they forwarded their signatures. Uh, this was not a mistake. These circulators knew they were doing this. They did this deliberately. And staff is confident in saying that these signatures should not be counted. I also wanna clarify because it's been raised that this is not the random sampling process that we use for initiative petitions. It's very different from that. In the random sampling process for initiative petitions, we do not start by looking at every single line and every single page like we do with these petitions. We do a face review, uh, but we do not go line by line. And then we pull a random sample in the random sampling process of 500 signatures uh, out of a petition that has 400 or 500,000 signatures. So in that random sampling process, we're talking about a tenth of a percent of the signatures. And then based on the validity rate of that sample, we make a statistical projection that is based on metrics that the board has approved uh, about how many total signatures are in there. That works well, uh, but that is not what we did here. We did not make a statistical projection. Instead, we looked at every single line. Then we verified as many as we possibly could in QVF to make sure there was not any valid signatures in there on any significant scale. Um, another thing that I think bolsters our confidence here is that we have not gotten any specific argument with regard to any specific signature or, or circulator page that actually tells us that there are good signatures on there. It is commonplace with petitions where a signature is challenged uh, or where we determine it's invalid that the petition drive or the campaign will come forward with some kind of evidence that a signature is valid. They can get an affidavit from a circulator where that circulator says, yes, I did actually collect these from people on this date. Uh, we didn't get that. They can get um, affidavits from voters that said, yes, I did sign that petition sheet. That's my signature. We have not gotten that. And we also have cases where uh, candidates uh, can go to the local clerk and get copies of registration forms uh, or registration cards rather. It's true that they cannot get access to the qualified voter file, 
but you can go to a clerk's office, any one of our uh, municipal clerk's office and get the physical registration card, which has the signature and, and to demonstrate that there's a valid signature there. We have not gotten that. Um, it's possible we'll have that presented to us today, but we have not seen that. So at this point, there's nothing to suggest that there are valid signatures in there. Um, and so, you know, this is obviously not a place that any of us wanna be. Um, it, it's a terrible thing for our state and it's an attack on our election system. Um, we have referred these petitions to the Attorney General for criminal investigation, and we'll see what they can tell us about that further. But uh, BOA's job here um, is to recommend to the board uh, whether following the canvas there are enough valid signatures. And unfortunately, for some of these candidates, even though they did collect apparently thousands of valid signatures, um, the ones that they did submitted from these fraudulent signatures are not valid. So that's, uh, that's uh, a summary of, of what we did for the fraudulent petition circulators for all the candidates. With regard to this candidate, um, Ms. Brandenburg, uh, she uh, required, was required to submit 15,000 signatures. Um, and our face review uh, found that out of the 17,780 signatures she submitted, she did have 6,634 facially valid signatures. However, she did have 11,144 invalid signatures that were submitted by these fraudulent petition circulators. Those are listed out on the staff report with their names and the number they submitted. And because of that, uh, we determined that she did not have a sufficient number of valid signatures. Okay, Jonathan, a couple of quick questions here. The, we talked about it, and I think I read too, that you guys estimate about 68,000 signatures total were fraudulent that were filed. Is that number one that you put out there? That's correct. Okay, and that's 68,000, is that, does that mean that if there was a same circulator that worked for two different candidates, is that signature counted twice then, one for each candidate, or is that 68,000 counted once? That's counted once, so it would be a, a total of all the fraudulent petition signatures uh, accumulated over the different candidates. So okay, if a circulator so submitted, you know, 500 for one candidate and 500 for another, that would be 1,000. Oh, it'd be a thousand. Yeah. Okay. So of the 68,000, there could be, okay. So that's a total number. It would, um, okay. And so of the 68,000 total number, we were able to look up 7,000 on the QVF roughly. Is that what you testified to about 7,000? Correct. So that looks like 10%. Uh, of, of the petitions that were submitted by people that were committing fraud, uh, allegedly, uh, you looked up signatures, 10%. Was that a random process? So 10%, that'd be an average of one per page of the fraudulent uh, circulators? We uh, typically would do multiple signatures on a page. So we didn't do one per page. We would typically do two to three per page. Um, in a targeted randomized way. And the sheets were not in any particular order. So we were pulling sheets, you know, from all different orders in the stack, um, different lines on different pages. Um, and, and based on that, having looked up that many, if there was any uh, legitimate uh, lines or signatures in here on any su substantial scale, I am confident that we would have seen some indication of that after having looked up 7,000 of these. 7,000 and redeemable qualities. Is that the term you guys are looking for between the signature on the petition and the signature on the QVF? When we have a signature that uh, is dubious or doubtful, we will, we will count it if it has redeeming qualities. So we will account for the fact that it may have been scribbled on a notepad, uh, uh, on an angle, the person may have injured themselves. There's a lot of reasons why it may not look exactly like it looks on the voter file. And so we do count those signatures even if they're not a perfect match. But in this case, we were not in that situation. We were in a situation where we had uh, obviously fraudulent signatures. Okay. I just wanted to get a little background. Any other questions, Jonathan, before we start with this? Is Tony, go ahead. Uh, I have, I have a, a, a few. Um, and I, I'll, I guess I'll start by thanking the staff for all of the work that they have put in. Um, nights, weekends, long hours. I. I They've been very helpful, transparent. So I'm gonna I categorically reject any claims from, from folks, any side of the aisle 
that they're doing this because of partisan reasons. Um, I think they're making a good faith effort here. I have serious questions about the methodology that they've used. Um, you kind of touched on it a bit, Jonathan, about the random sampling and how this isn't a random sampling. This was kind of a unique process you had to develop on the fly. Why don't we use a random sample process for these candidate petitions like we do for amendments, initiated legislation, et cetera? Um, because everybody seems to accept that process in terms of kind of the randomness of it or targeted nature, but it doesn't appear that there's any statutory authority for this type of approach for this. So we could theoretically use random sampling for uh, candidate petitions. Practically speaking, I think the answer is it hasn't been necessary before to approve any kind of random sampling process because we've never seen anything like this. Um, when, when you're talking about initiative petitions, I mean, even one of those, just one petition, is 400,000 signatures. So there's no way that we can look all those up. Um, in the past, as I noted, uh, we, we really, it was certainly a lot of work in past years, but our staff had a little difficulty uh, with the time we had available in looking up signatures one by one with the occasional scattered suspicious one we got. Here, we were just in a different situation. Um, and so we had to get through them um, expeditiously. Uh, and, and again, we did look at every single line. Um, what we were not able to do with the time we had available was to look every single one up in QVF. So instead, we looked up as many as we could. But I am confident, you know, I'm not making a statistical projection here. That's what the random sample does. But I am confident that based on the extensive number that we reviewed, after having already determined that they were fraudulent based on looking at every line, um, that the, the review that we did as a second step to make sure if there had been any substantial number of legitimate signatures in there, we would have found some indication of that. Okay, so we're on number eight here for uh, Donna Brandenburg and looking at her. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, right. my computer oh. went out. <laughs> Yeah, mine's as you know, too. as you know, we're it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the hand. Yeah, I just had an additional question for Director Brader, if I can. Sure. Before we start and, and my apologies. Um, normally, we have probably about 3000 sheets of paper up here, but we're trying to save paper and do things electronically. Um, but Director Brader, I, I want to say, and I think I speak on behalf of our entire board, um, the appreciation we have to the staff and the Bureau. Uh, for this hard work. And I do appreciate the fact that you went over the process um, of how these are different. They, are, they were handled, they are handled differently. Um, having been on the board for a number of years and gone through this process before, um, I appreciate that you explain that to the public. I feel that that's very important that the public understands um, of how this process works. Um, but I, I did have a question about um, one of the things, obviously, with the amount of issues that are we're, we're standing here is, did was there any account for, and can you explain the rules of nominating petitions for um, offices that have multiple candidates, but only one designation on the ballot? I hope I made sense when I asked that. So referring, are you referring to judicial candidates? Then, I'm, I'm actually just referring to um, an individual who, I guess the question is, and, and I just want to make this public, is an individual can only sign one nominating petition for a candidate who only has one designation on the ballot. So an, an individual can't sign a petition for multiple gubernatorial candidates because... It, that's that's the question. I just want to right. make sure we have that clarification yeah. out to the public. Sure. So we would consider that you can you cannot sign a petition for two different candidates running for the same designation, same office. So you couldn't sign a petition, for example, two of the Republican uh, candidates for a governor in the primary. That would count as a duplicate signature in that instance, and it would be um, it would be removed from the total. Um, but a, we wouldn't consider um, you know if one had been submitted fraudulently, we wouldn't consider that to be a duplicate. Uh, if there was, for example, somebody signed, actually signed a petition for one candidate, and then their name was used um, fraudulently for another candidate, we wouldn't eliminate the legitimate signature as a duplicate because they actually only signed once. Somewhat related to that, and this, I, I saw some of this in Mr. Brewer's um, 
complaint about duplicates, and I, I'm glad you brought this up, Jeanette, because of clarification. My recollection from a previous meeting when we talked about duplicates was if somebody had signed for whatever reason, multiple sheets, say they signed three um, Republican gubernatorial sheets, the, f the date of the first signature is valid, those after are invalid, correct? Right, so the, the rules are with duplicates, the rules differ somewhat if it's the same petition that's been signed twice versus different. So if somebody signs uh, the same petition twice, for the same candidate, the board's practice is to disqualify both of those signatures. However, if uh, somebody signs multiple petitions uh, for different candidates, the first will be counted. Is that correct? And the first signature will be counted, but the second will be excluded as a duplicate. Thank you. Anything else for Jonathan? One last thing, Mr. Chair, if I may, and I just want to make sure. So I know that the director Brader, you talked about the timeline and that everything has to be done by June 3rd so that we can process ballots for military members on the 18th, everyone else by the 23rd when we're talking about absentee voting. Um, what time frame does the Bureau have when it comes to processing nominating petitions? Is there is there a selected time or can you go over that that time frame of when that process actually started? Sure, we started uh, as early as we could this year when the, when the petition started coming in, but they come in as late as April 19th. So for many of the petitions, that's when we can start doing anything. We also get challenges through April 26th. So we, we get new information as late as that. Um, and then we have between then and Monday, as it was in this case, um, two full business days before the meeting to prepare a staff report for you. So that, that's the time that we have available. Yes, uh, another question for Jonathan, Mary Ellen. Right, so what I understand is... Red button. Yeah, so Mr. Brader, you said that there were 68,000 signatures that, uh, that were collected by 30 circulators is that correct 30 circulators uh for multiple candidates and then there were six circulators that submitted fraudulent signatures for only one candidate so the names of those circulators are on page 17 of the staff report so for those 30 mostly 30 but the additional six for one candidate you were able to look at more than at 7,000 signatures collected by those 36 circulators, is that correct? Yes. And you found not a single valid uh, signature? That's correct. And you said also when you were discussing um, your report that no one has come forward, at least as of yet, to say even one of those 68,000 signatures is valid? As far as I know, that's correct. Okay. Okay, we're on the number eight, uh, the Brandenburg uh, uh, report. And Jonathan, are you done explaining it from your end? Yes. Okay, so I'm looking at 19 people that submitted fraudulent signatures uh, on this particular report, 19. And they sub apparently submitted uh, uh, 11,144 fraudulent signatures uh, to you. And, and, and you're doing about 10%. You checked in with uh, the qualified voter file. So I'm assuming that uh, you checked about 1,000, 1,100 of these signatures with the qualified voter file. Would that be roughly accurate? I think that's roughly accurate. The percentages okay. might have varied candidate by candidate, but I believe that's roughly accurate. And, and then those 1,100 you checked with the qualified voter file, you didn't find one, not one, to match up with the qualified voter file. That's correct. Okay, any other questions, Jonathan, before we go to witnesses? I'll start with our candidate, Donna Brandenburg. Come on up. Your Honor, Daniel Hartman on behalf of uh, Donna Brandenburg. I'm an I'm attorney. Sorry. Can you please yeah. sit and put, uh, it's, uh, There's a, a little red square button in front of you. Hit that red square button and make sure it's lit up. Is that good now? Okay, Daniel, 
Daniel Hartman on behalf of Donna Brandenburg. Okay, Donna, are you going to testify today? Um, yeah, I think I will. Okay, so would you please raise your right hand for us? You saw him as for what you're about to say today is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so be God. I do. Okay, uh, just so everybody knows, we don't swear in attorneys because if they lie to us, you get this barred. You don't want to do that. So that's why you don't get to be swearing in. So both of you are now under oath. And uh, Daniel, uh, for the record, state and spell your name for us. Daniel J. Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N, P52632. Okay. And, and Donna, we got your name all over the place here. So we don't need you to state and spell your name. So you guys, you can tag team whatever you want to do, but you all got right. the floor. Let me uh, start. Uh, Chairman, by asking if the court is considering the statements made by um, uh, Director Brader as being under oath, I understand he's an attorney as well, or is that being considered as evidence? Your question to us? Yes. Is what Jonathan Brader is saying to us under oath? Is that considered evidence for this board or yes, is it, it a report? Is considered evidence right. for this board. Very well, Your Honor. It's not necessarily something we take by, you know, right. to heart, depending on what he says. But Honorable right Chairman. Now, yeah, we, Honor we Chairman. Trust Jonathan almost all the time. All right. So here's my concern, and I'll start right here. Uh, I've sat here this morning and I've listened to the fact that I feel like I'm getting a bum's rush. I've been told that we have a two day gap, sir, that in which we have to get this out so we can protect the candidate or the, uh, the uh, ballots that go out. I just want to point out something that on page 17 of the, uh, or page two out of the 17 report that was filed, that the Bureau of Canvassers and the Board of Elections on page two in paragraph one indicated that they became aware of this problem in March. They did not provide any notice to any candidates that there were fraudulent circular gatherers out there. And in response to the fact that there's a claim that nobody has come forward with evidence to contest some of these invalid signatures, that seems preposterous to me because Ms. Brandenburg learned about this from the media uh, two days ago and doesn't even have a list of the signatures that were deemed invalid. We have a list of the canvassers that were deemed invalid in whole. Point out to me the March date again. What paragraph is that in? Sure, this is on page two of 17. Yeah. Page and two, what paragraph? It indicated that the Bureau of Elections. At the end of March, okay. Yes. So they became aware of this problem. They didn't put out a public advisory. One of my concerns is on October 23rd of 2020, the um, director of the FBI put out an advisory that our QVFs were compromised, sir. And that was put out before the election. And yet we have not reacted to that, but we had noticed. Ms. Brandenburg, and this is an important part of this concern is, has been, I've listened to this discussion here where there is a discussion about the fact that on June 3rd, we have to be able to print our ballots around the state. It is May 26, uh, honorable chairman. And I understand that that time is there, but there is fundamental fairness and due process in the procedure. And that's the first thing. So I don't accept this timeline this because the candidates were prejudiced because this information was withheld till after the April 19th deadline in which they could have sought additional signatures, valid signatures. They could have identified and removed the concerns that were identified early on and public advisories could have been made. That is inexcusable neglect. The next thing, Your Honor, I would ask, Honorable Chairman, I would ask that you would address is this. Uh, I would note that on page five of 17 in the last paragraph, it appears as though this report is being accepted as evidence, so I'll accept this statement as true, which indicates that none of the candidates, there is no, uh, in this paragraph it says, the Bureau does not have reason to believe that any specific candidates or campaigns were aware of the activities of fraudulent petition circulators. I think that is a significant finding because the reality is, is just like the election system in Michigan, we have more victims. The Board of Canvassers, the Board of Elections, the Secretary of State are victims. This board under the process of this hearing has the ability and authority to issue subpoenas. 
I ask you, Mr. Chairman, were any subpoenas issued to these circulators? You had notice of them. We did not have time to issue a valid subpoena. Sir, I ask you, because it has been indicated that you have flipped the burden, contrary to the Secretary, I'm sorry, the Attorney General's opinion, you have flipped the burden on us to prove that these ballots are, these signatures are valid. That presumption that is there is a presumption that is part of this body of law. And you cannot flip that onto us because as of a staff report suggests that's the way we'd like to handle the procedure. One of your colleagues up there said, this was unique and was developed on the fly. With two chairman, I would like to point out the following information. We have a separation of powers. This is an executive administrative board. You have, according to the case of McQuaid versus Ferguson, 91 Mish 438 from 1892, this board's duties are ministerial, which means it is to count the signatures and deal with that. When you read the statutory scheme, when there is a doubt raised about fraud, it requires that you, it says shall in the statute, and that is under um, 168544C, it indicates that you shall send that determination back to the local election clerk, which would be the township or the city, to, to, to help you determine whether there's validity of the signature. Now, I do recognize that you have the access to the QVF with the board of, uh, the board of canvassers. And during that canvas, your ministerial duties are to determine if that person is registered and registered in the precinct that they indicated on their ballot. That's where it stops. You do not get to be able to make a conclusion of facts in a summary as evidence. In a trial, in this courtroom, in any courtroom, I apologize, sir, in a trial, if I were to say that those are somebody's fingerprints, and that's my conclusion as a staff member or an expert, a lay opinion or whatever, the person who's making the facts still at a hearing has to determine through testimony whether those are somebody's fingerprints. I've heard in the media because of press releases that hit our campaign before it hit us that these have been determined to be fraudulent signatures and that these people are be fraudulent signature gatherers. That is a conclusion of fact, and that is his conclusion. We haven't seen the evidence yet. It hasn't been provided to us. There's been a referral. There's an ongoing investigation. So I submit and I object to this process because how can we fairly and due processly defend? And then I hear when the legislature delegates to an executive branch the authority to make rules, procedure rules, they have to accept those rules under the, Amer the Administrative Procedures Act. And they have to be published and promulgated. You don't get to make up rules unique and on the fly, sir. I said, Mr. Mrs. Brandenburg, do you have anything you wanna put on the record? Yes, I'm very disturbed at the fact that we were not notified immediately in March and that this was clearly not put out for us to be able to react to because it was knowingly carried out that way. The other thing that I'm very disturbed about is your numbers are off and they are egregiously off. Our first batch that we dropped off on the 14th was 19,500. 19, the second batch apparently didn't even show up and you clipped 2,500 off the first batch without even letting us know. So I have affidavits that we dropped off two different ones. And where, what did y'all do with my second batch of signatures I, I dropped off? Because in that batch, it was all volunteers as well. That's where our volunteers were. It wasn't all volunteers, but that's where our volunteers were, as well as some from a second signature company that we hired because we wanted to make sure this was covered. We hired these companies for, for verification because we did not have the access to be able to verify our own signatures and neither do any of the candidates. I find this process to be an arbitrary, an arbitrary goat rodeo. It's a shame. It's, a, it's an assault against the American people on every single level. And if, if the state is hiding information from the candidates to be able to fix the process, we have a big problem, huge problem. I would like to see every single, uh, this needs to be remedied. It's gonna be remedied one way or the other because this was foreknowledge. 
It's shameful, absolutely shameful. How many signatures are you saying you uh, dropped off to the Secretary of State's office? The first batch I turned in, we estimated at 19,500. The second batch that we dropped off was 886 petition, um, petitions. And in that, we estimated that at 8,000 that we dropped the second. I've never heard about the second drop. And the first drop, we have, we have 2,500 count disparity. So how can we trust anything that's coming from this so process you, whatsoever? 19,500 and 8,000, those are the two numbers? What's that? 19,500 and 8,000 were your two drops? We estimated 8,000. We had 886. They asked us for an estimate. The first estimate was 19,500. The second drop was 886 petitions. So why, why do you keep saying 8,000? I'm, I'm we took it down. It could have, we could have said if they were full, we could have said 8,860, uh, but we dropped it to 8,000 8, to make sure that we were at more 8, accurate. Is your guess. So about 27,000 is what you're yes. thinking you dropped off. And this report indicates you filed 17,000. Yeah, I have no idea what happened. And we have copies of all of them. So what happened? First, we had it hidden that you guys had evidence, the state had evidence that the petition gatherers were fraudulent and we were never notified. I found out through texts from people that saw this in the media. This is a goat rodeo. Well, I mean, the question I'm having is not what's fraudulent or not, is how many you dropped off. Well, I've got copies of all of them. We took two copies of all of them. And then all of the volunteer signatures were just arbitrarily thrown out because they were in the second set of submissions. What happened? There's no truth in any of this. We do have a receipt showing the 886 petitions, estimated 8,000 8, that was dropped off within the time limits on 419. Those are not accounted for in the staff report. I'm, I, am, I am not trying to be smart and I perhaps I'm just stupid. I am really struggling to, you say 886. A second drop estimated to 8,000. I do not understand how that is happening. The page has 10 blanks on it. They're not all You're full. talking sheets. 8,866 8, petitions. You're using sheets. two separate, you're using sheets petition and then you're using signatures. A petition 8, is a petition, signatures. it's a sheet. That's why I said sheet. So uh, Signatures are a subset of the sheets. And so you're talking 8,000 signatures was the secondary drop. That is an estimate. We know that for sure the sheets were counted and there were 886 sheets to use the term you asked for. Can, is it appropriate for Mr. Brader or for Kasi to address this issue? It seems Second important. Drop. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we get estimates from candidates when they drop off sheets and signatures for us. We count them ourselves, and the number that we count is almost always different from the estimate that the candidates provide. There was a reference here to copies that the candidate uh, has that indicate that the candidate believes there were more sheets and signatures. If the candidate would like to submit that, uh, we can see if there's any we missed, but I believe our count was accurate. This is a 10,000 signature disparity. This anyway, is huge. He's suggesting you bring in the copies to look at them. Anything else to testify to? Uh, yes, I would like to, uh, uh, and I appreciate your patience. I, I listened to uh, at least 10 minutes of gratitudes to the board, and I do wish that I would be able to finish my concerns. Um, I would indicate that when there is a presumption that says that these are valid signatures and they adopt a process that says out of the gate, a new process, that's what they said, they also created a new remedy not permitted in the statute. The new remedy was that if there was a concern about a circulator, they erased everything that the circulator submitted. There is a process in the statute in the ministerial duties to remove a signature which does not change the other signatures. This is not the only campaign that demands a look at each signature. I've heard that he estimates that he looked at 10%, and that was your calculation. If there is a record that we can go back and look at, there should be a listing of the signatures that they checked and verified that the campaign can be provided in time to react before we run out of time. That should have already been provided to us. 
So if he, in fact, looked at your estimate was it looked at a thousand signatures from this, this area, we would like to see the thousand signatures that were looked up in the QVF and the notes from that. That is the only way that we can have a fair process to determine if this on the fly process meets even the fairness level of the minimum. I submit, and I will not abandon this claim, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I submit to you that you cannot make up a procedure and create a remedy if it's not in the statute and you didn't follow the, Amer the Administrative Procedures Act. Therefore, the remedy, and this is what I'm asking this board to do, and it sucks, but you have to presume these is valid. That is the only way you can move forward. You have to presume these are valid, despite the concerns, because the duty is once that concern is raised on the Board of Elections, once that concern is raised and there is a doubt, then they are supposed to resolve that. But they didn't go through the process. And if the timeline runs out, I want to say that that falls on that. I also would point out just real quickly that we have not been given notice of any challenge to any of her signatures. I am concerned because I don't see in the statute a mechanism by which the Board of Elections can sui sponte begin to bring a challenge. We do not have a challenger identified. There's not one that was called. There was not any challenge that was filed to signatures. Therefore, these signatures were not even challenged. Now, I do understand that if they had concerns in the process of validating signatures, those signatures should have been referred That's an interesting and looked question. at. Listen, I, um, we talked about how much time we're going to give each uh, candidate to talk because uh, a lot of them have challengers uh, following the candidate. And we've, I'll let you go as long as you want it here. And, and we can't let every candidate go this far. But this is the first one, and we're getting a lot of background as we go through your testimony. Uh, but there was no challenge, I think, specific to the Brandenburg uh, filing, right? No challenge. No specific challenge. That's correct. Okay, so so since there's no challenge, what are you doing sneaking through here, throwing all these petitions out, Jonathan? <laughs> we review every candidate set of nominating petitions, whether or not there's a challenge. So we, we review them for facial issues. And in this case, during that process is when we identified all of these signatures that were submitted by fraudulent petition circulators. They can, they can do that. Well okay. said. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Good luck to you. God I'm bless sure you not, all. You're not done with the process. Um, that was number eight, and there's no challenge, so we're moving on to the agenda. Number nine. Um, Chair. That's a good question. Jonathan. Well, so we have, you know, we have, we have designed the agenda with motions for each candidate. Yeah. So um, we have motion, a motion pending either for the board to determine that the candidate does or does not have a sufficient number of petitions. That's, that would be pending ordinarily if the board, depending on what process the board wants to follow. Um, I think it might be good to go through the uh, five governors and then make motions, or we can do them one at a time. What's the board's pleasure? I think given the sim similarity in each of these issues, it would be best to hear from each of them and then go back and make these motions because it, to me, it would seem to prejudice one way or the other, eat each of the following when we make decisions on these five, again, because of the similarity. So if it's, if it, we're not creating any problems, um, that's what I would prefer to do. My only concern is that if we are batching candidates together by what they are running for, are you going to do that with the judges as well? Because if we are going to start that process that all the governors are there, then we'll go to, I'm sorry. Well, we can decide that when but, we get there, but, but we could You're that. going to be changing the, I mean, I understand, Tony, I understand where, where you're going with that. Yeah. And I do, because we want to be fair and open with every candidate. And I do understand kind of grouping them, but I want to make sure in the process that we are going to follow whatever procedure that we are putting in place. Is, is that fair? Yes. Comment? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that makes sense. And, and I'm, I'm excluding um, 
in, in my mind, I was excluding, for instance, um, Dixon, because that's, that was, that challenge was based on technicality issue, not this fraudulent issue. But if we want, if we want to batch, that's, that's perfectly fine. I have one question related to the testimony we just heard. The, the staff report gives it, my computer went to sleep, but it's my, like my seven, 17,148 or something like that. Very valid question. How many of Ms. Brandenburg's signatures that were assumed to be fraudulent were actually checked? Because if, if there's 17,148 and you checked, you know, 2,500 of them and you deem them fraudulent, well, that's a pretty easy decision. But if it's assumption, that's a different matter. We were able to look up of these uh, 1,014. 1014. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I, I just have an additional question, Mr. Chair, sure, and the Director Brader. Um, so in going forward on these ones that uh, say that they are fraudulent petition circulators, am I under the assumption that once that was determined by Bureau of Staff, that those circulators and any page of that circulator, because obviously you said that you went through and checked them, that any time that these circulators showed up on any of these, those were removed. So you're talking, you know, anywhere between three to, I don't, sorry, I think 10 signatures on a page. So, I mean, one of the distinguishing features of these fraudulent sheets was that they were almost all 10, 10 uh, signatures per page, which is a suspicious in and of itself, um, given the way that in, in reality, uh, petition collection works. But um, yes, when we when we identified those sheets from those circulators, for each candidate, we pulled those out into a separate stack. Okay. Uh, it makes sense to me to hear from each of the five uh, gubernatorial candidates. Um, because I don't think the decision we make for the first, presumably, if, if we made a decision now with regard to Ms. Brandenburg, um, it could be arguably applicable to the subsequent uh, candidates without giving them a chance. Arguably, to... it could be. Yeah. <laughs> it, You're arguably. Right. Okay, that's a good a, legal. We're going to move along, and there's no one uh, uh, here on number nine. So we're going right to number 10, uh, and that is nominating petition uh, for James Craig. And. Uh, let me look at, uh, it doesn't say, I want to get the person that's uh, representing Mr. Craig and uh, That'd it's be me. probably be sure. George Lewis. That is. That is George Lewis. George, please, for the, me, raise your right hand. You saw Ms. Horwich about to say today's truth, the whole truth, not but the truth shall help you God. It is, Jeremy. Thank, thank you very much. And for the record, state and spell your name. My name is George Lewis, that's L-E-W-I-S, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Chief Craig's arguments today are more fully explained in the written materials that we provided yesterday. I have copies of that if anyone doesn't have them for them, but I'd like to focus in person on, on two specific points. I want you to put that little black thing right in front of your mouth, would you? All right, how's that? Thank you, thank you. Uh, two specific points. The first is the impropriety of using random sampling, and the second is that the automatic disqualification process is illegal. Now, we are in uncharted territory, as Mr. Brader has said, and he said in his report that, uh, quote, they had previously not developed a separate review procedure for fraudulent petition sheets. And again, today, he stressed that this was a different approach. Now, in May, on May 2nd, he talked to this board about the process that he would be using. And Madam Vice Chair Gerwitz, you had some good points that you made on May 2nd. Uh, Mr. Schinkel, Mr. Daunt, today, you also raised similar points. I'd like to address those because I think they're spot on. Now, first, Mr. Brader said on May 2nd, we look, quote, we look at every page, every line. We don't use random sampling for candidate nominating petitions. He used an example. He said, if we get a sheet that is all in one person's handwriting, 10, 10 signatures all in one person's handwriting, quote, we would still check the qualified voter file just to be sure. Perhaps one of them is a valid signature. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Now, that's when you jumped in, Madam Vice Chair Gerwitz, and you said, you look at the qualified voter file for all of these. And he said, quote, we will always use the QVF before we eliminate a signature. That was perfect. That was great. That's 100% in accordance with Michigan law. That is not what happened here today. 
on their report, their omnibus report, they said they used a quote, targeted signature check of signatures. And today he described that as a targeted randomized way, I believe was the quote. Now we as candidates were not told how many signatures were checked in the QVF. I understand you just told, you know, her that she had 1000 signatures checked. We were not told that. We were not told how many petition sheets um, were used for each circulator before they were deemed to be fraudulent. We asked for that information a couple of days ago and we have not received it. But back to Mr. Brader's point on May 2nd that we wanna check each of these because there may be a legitimate signature in there. We do have affidavits. We have 15 affidavits from people who are on those you know, allegedly fraudulent circular sheets who said that they did sign Chief Craig's petition. I'd like to highlight one of them, Ms. Tabitha Susi, because she told us that she believes she was a victim twice. First, she was a victim to these fraudulent circulators. And second, she said she was a victim to the Bureau of Elections because they didn't even deem her worthy enough to check the validity of her signature. That is why we have to check these against the QVF because it's insulting not only to the process, but to the people who are told their signatures were forgeries when they were not. Uh, Quinn, let me interrupt you right now. That person you just talked about, do you know the name of the circulator of the petition of the person you just talked about? I can get that for you, Chairman. I don't have it off the top of my okay. head. These, okay. as, as was noted earlier, we had two days to, to, uh, to procure these. So it's been a very rushed couple of days. And that brings me to my second point, which is the remedy that has been talked about here. They just touched on it briefly. I'd like to expound a little bit more. It's this automatic disqualification. It's if a circulator is deemed fraudulent, every signature on that sheet is thrown out. This is not the first time the Board of State Canvassers has used that as a solution. That was used in protecting Michigan taxpayers versus Board of State Canvassers in 2018. It's a Court of Appeals case, and they, they reversed the Board of State Canvassers for doing that. And they held, quote, even in the event of knowing and intentional violations of the law, the legislator omitted from the list of punishments an automatic disqualification of signatures. Instead, only obviously fraudulent signatures may be struck. That's exactly what we have here. In that case, the circulator submitted a fraudulent address. He claimed that he was an in-state circulator when he in fact wasn't. And they threw out every sheet that had his name on it. And the Court of Appeals said, you can't do that. That violates the law. You have to look at each signature against the QVF and strike only obviously fraudulent ones. And what case was that? That is protecting Michigan taxpayers, the border state canvassers, 324, Mish app 240. It's cited in our written materials. We discuss it in a little bit more depth. But that's important. And I would like to reiterate as candidates, we were not told how many of our signatures were checked against the QVF. When I looked at Chief Craig's report, there is only one mention to the QVF, and that's in regards to nine signatures. In the Omnibus report, there's one mention to Chief Craig and the QVF, and that's for 10 signatures. He had 9,879 signatures invalidated, and we were only told about 19 of those being checked against the QVF. Before today, I mean, I still don't know. He, maybe uh, Mr. Brader could tell me, but I still don't know how many his, of his signatures were checked. So we're in a position where we don't know what we don't know. 19 out of 9,879, that is one-tenth of 1%. Now, I understand 10% in total were checked, but we would argue that's still not good enough. Michigan law, uh, 168-552-13, says you have to use the QVF. Michigan law 544C, 11A, says that if there is an allegation that a circulator submitting fraudulent petitions, you must look at each of those and only strike obviously fraudulent signatures. That was reiterated, reiterated in protecting Michigan taxpayers. And we understand. We, we obviously recognize the unprecedented nature of what's happening today. And the, the Bureau had a large tax before it and it did a valiant effort. Unfortunately, they cannot do random sampling and they cannot do automatic disqualification. That is clear from the case law. So out of all the options that they could have used, they picked one that violates Michigan law. The law makes no exception for volume. It doesn't say you have to follow this unless there's a lot of them, then you can just do what you want. It makes no exception for volume. So we ask that Chief Craig's name be put back on the ballot for August primary, or if there's time, which I don't think there is, that a thorough and, and legal review of all of these signatures be done. We don't think there's time for that. We think the only remedy available at this point is to put their names back on the ballot.
and I stand by for any questions from the board. Okay, questions? Yeah. Good. Our obligation. Uh, oh. Our obligation under the statute is to canvas the petitions to ascertain if they have been signed by the requisite number of qualified and registered electors. How are you telling us that we can put Mr. Craig on the ballot without knowing that there are a sufficient number of qualified and registered electors who have signed his petitions? That's a really good question, Madam Vice Chair. So when I was doing my research for this, I looked at every case in which the Board of Canvassers was sued. And uniformly, that was the only remedy that the courts applied. That's why I asked the alternative that these should have been gone through and looked at individually. If, if we're told that's not practical, then the only solution we have, no matter how hard of a pill it is to swallow, is to put them on the ballot and let the voters decide. So you're saying that if you submit thousands and thousands of signatures, which you have not validated, that we have to put Chief Craig, Mr. Craig, on the ballot, even though we have no, no, no reason to believe that those are valid signatures. No, ma'am. I'm saying that if we submit thousands of valid signatures, the way the law is set up is that the Bureau of Elections must go through and check those. So we have to do the work that you didn't do. Is that correct? The law puts the burden on the Bureau of Elections and on the Board of State Canvassers. But doesn't the law put the burden on the circuit, on the candidate to submit a sufficient number of valid signatures? Yes, ma'am, it does. And it also puts a burden on the circulators not to commit fraud. And we put forward that we are as much victims as anyone else here. I mean, this, this hurts Chief Craig more than anyone else. So we complied with what we thought were our obligations. We went forward in good faith. We submitted more than enough signatures. And we put forth that checking 10% of most candidates' signatures is not what the law requires. Because we do need certainty. We do need to know if there are enough petitions. And that is the job of the Bureau of Elections to check those. And 55213 says the qualified voter file shall be used to determine the genuineness of a signature. So this, this process is not applicable with the statute or with the case law. Okay, let's call Mark Brewer. Thank you very much. I, I oh, do question this Tony? perhaps maybe for Jonathan, um, Mr. Lewis, right? Yes, yes, sir. Brought this up. Is there in any way an ability to fully get to the bottom of this issue with each of these signatures because Mr. Lewis makes a good point and I, my gut tells me that these are probably fraudulent, um, but the burden of proof is on the government to reject the rights of Michigan citizens. And I, cannot base these important decisions on assumptions. I also don't like the idea that because we just are bumping up against time that we're going to allow candidates who whether through victimization, incompetence, what have you, submitted signatures that do not meet appropriate standards are then placed on the ballot because we don't have a real set method of determining whether or not these are true and valid signatures. It, can we figure this out and bounce all of these against the signature file between now and June 3rd? Because that to me is the only truly just way of figuring this out. Um, so a couple of things. I <laughs> think it would be, the witness? It would be ahead, very, <laughs> I think it would be uh, impractical to do that um, given the volume here. Um, second, I, I would just note that the existence of these concerns about these circulators have been public record for at least a month. Uh, there, was, there was news coverage of the challenges involving these circulators. So it's not news to anybody um, as of Monday that there were concerns about these circulators. Um, there was reference to an affidavit that I, from a voter. If that voter is claiming that they signed one of the petitions that was circulated by one of these circulators, Correct. not just a petition, Correct. then we can look that up. Uh, but we have not seen that specific allegation, I don't believe. Um, so 
and then finally, I would just note that we do consistently tell uh, campaigns and candidates that they should check their submissions before they submit them. That's in our manual. So um, we have uh, we have done as much as we can to check the QVF specifically, but we don't think that that is. Uh, I just don't agree, and I would defer to the the AG on this. But I don't agree that. Um, in a situation like this with an overwhelming amount of fraud where we have reviewed every line that that the board would be required to accept the petitions if we're unable to get to every single one in qvf and we'll we'll give these affidavits um to the board today and uh, mr fracassi i'll send you a digital copy of these as well do you have the page number of what petition those people signed? Um, I believe it's in the digital copy, but I'll, I'll make sure of that before I send it to Mr. Fracassi. Okay, thanks. I, I Go ahead, Mary Ellen. Question. Any more questions? Um, I have seen, um, I, I have seen um, references in the newspapers, um, and certainly there have been many newspaper stories about this, that Mr. Craig claims that he was victimized by circulators who submitted false signatures. So you are acknowledging that the circulators on whom you relied submitted false signatures, is that correct? So we acknowledge that there appears to be fraud that was committed by these circulators. We're hoping that the attorney general very diligently investigates this matter. And if that is the case, not only are the Michiganders themselves victims, but the candidates are victims because we are relying upon these people to do what we're, we're asking them to do. And so if there was fraud, yes, Chief Craig himself is a victim. So I find this so troubling that you suggest that when you put, when you file with the Bureau of Elections, 20, maybe 21,000 signatures, that it's that, and, and you acknowledge that many of those signatures were collected by people who were committing fraud and you claim to be victims. I, I am so troubled by the suggestion that because we don't have time to do the work that should have been done by this candidate or by other candidates that we should just put the candidate on the ballot. I don't see how we can possibly do that because we have the obligation to determine that a sufficient number of, of qualified and registered voters uh, signed. And you don't, you're not able to tell us that that happened. In fact, you tell us that many of the signatures that you submitted were fraudulent. So I would like to just point to the timeline is they, we did not know they were fraudulent when we submitted them. We submitted them under good faith, believing them to be valid. Only afterwards, when all of the candidates were compared, has it appeared and brought to our attention that there was fraud here. So we acknowledge after the fact that now it is looking like there was fraud committed. We didn't know at the time. And I'd just like to reiterate that the law puts the burden there is a presumption of validity of these signatures, and the burden is on the Bureau of Election staff to disprove them. And we, we reiterate what was said earlier, that we feel like that, that, that burden of proof now has been flipped. And we're told that we have to do, we have to prove their validity against the qualified voter file, which we don't have before we submit them. So there's only so much we can do beforehand. So, uh, excuse me, I also read, um, a quote from Chief Craig saying that it was unreasonable to expect the a busy candidate to check all of the signatures for validity. Uh, you know, I intentionally but, these but, days well, don't read the news. Where, where I'm going with this is I want to know what the candidate and his um, campaign staff did to check the validity of these signatures. Because if you look at these petition sheets, they are obviously fraudulent. What kind of effort did you make to submit to the Bureau of Elections and the Board of Canvassers valid signatures? Madam Vice Chair, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. That's one that I cannot speak to today and I do not believe is before the Board of Canvassers today. Okay, thanks for coming in. Thank you. I'd like to call on Mark Brewer. Oh, 
We got oh, those are copies for us. Yeah, I give them to the staff. Uh, you got Mark Lewis spelling okay down there? Okay, Mark, you can start right in, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give me a minute to uh, get my paperwork in order here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair and members of the board. My name is Mark Brewer. I am an attorney with the law firm of Goodman Acker, and I'm here today on behalf of challenger Veronica Taylor Biffle. Our complaint provided 200 pages of evidence of forgery, totaling at least 6,933 signatures, more than enough to disqualify James Craig. That complaint was submitted under oath. It was verified, unlike anything you have seen from Mr. Craig until just a few moments ago. And I'll address those affidavits in a moment. We had only a limited time uh, to evaluate the signatures that were submitted by Mr. Craig, only seven days. But yet in seven days, we were able to uncover nearly 7,000 forged signatures and thousands of other defects. Had we had more time, like you're already hearing candidates complain of this morning, I have no doubt that we would have found even more forgeries as the Bureau's report did when it reviewed Mr. Craig's petitions. It's very clear upon even only a cursory examination of those petitions that round robining was occurring by at least eight of the circulators and they were round robining across circulators, not only within the petitions that one circulator allegedly collected, but across the group of circulators. We went back and compared signatures on Craig's petitions to petitions that were filed with this body in 2020. And we compared hundreds of signatures, none of them matched, not a single one matched a signature that that voter had signed on a petition in 2020. We found at least 30 signatures from dead voters. And as the Bureau report concludes, the only way that you could have a dead voter on such a petition was that these forgery experts were working from dated lists. And that explains why we have so many deceased voters on there. That was our complaint, 200 pages, a verified complaint under oath that there was forgery in these other defects. And there's been no rebuttal of that, not here today. Mr. Craig has filed written materials. He's been represented by a lawyer today, no rebuttal at all. And I'll get to that in a moment as well. The Bureau did its own independent investigation by its nonpartisan professional staff. And I wanna commend them and thank them for the work that they did. The Bureau found 18 forgers who submitted at least 9,879 forged signatures through the same patterns that we identified. Round robining, identical handwriting on sheet after sheet after sheet within sheets as well, and other indicators of petition forgery. There has been no rebuttal of all of this evidence. We submitted our challenge nearly a month ago. And in every response, both publicly and to this body, we get dancing from the other side. They will not acknowledge that there is forgery. They won't deny it but they won't acknowledge it and they play the victim, which I'll get to in a moment as well. No circulator has stepped forward either voluntarily or under compulsion, the attorneys on the other side, no how to issue subpoenas to rebut any of the evidence that's in the staff's report or in our complaint. We see a, allegedly a handful of affidavits submitted the last, month, the last minute this morning. Where are those affidavits? a handful of affidavits been for the last month. 
the candidate is at ample time to do whatever he should have done to make sure the signatures are valid to rebut our complaint. Between the verified complaint and the staff's report, the presumption of validity has been overcome. And it's now incumbent on the candidate to demonstrate that the signatures are valid. There can no longer be a presumption in this case, not with the overwhelming evidence that we submitted and that the staff assembled in its report. There's no presumption here of validity. It's incumbent upon Mr. Craig to demonstrate now why these signatures aren't forged. Let's talk about the board's authority. There's been some debate here already, and I'm sure you're gonna hear more about the board's authority to investigate. First, as you all know, the board is required to investigate a sworn complaint under 168.558 sub eight. However, the text of that provision gives the board discretion in terms of how it conducts that investigation. It quote says that the signatures can be forwarded to the local clerk for checking or that the board quote in some other manner determine whether the signatures on the petition are valid and genuine. Sorry and to interrupt. I'm sorry. To interrupt. I just want to alert the room that there is going to be a 21 gun salute on the Capitol lawn any minute. So uh, in the interest of people not being scared or startled, just know that that is happening shortly. I'm sorry, Mr. Brewer. Thank you, Mr. Brader. <laughs> so the statute uh, under which this board operates gives the board discretion in terms of how it conducts its investigation. This has been confirmed repeatedly by the Court of Appeals. Recently, uh, the Court of Appeals in a case arising out of Wayne County, Barrow versus Wayne County Board of Canvassers, found there that although the board had a duty to investigate, it had discretion in how it would investigate and the court would not second guess that discretion. That that was not something that the plaintiff in that case could obtain by mandamus. He could not get a court order to specifically direct that board how to conduct its investigation. And there have been similar cases involving recount petitions and recall petitions in the past where the courts have consistently said that bodies like this have discretion in terms of how they conduct their investigation. So we can quickly, I think, dispose of this idea that your hands are tied to a particular method of investigation. Now, Mr. Craig claims that the statute, and I believe he's referring to 168.544C sub six, prohibits the board from disqualifying all of the forged signatures um, because they're doing that on the basis of a single signature. However, when he relies upon that provision, he ignores a subsequent provision of that statute, MCL 168.544C sub 11. Under that subsection, and specifically subsection 11A, if a circulator makes a false statement in a statement, a certificate, a circulator certificate, the board can disqualify obviously fraudulent signatures on an entire sheet without examining each signature. That's exactly what 11A authorizes this board to do. And no court has said otherwise. And you all know from reading the editions that the circulator certificate is very broad. The circulator attests that each signature was signed in his or her presence. And that the bet to the best of his or her knowledge or belief, each signature is the genuine signature of the person purporting to sign the petition. That the person signing it at that time was a registered elector, et cetera, et cetera. And the circulator signed that. And if the staff and the board finds that circulators filed false certificates, you are authorized by subsection 11A to proceed to disqualify entire sheets of petitions without having to resort to the QVF. 
And it's very clear, you have very clear statutory authority to do that. QVF, of course, can be used in that process, but this section very much broadened this board's authority and added to the case law that I cited earlier about the discretion accorded the board and the staff to do all of this. A forged signature violates every element of a certificate that I just read to you. It triggers your ability to invoke 168.544C11A. I would add, I think sub B could also be triggered here as well as other provisions, but certainly it triggers 11A. Thus the board does not have to check every signature to disqualify signatures. These circulators lied on their circulator certificates, allowing the board to disqualify entire sheets. And Mr. Prater and the staff report have elaborated as has our 200 page complaint about the obviously fraudulent signatures. The patterns are un undeniable. Sheet after sheet of identical handwriting. You know, sheets that never saw the outside of a room because they were passed around a table. They weren't on the streets, on clipboards exposed to weather and all the other exigencies one encounters when you circulate petitions. They were signed by forgers in the comfort of a room and this board has authority to disqualify all of them. Now, Mr. Craig says in the public and through his lawyers, well, this is not my fault. You know, I'm a victim here. That's absurd. Um, we also heard from Ms. Brandenburg this morning that we weren't told that we were victims of fraud. Well, the attorney general and this body have for years been warning people that there are fraudulent circulators out there. And there've been matters like that before this board. So there's been ample public notice that these candidates should take care in that regard. These are Mr. Craig's petitions. He is the candidate. He is responsible for his campaign. If he didn't have a vetting process or he chose to look the other way, when obviously forged signatures passed through his hands, I might add he signed one of his own petitions. So the question is what was going on? If he's signing his own petitions. Why wasn't he checking the other petitions as well? He also submitted an affidavit of identity, which he swore under oath that he meets all of the statutory qualifications to be on the ballot in Michigan. Well, one of the principal qualifications is that you submit at least 15,000 genuine signatures. He violated that oath that he made in his affidavit of identity. That affidavit identity makes him responsible for these petitions. You know, the voters of Michigan don't ask for much of gubernatorial candidates. All we ask is a modicum of organization to collect 15,000 valid signatures. There's no time limit, unlike initiative petitions, as the board knows. And it seems that anyone who wants to be governor of Michigan should be able to manage that without employing dozens of forgers who submitted thousands of forgeries. So Mr. Craig is not a victim Mr. here. Burke, if you can finish it up. I will, Mr. Schenkel. Yes, your any time limits we've had. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schenkel. He's not a victim here. This is his responsibility, not the boards, not the staffs, to make sure that these signatures are genuine. Michigan has to have a zero tolerance policy for forgery. What message would this board send if you allow candidates with forged signatures to be on the ballot? That sends a message throughout the country that Michigan is fair game for forgery. You have to send a stern message today that any candidate who had forged signatures cannot be allowed on the Michigan ballot. That's the only way that we can go forward and protect the integrity of our elections. So on behalf of my client, I would ask that you not place Mr. Craig on the ballot.
Thank you very much, and I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. Oh, thank I, you very much. Oh, I, Tony, just a ahead. couple on related to the work that was done in in the challenge and the the comparison of uh, you use fair and equal. You used um, the uh, anti-abortion. There are multiple ones that you utilized. How did you what? Why did you use those ones? <laughs> We had copy. First of all, we had copies, Mr. Don, obviously, uh, and they were fairly recent. You know, they're from 2020. So it, it seemed to us that using that comparison um, would be the most recent signature of that person that's publicly available. I mean, we don't have access to the QVF. Um, and we thought it added an extra element to the proofs in our case that not only do we see the pattern, but again, hundreds and hundreds of signatures that don't match. So they were the most recent ones that are available to us. Uh, and we thought it was a useful piece of evidence. And when, when reviewing those from the previous, did you, did you look at who the circulator was of those signatures? Is there, a, is there a chance that the circulator from the previous is somebody that's tied up in this? And then we were drawing into question, which of those two is actually legitimate if, if either? As far as we can determine, um, they were not circulated by the same person, but I don't want to, I want to be very careful here. I can't guarantee that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Don, we were operating under the same seven day limit. And what we were focused on was signatures. And the question is, did the signature match? Um, as we point out with the circulators in, in our complaint, we had multiple varieties of signatures from allegedly the same circulator. So it appears that there were even circulator signatures being forged in these petitions, but we did the best we could, Mr. Daunt, under the time we had. Thank you. And Thank you. I, the, from, from those answers directed towards the staff, in reviewing the staff report for Mr. Craig, it, it states that the, the Brewer challenge was not processed because the, rev, the initial review and the fraudulent led you to deem them insufficient at that point. Again, going back to my previous statements, I, I don't assign any ill intent, but that's to me that's troubling that the work done by Mr. Brewer, which Lord strike me dead, I think was very thorough and did a very nice job, that that wasn't utilized to say, okay, there's some, they've done a lot of work here. Let's check these against the file and, and basically confirm this. That to me is troubling again, that we're using assumption rather than the proof that was assembled. Mr. Shago, may I respond, but I don't want to preempt Mr. Brader. And I don't know if that's questions directed at me, Mr. Don. It was more directed at Mr. Okay. Brader. I'll, I'll go first since it was directed to me. Um, so we, the reason we didn't process the challenge is because we had determined based on our own review that these were fraudulent uh, signatures. So reviewing them again based on further evidence wouldn't have changed our determination. So in, a, in the need to economize our, our time and resources, that's how we always proceed. We don't process a challenge if we've already determined that it's invalid. However, I would note that if we were to process that, we would have done the same thing where you know, we would have employed the same process. We would have looked line by line and then we would have tried to look up as many in QVF as we had. So I don't think it really would have made a difference. And if I may, Mr. Schinkel, we, we have no objection to the way the staff proceeded. Um, we're not raising that here today. Um, you know, again, your nonpartisan professional staff reached the same conclusion that we did independently of us. So we have no objection to the way the staff proceeded here. And as I indicated in my testimony, they proceeded lawfully and the reports before you um, should be adopted and these candidates should be rejected. And hey, Mr. Brewer, thanks for being here. I Thank you, Mr. Schickel. One more, if I can beat yeah. this horse into glue. Um, in doing review and research last night, I, I discovered that passage that Mr. Brewer mentioned regarding discretion and in, in finding that to be in conflict with what others have pointed out about we are to presume validity in every instance unless it can be proven by the Bureau with the signature on file that it is invalid. Not being attorney, how do we square those conflicting pieces? I'll go, and then if the Attorney General's office wants to add anything, I will defer to them on the legal interpretation. The, the board's obligation is to canvas the petition. 
And so the bureau staff is making a recommendation about what the outcome of that canvas should be. And they either have enough valid signatures or they don't. Um, so in the process of doing that, we review every page, every line to try to determine whether there are enough valid signatures. It is absolutely true that when we review signatures, we use the qualified voter file. I don't believe that in an instance such as this, uh, the election law requires, any section of the election law requires each and every fraudulent line to be looked up in QVF. Um, so under that understanding, you know, we have done a full review and we use QVF whenever we did check signature validity. Um, and, but I don't, I don't believe under these circumstances, um, particularly in light of the fact that there have not been any specific examples of um, uh, signatures submitted by the circulars that have actually been asserted to be valid with any level of specificity. We did look quickly at the affidavits and those don't, do not specify when, you know, they do not specify whose uh, petition they sign. I don't believe they say when they sign the petition. So this could simply be, and likely is, individuals who did actually sign Mr. Craig's petition because he did have valid signatures out, uh, circulars out in the field collecting signatures, but then someone else also forged their signature on a different form, and that's the one that we didn't count. So under these circumstances, I think that we have uh, made a recommendation uh, for the canvassing, uh, you know, consistent with the law, and we have utilized QVF to the extent we possibly could. I don't know if the AG's office wants to add anything. Okay. Okay. May I, if I may, Mr. Shigo, may I supplement that? But I don't want to cut off the Attorney General either. What? I don't have anything to add unless there's a specific question for myself. If I may, just finally, Mr. Shinkle and Mr. Mr. Don, subsection 11A says the board can disqualify obviously fraudulent signatures and the staff and our complaint have documented thousands of obviously fraudulent signatures without having to resort to looking at each signature in the QVF. This is precisely the situation that subsection 11A was designed for. And the board and the staff are entirely within their discretion to strike Mr. Craig and these other candidates from the ballot. Thank you. We're gonna take a, a recess till 11.20, 11.20 a.m. We're recessed. Thank you very much. No, 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 I'm saying you. Thank you. 
Sometimes you check, but a lot of times it's like, oh, we're just going to do this. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Are these new cards that I'm getting? Oh, you might be. Are you done with your outside activities? No, I, I, I don't have three. Oh, jeez. So, you guys got to do the group of four. You know what? If you guys can, as long as. Does Jonathan know your request? Did you make it to him? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, if you're not here, we'll skip you, but. Okay. You know, these little things we're in, but these game factors, when you get through the judge schedule, you're well, I don't know. I think we have to be out of here today by 4.30. Well, so we don't I think they said 5 o'clock. Secretary of the Senate, you got Shirky's cell number? No. I want to call him and tell him we might want to be here after 5. Thirty-seven. I have to learn how to sit back. 37, okay. So the next one after we were on number uh, Michael Brown, James Craig 11's next. That'd be Tudor Dixon. We're not doing, right, we're doing 12. Right, but the tutor is not one. I see. She's not one of the five. So we're on to number 12, which is Johnson. Perry Johnson. Right. We come back to fix them later. The 12 is next? Yes. And we got all kinds of 12s. I only can handle one of 
There's only two. Now, who's representing Johnson? Who's representing the challenge here? What do you, you think? Know, when I saw something in, uh, in Johnson's. Well, these are the two attorneys. Was that he was going to send three attorneys to issue. So I guess we need to decide if you want to hear from all three of them or if you. Well, we've already. There's a local council talk here. Holson Van. Oh, Lito. Lito. The challenger. Okay, so we've got two. How do you know he's a challenger? You just know that? Yeah, I know that Lito is not defending Gary Johnson. Okay. The okay, so these are the guys. I'll, I'll right. write them and come up first. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to flag since we're going through the five gubernatorial candidates with the, with the fraud issues. Yeah. If, and if you want to decide on those after we finish that discussion, yeah. it would likely to make sense to first talk about the two judicial candidates that are also affected because they, it's the same, it's going to be the same determination. Sure. So we've got, uh, when we get done with, uh, what was the last one? Is John? Mm -hmm. Mark, I'm happy to call my doctor's office. My son tested positive yesterday. He missed his appointment. Can I make a quick phone call outside? Uh, okay. You're not going to miss much, but I'll wait for Thank you. you. <laughs> So when that happens, I'll just let you know who else is You can decide how you want to handle it. People will think they get a little.
signatures that Mr. Garland circulated. And we have an affidavit from one of those voters and we've you know, geolocated using Google Maps, the other signatures around where the person says she signed that petition. And that appears to be valid. We don't have any reason looking at the face of that sheet perhaps without access to the to the signature file that the staff has to believe that that was invalid. And that was just in 24, in 48 hours, we were able to, in my view, rehabilitate at least those 10 signatures. And that's 10 of, of 200 that they say was were, were invalid. But again, you, you're trying to say that there's a presumption because I found what I think is a pattern that I should invalidate everything. I don't think that's what Michigan law provides. I think Michigan law says, you have to go signature by signature, because if there are valid signatures mixed in with the invalid signatures, you shouldn't disqualify the valid signatures. I agree. But if, in fact, you find no valid signatures in a very broad examination of signatures, uh, then I would suggest to you um, that the presumption is rebutted and the, the burden essentially shifts. Well, I, I think if that's the case, I think we have met that rebuttable presumption by presenting the affidavit that we submitted today, at least for, with respect and to who is the circulator. Uh, that was Mr. Garland. Um, and according to the staff report, that's 203 of the signatures that would need to be rehabilitated to get up to 1200 to put Mr. Johnson back on the ballot or to ensure Mr. Johnson's place on the ballot. And to be fair, they haven't confirmed that 99 or 100%, I'm sorry, sorry they haven't confirmed that 99 or 100% or 90% of the signatures are valid, but the director of Bureau of Elections on admission, they've looked at 10%, and, and we don't, even half. And we don't even know for sure that it's 10% of the 7,000 that, or the 6,900 that they're saying are invalid with respect to Mr. Johnson's signatures. So I don't know, maybe they've only looked at 50 of those. Maybe they've so, looked at 200 of those. We don't have any idea how many, how many actual signatures they've reviewed on the, on the allegedly fraudulent circulator petitions that were submitted by so, Mr. Johnson. So Mr. Torchensi, you said you were just retained by Mr. Johnson after the petitions were, were submitted? I was retained after the, uh, after the complaint was filed. So you did not advise him about whatever, well, I, it doesn't matter. I'm not gonna get into gave, advice I gave clients, but I will know, tell you when I was retained. Do you know what validation procedures um, to ensure the quality of the signatures? Do you know what procedures were adopted by the Johnson campaign? I, my understanding is that the, the printed names were compared, or the, the names that, you know, where you could read the handwriting were compared to the computer generated qualified voter file that the campaign obtained from the state. And, you know, my client thinks that they had a really high validity rate. I think it was not until you pretend that you're a forensic document examiner looking at signatures that you would say, okay, you know, maybe I should have set these aside. And, and look, the, the people that are doing these are not qualified document examiners. They're not handwriting examiners. They're not trained. They're, they're generally young kids that are working on campaign staffs. They're not trained to, to you know, to, to sort of be handwriting analysts. It's not what they do. They're trained to like, you know, do my data entry and look at the data in the QVF. I mean, that's what they're trained to do. But, but there are other things that they could discern from looking at the petitions, isn't that true? For example, yeah. one of the things that, um, that was noticed by the Bureau was that many petition sheets were pristine, clearly had not, been, had not seen a clipboard. Um, would that, wouldn't that be something that ought to give pause to the campaign? Show me which of those sheets were Mr. Johnson's. I mean, you're, you're presenting hypotheticals to me, and I'm telling you, you have to deal in the facts in front of you. So show me the pristine sheets for Mr. Johnson's folks that you think never saw outside, and then we'll talk about those. But I think this hypothetical, I mean, yeah, if you set up your hypothetical exactly that way, like it looks like somebody typed in a bunch of names and printed them off. Yeah, maybe it looks like somebody typed in a bunch of names and printed them off, but you have to deal with the facts in front of you, not the hypothetical that you've just presented to me. But what I'm suggesting to you is that there are a number of things when petitions are examined, and there are a number of things that should give a campaign pause other than simply attempting to validate the genuineness of the signature. But you're also assuming that in thousands of pages of signatures that one person is collectively looking and comparing them between them when in fact it's probably a distributed effort among what could be dozens of people. 
So I, I think you're you're presuming a lot of regularity to to the way campaigns would function, like they're a law firm or a court or forensic document examiners. But that's not the way campaigns work in the real world. No, I, I understand. I understand how campaigns work, and I do understand that it is the obligation of the candidate and his staff uh, to to provide to the Bureau of Elections and the Board of Canvassers valid signatures. Yes, but there's also a presumption in the law that signatures that are presented from notarized circulators are valid signatures. And that presumption requires rebuttal by clear, competent, and convincing evidence from case law. And, and respectfully, you know, the petition sheets being clean, maybe, maybe not. Our petition sheets were also challenged by, by a voter for being crumpled and dirty. Which is it? Very much. Thank you Thank very you. much for coming, coming in. Let me call on Steve Lidl. L I E D E L. Lidl. Lidl. <laughs> you don't have to spell it again, Steve. We got it. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, Steve Lidl from Dykema. Uh, representing today, uh, Ms. Carol Bray of Hazlitt. Uh, we, uh, it's a complaint uh, uh, with regard to the petitions filed by Mr. Johnson. Take just a few minutes of your time. I'd like to thank all of you for your time today, and in particular, at the time that the staff, the Bureau of Elections has devoted to this process, which appears to have been unusually and quite intense. Candidates who put their name forward to lead the state of Michigan have to be able to reach the signature threshold legally it's not up to the candidates to throw a bunch of sheets of paper with some names on it that look pretty good uh, and then leave it to the state to decide, oh, are they good or are they not? Uh, they have an obligation to satisfy the requirements of the Michigan election law. And candidates and their campaigns are accountable under the plain text of the Michigan election law for the actions of their own campaigns. Thanks to the work of the dedicated career civil servants at the Bureau of Elections, there has been irrefutable mass fraud and blatant forgery documented both by the staff and in complaints filed under oath by a number of candidates for different offices, many of whom identify the same fraudulent circulators independently that the board staff at the Bureau has identified. The board of canvassers should not satisfy these candidates uh, where your staff has determined there are insufficient petitions. There should be consequences for the blatant disregard of Michigan election law and the integrity of our electoral process. In fact, the candidates who submitted fraudulent signatures, and there are documented fraudulent circulators submitted by the uh, Johnson campaign, identified in the complaint with sworn uh, declarations that have not been rebutted as forged campaigns. And there's been quite some time, more than a month since these allegations have been raised, not just one day. Uh, these candidates, including Mr. Johnson, should absolutely face disqualification by this board from the ballot, ballot. better yet, they may take an honorable position and follow the lead of their colleague, Michael Brown, and withdraw given the forgery that has occurred. Candidates signed an affidavit under penalty of perjury when they submitted their petitions with an estimated number provided by the candidate that they indicated that this was an estimated signature made to the best of their ability. They can't later walk away from a sworn affidavit. They neglected to, to perform due diligence recommended by the board and readily available to the world on the internet, uh, published in April in 2020. There are numerous recommendations, uh, beginning on page 13 of this document, uh, that uh, the Bureau makes regularly, both verbally and through its publications to all candidates, including Mr. Johnson. I'll highlight one, which is in bold on page 14, quote, implement a quality control process before filing the petition. Okay. 
It is clear based on the work of the staff, complaints, and activities of the sim similar uh, petition circulators uh, based on complaints and other campaigns that the Johnson campaign neglected to perform their due diligence in checking or verifying the signatures they were submitting despite guidance from the Bureau to do so. Clearing the 15,000 signature threshold to appear on the ballot is the bare minimum. Anyone running for statewide office for the office of governor should be able to complete. I will note that there are six other candidates that somehow managed to do so. And we have numerous candidates over the years that have had no issue clearing the $15,000 threshold. Fraud is fraud. The law doesn't distinguish between paid circulators or volunteers. Candidates under Michigan law are 100% responsible for vetting their signatures, running a lawful thorough process and supervising their agents and employees who uh, work directly for and should be accountable to the candidate. On a most basic level, candidates are the head of their campaign operation. They bear responsibility for all actively activity conducted within them or on behalf of candidates. Outsourcing signature collection does not outsource their burden of personal responsibility with it. Collectors are employees or agents of the candidates. Again, nothing exhausts any candidate from prioritizing the time and resources it requires to independently and personally verify the signatures were legitimate and collected in truth and full consent of the voters listed. This multi-level uh, failure across the Johnson and other campaigns that displayed fraudulent behavior on a scale that's unprecedented denotes really some internal incompetence, negligence, dysfunction, and a lack of leadership. The way one conducts their gubernatorial campaign offers a picture on how they would run this state. I would remind all candidates for the office of the governor, they are seeking the trust of the people of Michigan to perform the unique constitutional duty to be solely responsible for the faithful execution of the laws of the state, including our election laws. So as you uh, consider uh, the uh, insufficient signatures submitted by the Johnson campaign, uh, I also ask the board, uh, as is its, uh, within its authority, to consider what candidate Perry Johnson knew and hold him accountable. There are indications that there may have been um, efforts underway at the Johnson campaign to attempt to discern issues with their petitions. I'm gonna approach uh, with the permission of the chair of the board to present uh, a couple of petition, uh, a, a copy of a petition sheet. Uh, this is a reference to Johnson petition sheet number 1652. I'll provide you a copy of that, 1650 as well. Uh, they include stickers uh, with numbering and lettering. Uh, not a post-it note, but a sticker over the face of the petition. Um, there appears to have been some sort of effort, uh, apparently unsuccessful, uh, to determine uh, whether or not um, there were issues with the petitions or rather than just filing them after they came in from the, the circulators. It suggests to me that there's an indication that there may be knowledge on the part of the Johnson campaign. I'll share those with you. You will see on that document a close-up of the sticker you know, that obviously covers a portion of uh, the petition and then on the backside, a full copy of the petition scan as we received it from the Bureau. Uh, petition number 1650 uh, is also a similar petition with a sticker that was left on and not removed prior to submission. Um, I think that um, uh, there's also another issue. I don't know if this was amongst the mis miscellaneous defects identified by the Bureau staff's thorough work, but uh, that is a reason for uh, all of the petitions, or all the signatures on a petition to be rejected if there are mandatory elements uh, of a petition obscured. I'll close uh, with two quotes from Mr. Johnson. Public statements recently made that also may help indicate to the board that there may have been some personal knowledge of this process. 
quote, this is a quote uh, in public remarks Mr. Johnson made to um, uh, a group called Church Militant Michael Voris event in Oakland County on or about uh, May 9th. Mr. Johnson said, quote, now we don't go and get the signatures. We don't get a chance to check to see whether or not these people are alive or dead. We hire people to get the signatures. And then he continued, quote, so here's what I did because I'm a quality guru. Unlike Craig, who hired only two groups, I hired 11 different groups. So I was not dependent on one group if they messed up. That's why we are in the situation we are. It's a matter of taking a quality initiative. I commend the staff of the Bureau uh, for their quality work in identifying violations of the Michigan election law. I hope those responsible are prosecuted uh, and I encourage the board to act appropriately in disposing of Mr. Johnson's petitions. I thank you for your time today. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. No questions, we'll move on. Number 13 on our agenda. I'd like to call on Garrett. I think it's Kroger, I'm not sure. Can't capture your last name here, Garrett. So go ahead and have a seat and say it and spell it out for the uh, clerk. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Garrett Coger. I um, am from the law firm of Fraser Trebelcock. I represent Mr. Michael Markey. Uh, I have tell your name for us, Garrett. K O G E R. Okay. And who's your partner there? This is Mr. Michael Markey. Okay. And he will be giving a statement. Very good. Uh, Mr. Markey, are you an attorney? I am not. Okay, raise your right hand for me, please. You saw me swear what you're about to say. It's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Garrett. Take it away. Thank you, sir. I'd like to first begin by pointing out, um, I think that it's pretty clear that the burden here is, in fact, on the state. Uh, I think that's represented, or I will say it is represented by the fact that the only one who maintains access to the QVF is the state. The law places the burden to exclude signatures on um, that entity with access to bounce those signatures off the QVF. Candidates have no ability to do that. Um, so I also would submit to you that the um, Secretary of State's own manual adopts that theme and that the presumption throughout the manual uh, is that signatures are in fact valid. They have to be um, obviously fraudulent to be stricken. And the word obviously here is something that I think, uh, well, I know everyone has overlooked within the statutory scheme. I'm gonna cite MCL 168, 544 little c sub 11, um, which is what was cited earlier to suggest that this body should um, exercise its discretion and remove Mr. Markey from the ballot. I, I'm just going to read the entire statute and then I'm going to point out why I think particular words are important. If after a canvas and a hearing on a petition under su sections 4, 76 or 552, the Board of State Canvassers determines that an individual has knowingly and intentionally failed to comply with sub eight or 10, the State Board of Canvassers may, emphasis on may, impose one or more of the following sanctions. Sub A, disqualify obviously fraudulent signatures on a petition form, the signatures on the form on which the violation of subsection eight or 10 occurred without checking the signatures against local registration records. Sub B, disqualify, disqualify from the ballot a candidate who committed, aided, or abetted, or knowingly allowed the violation of subsection eight or 10 on a petition to nominate that candidate. 
Number one, I would point out it's discretionary. The board, the board of canvassers has discretion, as I agree with, with uh, prior counsel that's been before you. Uh, sub A, my reading of it would apply to an individual who um, violates sub, sub eight. So the, the, the um, circulators themselves, obviously fraudulent signatures. I'd submit to you that for, for a signature to be obviously fraudulent, you have to look at the signature. The, the board of elections here, the Bureau of Elections here does not even suggest it look at all the signatures. In fact, it concedes that it did not look at all the signatures. I understand the, the problem of living in resources working for, uh, for a state entity. I get that. But the statute requires that you can only strike obviously fraudulent signatures from the specific petition sheet. I do not read and I do not believe I submit to you that you should read that sub uh, part of the statute to mean that you can strike entire petition sheets based on the name at the bottom of the sheet. I move on to sub B, a discretionary sanction available to the Board of Canvassers is disqualify from the ballot a candidate who committed, aided or abetted or knowingly allowed, knowingly allowed, aided, actively participated in, abetted, actively participated in, knowingly, I know these signatures are fraudulent and I'm gonna submit them anyway. Nobody is alleging that Mr. Markey did that, nobody. I also wanna bring note or make note of the fact that the words like uh, forgery, which is a crime in the state of Michigan, uh, were, were referenced earlier that these were forged signatures. That coincides with the point that this has to do with knowingly um, submitting fraudulent signatures. Forgery, you must know what you're doing to forge something. It's a specific intent crime in the state of Michigan. Same thing, reference the affidavit of intent. Affidavits are based on your personal knowledge. I, I, I believe that issue will also be taken up at some point. But the point here is the candidate must know. This statutory scheme is designed to sanction, to impart you the authority to, to sanction knowingly fraudulent activity. None of that has been alleged against Mr. Markey. Some of the questions posed had to do with whether um, the candidates knew. Well, why didn't you know? Why didn't you find out? I'd submit to the, to the board that the Secretary of State Bureau of Elections itself did not know. They didn't find out. Their facial review, as reflected in their report, was never properly conducted in Mr. Markey's case. What they did was identified people who had submitted fraudulent, uh, suspected fraudulent signatures, and once they saw those names, they just kicked the entire sheet. The law does not provide, as I just supplied to you, that mechanism. So the Secretary of State, it's the Secretary of State let this pass as well, as far as the facial review. That facial review required, according to its own process and its own report, that it actually look through each sheet and identify those obviously fraudulent signatures, and it didn't do that by its own admission. I'd like to make note of a statement that was made earlier, and I completely agree with Mr. Dawn. This decision cannot be made based on assumption. I'm not up here suggesting that there might not be a good reason to assume something may have happened. What I'm saying is the law requires knowledge, it requires evidence. And based on the report, Mr. Markey follow, passed the first facial step that set forth by the uh, Board, Bureau of Elections. On its face then, on its face, Mr. Markey has roughly 22,000 signatures to qualify for this ballot. The review also notes, or the report, excuse me, also notes that Mr. Markey received no challenge to his signatures, none. Yet, without having received the challenge or a challenge, the 
department bypassed its second step, which would only be triggered if it received a challenge and did its blanket review of the petitions that, that contain these, I think the uh, report alleges 24 uh, circula uh, cir um, circulators that, that are uh, fraudulently um, submitting ballots. So the report admits that it bypassed its second step. There was no trigger to conduct that second, that, that thorough review. And it admits it created its own um, new process. And the, the explanation there is because of the volume. I appreciate there's volume here, but again, the burden under the law is on the, the Bureau of Elections to um, render signatures invalid. And even though no complaint was, was lodged against Mr. Markey, his signatures, when you compare with the other candidates here, were treated the most harshly. He submitted 22,000 and roughly, the, the board said roughly only 4,400, I believe, were actually valid. That's, they struck something like 80% of his signatures without even going through line by line, by their own admission. What they did, in fact, was use a complaint lodged against another campaign to attack Mr. Markey's signatures. Earlier, it was stated that, that those complaints, the, the um, candidate, the, the complaints were lodged that were never given notice because there was no need because the department or bureau would just go through um, and do it on its own anyway. Well, what they did by not serving those complaints on the candidates was deprive them due process to respond to those complaints. This process, their violation of due process was then extended to Mr. Markey. That's clear as day. The, the reports came out two, roughly two days ago, two and a half days ago, and then we're, up, we're told that we are supposed to produce, we being the candidates, are supposed to produce affidavits of, in Mr. Markey's case, I guess 11,000 and some change voters to say that it's in fact their, their, their signature. It's, it's at the very least, it should call into question by this body what, it, what the appearance of impropriety, whether that is present, and, and I submit to you that it is. I'm ready for Mr. Markey to make a statement while he's sitting there. If you're ready for that, we gotta keep this moving along. I'd like to keep going if, if that's okay, but well, I mean, are you cutting, if you're time, cutting me short, let me know. We're, we're hearing the same arguments that everyone else has made here, and you're doing well, a good I, job. I would submit to you, sir. You're my arguments are job. my right. arguments are a little bit different. I think they're okay. Go ahead. With regard to the report specific to Mr. Markey, it in in itself notes multiple mistakes um one being it's it struck roughly or i think i think exactly 1980 votes for or, um signatures for mr markey uh submitted by indira radcliffe who in reality only submitted 470 signatures that's a that they're off there by 400 percent on the one circulator credited Sierra Brown with 465 signatures. And it's my understanding that the, that, that person never actually submitted signatures on behalf of uh, Mr. Markey. Who's that? Who, who didn't submit any? C Sierra Brown, I believe that. Sierra Brown? Yes, sir. Mr. Markey here did everything in good faith. He did it right. And in a minute, he's gonna explain what he did to, to um, oversee to an extent this process and with, within the means available to him. Um, and by that, I, I will um, give it to Mr. Markey, although I, I'd like to perhaps have some closing statements. Yeah, first, let me just say, this seat up here feels a lot different than the ones back there. Um, 
So you guys have mentioned wear and tear and that the petitions were all perfect. Mine were not. Look at Brianna Briggs. I submitted this to the Detroit News last night. I've got significant wear and tear on Brianna Briggs and others. You said that it's unusual if an entire petition sheet is filled out. I'm not aware that that makes it unusual because I'm pretty competitive. I would have a very hard time submitting an incomplete sheet. However, once again, let me point to, I found in Brianna Briggs, she had complete sheets. Many took days. The dates were spread out over days, sometimes over a week. That's a poor conclusion. You look at, you know, it was said earlier that we've all been warned that there's possible fraud, so therefore take that as your warning. I was just in Florida, and when, you know, we all know there's sharks in the water, but if the risk is greater, guess what? They give us warning. That wasn't done here. And then in the last testimony from Mr. Johnson's attorney, he said, you have to understand that oftentimes these campaigns have dozens of people that will review them and that it doesn't work this way in the real world. Yes, it does. I had one, me. As I hired a company out of Florida, and I know many of the complaints here are a company out of Michigan. I didn't have that company. And so I asked, what do you do? How do you validate? I asked to get the, you know, they told me this was unusual. Uh, I guess that was good. I got all the scans right away. I didn't wanna pay for something without seeing it. And I wanted to look over them. So I did that. And I found mistakes and I challenged them on it and some of them they took off. So, and then on top of that, they, the company I used, used the words like validated over and over. Your validity rate is very good. They gave me software that they had to double check it. I spot checked them. Our validity rates were good. I think one of the issues here that hasn't been brought up is I want you to think of somebody who cheats. You know, we all know Jose Canseco started taking steroids and some of his home runs are no good because he took steroids. But does anyone contend that every home run that Jose Canseco hit was due of steroids? No. So I'm not contending that some of these circulators didn't cheat later on. I don't think they cheated on ours. You gotta understand, we weren't under a time crunch. Other campaigns were. We paid $7 a signature. They paid 20. And we got ours done early. And so I've read through the complaints of Mr. Brewer, Mr. Lydell, and the PAC that supported um, Mrs. Dixon. And so as an example, in Brewer's complaints, they talked about with Steve Tinnen, who is one of our circulators, that he had hooked R's, M's, A's, and B's. I've looked over Tinnen's. I didn't find hooked R's, M's, A's, or B's. One of the complaints said Nicholas Carlton had a very significant, very distinctive capital K. I looked at Mr. Carlton's. We didn't have that. They said that there was no wear and tear. I've already made that clear. We had wear and tear. I've got ones with watermarks on them suggesting they were out. You can find clipboard markings on our petitions. They were out. The, the rate at which we gathered petitions also was an, a fluctuation of how the weather was. When weather was better, I was submitted more, sign, or more petitions for review. That makes sense. So I was given a process. They said that we validate three times, three different people. I also looked over them all. So I think the case here is that ours weren't reviewed or not significantly, not in detail, because there was also conflicting testimony earlier in the report. Mr. Brader said that they went over all of them. If you remember, he said, we went over all the signatures. And when we found a good signature, we put it back. That was his testimony. On the first page of the staff report on fraudulent nominating petitions, in the first paragraph, halfway down it says, and staff reviewing these signatures against the qualified voter file did not identify any signatures that appeared to be submitted by a registered voter. Well, which one is it? In the testimony, it was, if we found good ones, we put it back and we did. And then in the actual report, it says, we never found a single one. I find that hard to believe. You use the words redeemable qualities. You could have 100% fraudulent signatures. 
it's not statistically likely that you wouldn't find any of those signatures with redeemable qualities. So to unilaterally say we found zero good signatures, that in itself, you use this, this assumption that if petitions are fully filled out, that should lead you to the assumption there's something wrong with the conclusion, that there's something wrong with the quality. If you went through 7,000 signatures and said, we didn't find a single one with redeemable quality, that in itself should raise question to the validity of your findings. Statistically, that's unlikely. So I just asked the board to separate us, to look at us differently. We didn't do it the way others did. I have emails that I can prove going back and forth with the company that I hired, which is not the same one as the other people, that'll show we did validate, we put due process, because I agree with you guys. Number one, I'm kind of cheap. If I'm paying seven bucks a piece, that was more than I wanted to pay. I tried really hard to negotiate that down. I didn't know it was a good deal until the bridge came out with an article saying it was 20. But I looked them over. And the last thing I'm gonna say is when you have, you had a two and a half page report, I'm very disappointed that in a two and a half page report, you couldn't get it right. I'm an advisor. I handle millions of dollars for my clients. You associated me with fraud. That's a really, really big accusation that I don't think you guys took, that I think you took lightly. That's huge on my career. And this is why normal people do not run. Because I did everything I was supposed to do. I added extra quality controls. And then you just assumed I was like the rest. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Markey, uh, this process is nothing against you or your career. Let me assure you. And uh, Mr. Brader, the, the comments Mr. Markey made about conflicting testimony that you gave, could you, uh, I, I'm pretty sure I understand what you were saying when you said it, but could you spell it out and clear the record for us? Yeah, I think there may have been some misunderstanding. Uh, what I said was, uh, when we found any indication that a signature was valid, we took that entire circulator out of the category of the fraudulent petition circulators. So the ones that we have left in this category, the 36 that we have left, are those ones that we have gone through and not found a single valid signature. It's still statistically unlikely. Well, that could be true, but that's Thank what you, you said. Okay, we want to wrap this up. Yeah. Um, 30 seconds, wrap it up. All right, sir. Thank you. Um, the, the board admitted it already had a viable procedure in place. I think the, I'd submit to you that the board of canvassers should um, recognize that it rejected its already longstanding procedure with regard to the initiative petitions that it could have implemented here and it didn't. Instead, it created a new procedure that resulted in an unprecedented number of candidates being booted off the ballot. The, this body should consider that under, and, and, and consider what it looks like to the public. What's the public? The appearance of impropriety here is through the roof. The public has to have faith that our system is beyond reproach. This sheds light on that, that, that it, 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 notwithstanding what fraudulent signatures may or may not have been, been submitted, the fact that we're here in uncharted territory, that the department threw the baby out with the bathwater, I would urge this board to err on the side of caution, certify Mr. Markey for the ballot, and there's a built-in protection, and it's called a primary election. Let the Michigan voters decide who the nominee in November will be. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. One, uh, one of the things we were doing right now is we're taking the candidates that are all uh, insufficient from our, the recommendation of staff based on the fraudulent circulators. We have the five gubernatorial candidates, plus we have three judicial candidates in that category. So without objection from the board members, we're going to take those out of order and, and take the three judicial candidates so we can consider the eight based on the fraudulent circulators at the same time. Any, any comments on that? No, I think that works well. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, Chair, go ahead. I asked one, can I ask two questions to Director Brader just for clarification? Sure, sure. Just before we go forward, okay. Um, the first one I have, uh, Director Brader is, and I think you stated this earlier, 
is can a candidate uh, or a candidate campaign use, utilize local clerk's offices uh, to verify signatures? Yes, it's been stated multiple times that the candidates have no way of getting access to the signatures. That's not true. Um, it is true that they cannot get access to the qualified voter file. However, uh, we can show you as board members the qualified voter file, including the examples that have been raised, if you'd like to see them for yourself. Um, however, uh, any candidate can go to any clerk. They can get the registration record of any individual that they claim actually signed that petition, and they can get a copy of that signature. They could have done that for anyone that they claim validly signed any of these petitions. Thank you, Director Brayer. The second question I have is, have there ever been instances, and obviously we have a lot of companies that circulate petitions, um, have there been any instances in this cycle of campaigns accidentally um, submitting other campaigns nominating petitions? Uh, before I answer that, I just wanna add also, I just wanna know on the qualified voter file, although they cannot get the signature image they can get copies of the qualified voter file and they can use that to check the registration status of the, the alleged signers of those petitions. Um, yes, we have had examples of that. Um, Adam, could I defer to you to answer that because I don't know specifically what they are. Sure, um, I can tell you that there were instances, I don't have exact numbers, but there were instances where um, several candidates were submitted uh, in OneDrive for other candidate petitions, if that makes sense. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for letting me ask that question. So, okay. I have a couple of questions for Mr. Brader. Um, Mr. Brader, do, do your records indicate when Mr. Markey filed his petitions? Uh, we have that date. It'll take me a minute to give it to you. That would be March, March 18th, 2022. Was he the first person to file? Um, second, the first was Soldano, Garrick Soldano on January 19th. And was there a face check of every petition circulated by Mr. or submitted by Mr. Markey? Yes, we did a face review of every petition circulated by every candidate. And we also looked at every single line on every single petition from the fraudulent petition circulators for every candidate. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take out of order uh, three of the judicial uh, uh, candidates. Uh, Trisha Dare, number 28, John Malone, number 24, Philip Cavall, number 22. I'd like to call on Eric Doster, representing Trisha Dare, number 28 on our agenda. Mr. Doster, for the record, just for the record, spell your name for us. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Eric Doster, E-R-I-C-D-O-S-T-E-R. -E -E and, and tell us who you got sitting next to you there. Uh, uh, yes, on behalf of, uh, I'm here on behalf of Tricia Dare, candidate for the Sixth Circuit Judge, and with me is Tricia Dare. Good morning. Take it uh, away. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, the issue in our situation is similar to the discussion you have already heard uh, ad nauseum with respect to the allegations of fraudulent signature practices by paid circulators. So while we will not repeat uh, the arguments that you have just heard, or perhaps will yet to hear, yet will, will yet be heard, we will adopt by reference those arguments that relate in any manner to the process by which any signature can somehow be invalidated that has not been carefully checked in accordance with all legal requirements. Uh, in the staff report relating to Ms. Dare, uh, it says that Ms. Dare turned in 7,267 signatures. We believe that that number is a few hundred signatures higher, uh, but that may be an issue for another day. Uh, of these 7,267 signatures, the staff report invalidates 4,038 uh, signatures from 15 paid circulators which are in the staff's view, quote, fraudulent petition circulators. Uh, before I go further, I would like to 
ask a question if you would bear with me. Um, did the board, I know the Bureau of Elections said they looked at 7,000 signatures. Did the Bureau of Elections look at any petition signatures uh, relating to Ms. Dare's petitions? And if so, how many? That's a good question on judicial. Did you check judicial separate from the governor's? Yes, we did. With regard to this candidate, we checked 442 against QVF. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are not handwriting experts. Uh, and neither is anyone else in this room or otherwise associated with this process. But if fraudulent signatures have indeed been gathered, they can only be invalidated on a signature by signature basis to avoid voter disenfranchisement. To validate a signature on any automatic or random sampling or targeted method is simply not allowed. Because Ms. Sig Ms. Dare's signatures have not been invalidated on a per signature basis, as thoroughly discussed in both written and oral form before this board by other candidates and, and may yet be raised by additional candidates. This invalidation is improper and that this board has a clear legal duty to certify Ms. Dare's name for the ballot. And I would like to deviate from what some of the folks you've heard uh, today. I wanna emphasize this by example, that to invalidate a signature on automatic or random sampling basis is a radical departure from the bureaus and this board's historical practice. I wanna take you back 10 years. Only one of you was on the board at that time. Uh, in 2012, the Bureau of Elections and the Board of State Canvassers were presented with substantiated uh, claims of petition fraud. Unlike the present case, the challenger in this 2012 case uh, provided the expert review of a recognized handwriting expert, a guy named Eric Spikine, who by the way at the time, was the Bureau of Elections handwriting expert. Uh, and he unequivocally opined that numerous signatures were not made by the purported, the, the, the purported voter. Uh, this matter um, related to the 2012 challenge uh, nominating petitions of a gentleman named Sam Salome. He was a candidate for district judge for the district for district court 19, the files of which are available to the Bureau of Elections. I know this case because I represented the challenger in that 2012 case. There are two aspects of this 2012 matter that are relevant to the present situation. First, the Bureau of Elections rejected this disqualification by circulator theory to invalidate all of a particular circulator's petitions. According to then Director of Elections, Christopher Thomas, quoting Mr. Thomas, quote, okay, so I don't think we can throw them out unless they're fraudulent. I mean, I don't think, hyphen, hyphen, there's nothing that says you find a bad circulator that you can throw out all that circulator signatures out. And that was from the transcript of that uh, hearing of June 6th of 2012. So as Mr. Thomas suggests, each signature is evaluated on its own individual basis. In other words, a targeted review of a, of a few signatures to invalidate thousands and I guess in this case, 400 and some signatures, thousands of legitimate signatures. This is the very definition of voter franchisement, this disenfranchisement. <clears throat> Second, from also the same 2012 case, the following exchange between the handwriting expert that I hired and, and, and Mr. Thomas illustrates the deferential manner in favor of signature validity in which the Bureau of Elections has historically reviewed uh, a petition signature for validity, according to Mr. Thomas. I mean, we did throw out 114 based on signature genuous, and you're correct, he's addressing Mr. Spikine, we're not handwriting experts. And then Mr. Thomas goes on to state, you've been tutoring us, again, he's addressing the witness, you and your father, over the decades here on the handwriting. And so we do not certainly consider ourselves handwriting experts. So our standard is basically, it's got to be so obvious that, you know, a novice could look at them and go, that's not the signature. And then Mr. Thomas says, continues, we look on the, we compare it to the qualified voter file and we have signatures here that come off of the driver's license file. So that's our basis for comparison. So I mean, to put it kind of bluntly, it's got to basically slap you in the face, you know, you look at it, you go, oh, you know, that's obviously. And again, that's from the same January 6th, uh, 2012 transcript uh, of that hearing. So. A question signature, in the words of Mr. Thomas, must basically slap you in the face before it is deemed fraudulent by the Bureau of Elections, or at least that's what the historical practice has always been. 
And, and I, and I want to add something here. It was significant to point out and then in that 2012 matter, my handwriting expert found 48, uh, concluded that there were 48 additional forgeries that the Bureau of Elections, when it did its slap in the face, you know, review, disagreed with and actually concluded that they were valid signatures. So again, if <laughs> this is such a deferential historical practice it's the, uh, of the treatment of signatures that the, 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 the slap in the face standard here, and that's been the historical practice of, of, of the uh, Bureau of Elections and this board. So again, I, I'm hoping that during this review uh, by the Bureau of those 442 uh, signatures, that and in fact that that has been conducted, but certainly we know that they haven't done a review of all 4,038 uh, fraudulent petition signatures. So to conclude, and I know this is going to be a long day, so I'm trying to be. Brief. I know staff has slapped in the face quite a bit. I don't but, know they've looked at. It. <laughs> well, it's got to really slap you in the face, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll conclude because I know you. This is I don't I, I don't want to be repetitive of what anyone else is saying. Uh, Ms. Dare is an assistant Oakland County prosecutor. Her entire, entire legal career has been dedicated to protecting victims. So if, if in fact, some paid circulators collected fraudulent petition signatures, the protector of victims is now a victim herself. And if today this bureau deviates from its historical practice and fails to certify Ms. Dare for the ballot, both Ms. Dare and those thousands of uh, voters who signed her uh, petitions will be disenfranchised and this entire group will be victims once again. So thank you very much for the ability to make these comments and I'm absolutely free to take any questions. Okay, well, Mrs. Dare, do you have anything you wanna to add to Mr. Droster? No, I don't. Okay, any questions? Yeah, I have some questions. Um, if, the forgers were not using if let's assume that the forgers had lists of voters right okay and who are the, the forgers are these this this gang of 15 from his dares mailing petitions? lists or even um even the qualified voter file it wouldn't have a signature isn't that that correct? is correct and so they wouldn't be attempting to duplicate the voter signature isn't that correct they don't have access to the voter's signature. Right, so and I do, and I would like, and I'm gonna answer your question, but I would like to correct something that I believe I heard up here that, that, that candidates have access from the local clerks uh, for, for voter signature files. I, 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 if that's what this bureau intends to have happen, I would really request that they make that request to the, to the county and local clerks out there, because I'm, I'm telling you in the practice, that is absolutely not the case. You cannot get local, you cannot get signatures for, for uh, voter signatures off their cards. These clerks do not give that information up. So if that's what the intention is here, um, please tell the local clerks that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your question, but that's a real important point going but, forward. But I think you agreed with me that when if that if a forger is using either the QVF or a mailing list they would not be attempting to duplicate the signature of this of the voter they would simply be putting in a signature isn't that well they yeah they wouldn't have anything to compare it to right they, if that's your question that's right so and my point the point that i'm trying to make and i wonder if you would agree with me um, is that it wouldn't take a handwriting analyst to discern that there is absolutely no compare, no um, similarity between the qualified voter file signature and a signature which somebody had no, uh, was not even attempting to duplicate. Well, I guess I'm gonna go back to Mr. Thomas's discussion and in, in, in the practice of that 2012 case that I referred to, and that is, you, you, the, the, the practice of the board has historically been, if there are any redeemable qualities, you're supposed to count the signature as valid. And in this case, Ms. Gerwitz, in this 2012 case, I had a handwriting expert producing a, a report and said these 48 signatures were, were forgeries. And even then, the, the, the Bureau of Elections rejected my own, their 
handwriting expert. So, so if you're saying, do you have to be a, a, an expert, a handwriting expert to make that determination? Well, no, but there's a huge but here. The standards that have been put in place, uh, the, the, the any redeemable quality standard that have been in place and used by this board uh, that are codified in the current manual published by the Secretary of State, make that awfully hard to invalidate. No, but what I'm suggesting, if, if I um, am trying to write Eric Doster's signature. Good luck with that, because I don't sign the same way twice. Okay. If I am, and I'm not looking at your signature, I just know your name, so I'm trying to write your name. It may look better than mine, but yes. It might be better. <laughs> um, but it probably would not be difficult um, to discern the difference between my attempt to write your name and any kind and the qualified voter file. But, but again, if, if I'm not trying to duplicate the signature, I'm just using the name, um, then the difference between the signature on the petition and the signature in the QVF would probably be pretty easy to figure out. Not necessarily. That. I'm not going to agree with that because uh, you know, you're, you're, you're handed, you've been handed a clipboard before and how many times have you signed on a petition sheet on the back of someone, on, on someone's physical back? Cause there's not a clipboard. I've done that before. And, and that doesn't even, that's my signature cause I did it, but it doesn't even remotely look like I, my, my normal hand scratching. So I'm, I'm not so sure that I can agree with that statement. Okay. Um, what cause it depends on the pro you know, I'm saying if I'm, if I'm, if I say, Mary Ellen, turn around, I'm going to use your back to sign this thing. That's going to be an awful scraggly looking thing, but it's my signature. But sometimes a forgery um, is an attempt actually to duplicate somebody's signature. Isn't that true? Oh, yeah, if you have an, a specimen to compare right. it to, but here but, we don't. But I think what is asserted here um, is not that they were trying to duplicate signatures but that they were just using the voter's name and address. Isn't that true? I don't know what was asserted here. We've asked for a staff or a, an Excel spreadsheet for Ms. Dare's petitions and we haven't been provided that okay. yet. So, so I, don't, I, don't, I don't know which of these 442, I didn't even know to, until this few minutes ago that it was 442 they've even looked at. So if I understand the argument that you and others are making that, that a signature cannot be invalidated unless um, unless there's an actual comparison with the qualified voter file. Um, what that suggests is that the more fraud you have, the less the state can do about it. Is that correct? If you have 100,000 seemingly fraudulent signatures, you're not able to check them all, so you just have to accept them? You could still compare them with the, quali the, the, the qualified voter file signature on file and look for any, and, and employing the any readable, redeemable, uh, you know, similarity standard that, or, or sorry, but, quality uh, standard, then you, that still doesn't excuse that effort. No, you said, okay, you say you can still compare 100,000 or 60. Whatever the number is. Whatever it takes. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm not understanding how the, the contention that these signatures have to be accepted if there's no, if there isn't sufficient time to examine each one of them. But both in case law and Secretary of State guidance, again, is, is the, 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 the oral and written materials that have been presented this, to this board, which were uh, again, adopting by reference, so I didn't, I wasn't going to go through those. Uh, but the, the, the presumption is for genuineness of the signature. And, uh, you know, you rebut that presumption by looking for any redeemable qualities in the signature file and the qualified voter file. I don't know how else to say it. Can you also rebut that presumption by establishing that the circulators, um, attestation of the genuineness of the signature is false. Again, I go back to Mr. Thomas's statements back in 2012. That's been the historical practice of, of, the, of the Bureau and this board, and it's got to basically slap you in the face. So I, I, if you want to call so, it the slap in the face standard or the redeemable quality standard, I think they're saying they're getting at the same thing. Do you know? No. So you're relying upon a statement that Chris Thomas made in 2012. 2012 to say, and you're saying that that is dispositive of- No, I'm just saying that's my, no, no, Ms. Gerwitz, all I said was that was the historical practice 
of, of this board and the Bureau? When the board and Bureau had far fewer signatures that were allegedly fraudulent to examine, wouldn't you agree? I don't know what the circumstances, I think the signature requirements were still 15,000 per governor back in 2012. Right. Okay, uh, Tony, last question, Tony. I, I don't know if it's a question, but, and I remember Gerwitz, I, I think you were probably inadvertently making my, the point I'm, I'm so concerned with of assumption. And if you, you know they don't have something to look at and to forge it so it looks close, that's why it's so important to check against the qualified voter file and confirm the suspicion that these are fraudulent signatures, not just assume. That, that to me is what stood out in that exchange. Okay, we're gonna take a, a lunch break. Mr. Chair, are we coming back to this one when we come back from no. lunch? Because I have a very quick question has not- it's, Question. It's actually about the staff report. How many other instances do we have of a nominating petition for two different candidates having similarities in signature and the names on here. Again, going back to the question that I'd asked earlier about how many, like the, for people who are signing to nominate someone for office, how many can they sign for the sixth circuit in Oakland County? So the question is in past cycles, how many instances do we have where? Oh, oh no, I mean like right now. Okay. How many instances of? I'm looking at, at, at our staff report yes. where it states that circulators had both for Ms. Dare and Ms. Shelton looking at these side by side that are in our staff report. How many other instances do we have of this? In, in the DARE petition specifically or, or across all of them? I think that if we're looking specifically at the Sixth Circuit in Oakland County. I, I don't have that. They're the ones who are in front of us. So that's yeah. why I'm asking this I question. don't know what the exact number is. Who was a circulator on this example? The first example in your uh, report. I can't read that name. Uh, this was Niccolo Mastro Mateo on this one. Master Mateo. Oh, I see. Okay, 85 signatures. So these were all fraud then, supposedly. Correct. Man. Same exact. But they have it, <laughs> Director Brader, they have exactly the same date. So what happens to these petitions? Well, in this case, I mean, in this case, they would be invalidated because they're fraudulent. So there wouldn't be a duplicate issue. If they were not fraudulent and we had an individual who signed multiple petitions for different candidates on the exact same date, I don't know what we would do with that actually. Would we throw them both out? We would throw them both out. No. Okay. One. 16. We'll be back after a 30 minute break. 116. Thank you. Yes. 
So when you were okay, so were you were quoting about Mr. Thomas? I can't do Oh, 
I will make sure that. <laughs> I will just verify that as well. I'll show you the text once I want to Thank <laughs> you. 
So you see it now.
We're going to get started in a minute. If everybody can take their seats, please. This candidate came up. Uh, possibly been moved up in the uh, agenda order. What happened? Well, she, she requested to be moved up. Well, yeah. You know, uh, well, she's already kind of at the top. What is that? Just one more minute. As we're getting ready to get started, uh, John Allen, you can get ready to testify. But until the court recorder gets back, we're not going to go very far. <laughs> I want to keep you as on schedule as we can. There's only one person I have to have to start this thing, and there she is. <laughs> oh, I don't know. We're still at 28, 28 right now. Okay, uh, testifying right now is John Allen. We're still testifying on 28, uh, uh, Tricia Dare, Sixth Circuit Court. Uh, Mr. Allen's attorney, uh, how do you spell your last name, John? A-L-L-E-N, sir. Got it. Take it away. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you again for hearing us. Um, I am here today representing Kay Shelton, who filed a challenge to the sufficiency of the candidate petition submitted by Trish Dare, uh, who we were speaking of before the break. Um, our challenge was not processed by staff uh, who determined on their own review that uh, Ms. Dare's petitions were insufficient. Um, while we agree and support uh, that recommendation, uh, I do want to tell you about our challenge and hope, in hopes that it may supplement uh, the record that's already been made uh, and also supplement uh, and, and explain the insights of your staff as well. Um, so our analysis of Ms. Dare's petitions began actually on April 7th of 2022. Um, that was the day that her campaign released a uh, press release, which noted uh, the following, um, but by the way, she submitted all of her petitions on April 7th, that day of the press release. They were not due until April the 19th, uh, some weeks later. Um, but her press release noted that most judicial candidates in large counties take months to assemble a campaign, recruit volunteers, get organized, and obtain enough signature petitions to appear on the ballot. Oakland County Circuit Judge candidate Trish Dare did it all in 28 days. 
She was weeks early submitting these petitions and could have taken a long time to do due diligence to make sure that what she was submitting was actually, um, were actually good, valid petition signatures. But if you look at the 28 day time period that is in the press release, that basically she submitted, uh, 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 according to staff, she submitted some 7,267 signatures. It works out to roughly 200 and some odd signatures per day which is 21 full pages of signatures per day. And anybody that's done this process, a campaign uh, that will tell you, especially a judicial campaign, will tell you that that is enormously difficult to have that kind of productivity. And it was the first sign to us that something was amiss. And what we did on April the 8th, the very next day, was to ask for copies of those petitions that she submitted. So we went and asked the staff, hey, give us Trish Dare's petitions. We got them. And we started looking at them ourselves. Even while we were still gathering our own petition signatures, we had people, friends, real friends and family out on the street doing the hard work of gathering these petition signatures. We relied very, very sparingly on paid circulators just to sort of fill in, which I'll talk about in a minute. But we had a real effort that was going on even as we were looking at Ms. Dare's petitions. And what we saw um, began to trouble us, really, really trouble us. Um, our analysis started to show uh, the same patterns of fraudulent signings by some, the same paid circulators identified by staff and by uh, others who have been here this morning to, to testify, and I won't belabor all of that, but we saw the very same, uh, the same patterns and the same fraudulent signings. We saw dead people that we could verify from publicly available uh, obituaries. We saw dead people on these, on these petitions. We saw uh, people who were ill uh, that we knew were ill because they were neighbors of ours. And we went over to talk to them and said, hey, did you sign this petition? Nope, never signed this petition. Haven't left the house. I've been sick, COVID. I never signed it. Um, we showed anom anomalies like the consistent misspelling of the city Berkeley. Now, if you're from Berkeley, Michigan, there is a point of pride in how you spell Berkeley because it's not like they spell it out west. And it's not like they spell it in other places. And people who are from Berkeley don't misspell their hometown uh, name. And that was happening over and over again in these petitions. Um, worst of all, um, we, we, we saw that some of the paid circulators that we had hired, one in particular for our own campaign, had submitted petitions for Trish Dare that were virtually identical to the ones that they had already given us for our campaign. Um, and, and we had gotten ours from them weeks earlier before April the 7th. So the, this, this effort on our part was going on even as we were getting our own petitions. And if we could do it in the time it took us to submit, to timely submit a challenge, they could have done it with plenty of time to spare before they submitted these petitions. Now, if you were to ask, um, by the way, I wanna go back to that press release for just a moment. The press release says, I can't begin to thank all of my friends and supporters enough for the Herculean effort they made to make today's filing possible. They gave up their weekends, often working for hours in cold and rainy weather. I'm deeply grateful for their sacrifice and for believing in me. What's not mentioned in that press release are the 15 paid circulators, according to the staff report and according to our analysis, who collectively were responsible for 4,038 of the 7,267 signatures, verified supposedly signatures that were submitted by the DARE campaign. Uh, this was not a volunteer effort on this part. They went out and bought these signatures. Now, if you were to ask, any of these candidates that you've heard from today so far for the past three or four hours, if they wished that they had been more careful in who they hired to work for them and whether they should have more carefully vetted the work product they bought and paid for, if they were being honest with you today, 
they would say yes, resoundingly yes. They wish they'd have been more careful. But the time for vetting and care and due caution has come and gone. And all you're left with today is the deflection of blame and the regret for what could have been done differently. And, and rightly should have been done differently, especially in this case where this candidate had weeks to verify those signatures before running off and submitting them so early and making a big boastful press release about it. Okay. So let's um, move. You all set? We're done. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming in. And Jonathan, I'm remiss. I, I haven't been calling on you before I call on an, another uh, candidate. We have two more judicial candidates that are involved with the uh, fraudulent uh, circulators um, number on our agenda, numbers uh, 24 and 22. Uh, is there anything you want to say about these before we uh, call on witnesses? Mr. Chair, may I ask a question that I asked before we left because I really didn't get an answer? Okay, what was that? <laughs> and that is um, in regards to these nominating petitions that are the same for two different candidates, I don't think we really got an answer or were those submitted by the Shelton campaign? So on those sheets, I believe that they were identified by the uh, Shelton campaign. Is that correct? Or did we did we find them ourselves first? We did not. Okay. No, go ahead. So we did not find those ourselves. Those were submitted to us from somebody in the public. I don't know for sure if it was from the Shelton campaign or not one way or the other. I don't know if they're here to verify or not, but it did get emailed to us um, separately with a comparison to say, Here's, here's those side by sides. Okay, so in your review, that's that that was not those those were not part of the Shelton. Nominated. That is correct. They were not filed as part of the Shelton campaign. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to uh, call on now Phil Cavanaugh. And Phil, for the record, uh, spell your last name for us, would you please? Very good. Uh, Philip Cavanaugh, C-A-V-A-N-A-G-H. Very good. And I thank and you to this board. For, uh, for the purposes of the agenda, you're number 22, Third Circuit Judge. Uh, I am honorable board, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I was challenged. I was challenged by an individual, Mr. Hillman, uh, represented by Honickman. Um, I am trying to secure a position on the ballot for Wayne County Circuit Court. There is five open seats. There are 11 people that submitted uh, petitions and seven of those 11 were challenged. Uh, the outcome as it stands now is four are now not gonna be on the ballot if uh, this holds true and that would include me. Um, under 168.552 section A, uh, the Secretary of State can disqualify or eliminate signatures that they believe are fraudulent. As we've heard all morning, um, I'm here to object that they have declared certain circulators uh, to be fraudulent circulators, and therefore they have disavowed every sheet that was submitted. So in my instance, um, it was two people that are not associated with any other campaign. Um, it says that my situation is unique because they're not caught in with these groups or these companies. Um, and so these two submitted uh, 1,125 signatures and all of them were disqualified. Um, I'm here to object to that because I believe it disenfranchises every valid signature that is on that. If they found uh, instances of fraud on a, a per signature, even a per sheet basis, but to blanketedly say that 1,125 based on uh, signatures are invalid based on a sampling, and then I come up 186 short, um, I think is uh, against my due process. I found out that I was short on Monday, and here I am on Thursday doing everything I can. Um, again, I think it disenfranchises the voter uh, our whole country is screaming, count every vote. We don't like dis disenfranchising certain subsets. 
And all I am is requesting is instead of blanketedly rejecting 1,125 signatures, analyze those 1,125 signatures. And uh, as I believe the statute points out, again, um, um, would like to be on the ballot for Wayne County Circuit Court. And I object under the statute to the elimination of 1,125 unilaterally rejection without due process or a hearing. Um, and, you know, fraud is a criminal offense and there should be due process. Uh, and again, there are a lot of signatures on there that are valid that people want to see me on the ballot. And I think you're avoiding all of their intentions and in First Amendment rights. Um, that's all I have for the board, except thank you again for the thank opportunity you, uh, to speak. Any questions? Jonathan, what's different about this one is that you didn't list the uh, circulators. Uh, is that because uh, they, they don't appear anywhere else? They do. Um, well, no, those, those, that's true. Those two circulators were not um, found with the other drives or with the other candidates. Um, there were uh, two individuals, Charlotte. Uh, Violet Edwards and Charlotte, Charlotte Hanover. Charlotte Hanover and Violet Edwards. Those were the ones that accounted for the, fraud, the fraudulent signatures that we identified here. So we followed the same process, but these two individuals were not associated with any other campaign. Are they from Michigan? Uh, yes. They reside in Detroit. Okay, any questions? Mr. Cavanaugh, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Um, is, is John Malone in the room? Peter Adele, come on up. John Malone is the uh, candidate under number 24. He's not here, but Peter Riddell is uh, speaking uh, as a challenger for many of them. And uh, the, the two of them are the, the last two on our list here. So go ahead, uh, Mr. Riddell. Uh, how do you spell Riddell? R-U-D-D-E-L-L. -L. Good enough. You can take it away. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mr. Schinkel. Uh, I, just like the, the previous uh, judicial candidate, uh, our challenge was not processed uh, for either Mr. Malone or Mr. Kavanaugh, uh, but we do agree with, with the staff report. Uh, uh, as we've identified in our challenge, we made a good faith effort to review the petition signatures. Um, and in Mr. Kavanaugh's regard on the facial review, they only determined that he had approximately 3,800 valid petition signatures. Our review determined that he had closer to 3,000 valid petition signatures. So um, with that, we, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I don't wanna belabor the point. It's the same issues that you've been, you've been facing with. Let's all jump morning. on Mr. Malone for a second, since we haven't reviewed that. Sure, happy he to. He filed uh, almost 7,000 uh, and looks like uh, fraudulent were 5,500. And in this case, they did find, looks like a bunch of people part of the fraud gang. One, two, three, four, Looks like about 14 or so. Uh, just comment on that one since we haven't officially looked at it yet. Yeah, happy, happy to, Mr. Schinkel. So uh, we identified the fraud ring as soon as we saw those particular petitions, right? Our, our team that was reviewing those petitions had reviewed other petitions and, and noticed a lot of similarities between them. I would also note that there was a very narrow window by which Mr. Malone circulated those particular petitions. Uh, I, I don't have the math, but it was in the hundreds of signatures he would have needed to get to have received in, in one single day to have circulated at the rate that he that he alleges to have circulated. Um, so it, it is very similar to the, the situations that you've heard all morning long, where un unfortunately for Mr. Malone, um, he, he hired a fraudulent ring. Any questions, Mr. Riddell? No, oh, Peter, thanks for coming in. That concludes our eight candidates. Go Brenner. ahead. Um, I noticed in the, the um, challenge to oh, yeah. the challenge to um, Mr. Malone's petitions included an affidavit from Mark Rebner, um, who identified based on his analysis circulators who he thought who, who he had concluded. Um, we're submitting fraudulent names. Um, and it included a number of names which you had not, which the Bureau had not 
uh, identified. Um, and I wondered if you did any kind of examination of that or comparison of your findings with his. We did look at his affidavit um, and it, there is a fair bit of overlap there between those names and the names that appear on art. <clears throat> if you look at uh, paragraph 10 of his statement, um, there's a fair amount of overlap between those names and the names that appear on the um, uh, fraudulent petition circulator report. Um, for each of those, uh, we either would have uh, conducted our review and found something substantially similar to what he did, whereas every single one uh, that we looked at appeared to be invalid, or there may have been a couple where we looked at them, but we did find a couple signatures that we thought might actually be valid. And so we then would pull them out of our category of the fraudulent um, petition circulators, even though it may very well have been the case that the majority of those signatures actually were fraudulent. I think that Curry is one example of that. Is that correct, Adam? Um, I believe that's the case. Um, yeah, Curry is one example where we had reviewed it, um, but, but we found some indication that there might be a valid signature uh, in a Curry petition. And so we then would take her off of the, off of that list. But, but overall, I would say that our um, evaluation and experience is consistent uh, with, with Mr. Grebner's affidavit. Thank you. Okay, we've got eight now uh, in front of us, uh, starting with five gubernatorial candidates. And all I can ask is what's the board's pleasure? Comments, questions? Would we take them in order? Number eight would be the first one we take up. Well, let me make some comments. Um, this is obviously an incredibly troubling uh, matter that we're dealing with here, with these this vast number of um, apparent, not just apparently, but demonstrably false signatures submitted on behalf of many candidates. And the question is what we do with it. Um, and the suggestion um, by um, the candidates, um, the repeated suggestion is that essentially we can't do anything about it because there isn't time to check all of the signatures. And they suggest that if we, if we do not actually um, compare each of those uh, seemingly false signatures to the qualified voter file, then we have to accept them, which is a totally uh, absurd um, position. We have an obligation uh, deter to determine whether the requisite number of qualified uh, and registered voters have signed these petitions and where we have every reason um, to know that many of the signatures, that a majority of the signatures um, have, uh, not, let me back up. What we know is that for at least 30 uh, circulators, um, all of the petitions signatures which they have submitted are false. We know that because there has been an examination of the petitions that each of them um, has submitted and no, uh, no valid signatures have been found. Uh, when a person is attempting to duplicate a signature, um, clearly uh, there would, it might, it could be much more difficult to, uh, to actually determine that the duplicate um, is, is different from the actual signature. Um, but that is not the case where there is no attempt in fact to duplicate, but there is simply um, the use of the voter's name and other information on the petition sheet. Um, so it's not, it's not the kind of forgery where a careful and hand, where a handwriting analyst is necessary because the discrepancy between the signature on the petition and the signature in the qualified voter file is immediately obvious. In Mr. Doster's word, it slaps you in the face um, and you don't need any uh, additional analysis. But what, what the, the, the board and the, the government essentially, um, we rely 
in, for, in the first instance on the circulators who sign and who are required to sign an affidavit under penalty of perjury that the signatures are genuine and that they witness those signatures being put on the uh, on the petition. And when a number of the signatures of that circulator are examined um, and it is determined that that they are not valid signatures, then we know that that circulator um, has lied, that that circulator has made a false statement. And that is, I believe, uh, enough for us to say that we cannot rely on the validity of any of the other signatures um, submitted by that circulator. Uh, now, it is theoretically possible that that circulator could have submitted some valid signatures. But where we know that that circulator has misrepresented, uh, not just misrepresented, has lied about the validity uh, of signatures which are on the petitions which he has attested to, then certainly the presumption of validity um, is rebutted and the burden, it's a, another way of saying it, the burden shifts uh, to the candidate to establish that that circulator did submit some valid signatures and we have not seen that burden satisfied. Um, we know that the, everyone has been pointing to the statute. Uh, let me find it again. Um, it, it says that an individual, or yeah, in 554, 168.554 C8, an individual shall not do any of the following, sign a petition with a name other than his or her own, or make a false statement in a certificate on a petition. We know uh, that at least 30 of these circulators violated that, that provision in the statute, that they did put names other than their own and that they attested to the validity of those signatures. Um, the statute goes on to say that it, if after a canvas, the Board of State canvassers determined that an individual has knowingly and intentionally failed to comply with Section 8, and we, don't, we do know that, then the Board of State canvassers can impose one or more of the following sanctions, can disqualify, obviously, fraudulent signatures um, on a petition without checking the signatures against the local registration records. So these, these petition signatures um, are, the petition circulators are making demonstrably false statements when when the um, Bureau has established that, that signatures on their petitions are not valid. And therefore we don't have to look at every signature and we, uh, that every signature that those circulators have, um, have submitted. And I think that the, the methodology adopted by the Bureau is absolutely appropriate, not just appropriate, but essential because um, as we have heard, there are, they have identified approximately 68,000 signatures submitted by these people. And what the candidates tell us is maybe some are fraudulent, we don't know. In fact, some of the candidates have admitted um, that the signatures are fraudulent and complain themselves that they were defrauded, that they were victims, um, which, um, is hard to stomach, quite frankly. It's their obligation uh, to check these signatures. But where, where we know, know that this many signatures have been submitted, for them to come in and say, well, there are just too many to be checked and therefore you have to accept them, that is unacceptable in my uh, estimation. I think that we have to rely upon uh, and respect because it's sound, uh, the recommendation uh, of the Bureau with regard to these particular challenged candidates. Okay. Well, my comments are that um, these people should all go to prison, the circulators that uh, defrauded the candidates and defrauding us. I'm not prepared to shift any burden um, to the candidates uh, today myself. Uh, 
Uh, we, could, we, we didn't have the staff to check all the uh, signatures that came in. Uh, we estimated 10%, whatever it was, is less than 20% of these fraudulent uh, petitions collected. So uh, I'm not prepared to throw everybody off the ballot myself. We'll let that leave it up to the courts. So what's the board's pleasure on the petition in front of us? Tony? Oh, are we doing these one at a time? Yes, we should do them one at a time. Jeanette, you want to talk? We should do them one at a time. One at a time, okay. Pick one, any one of eight. Procedurally, I'd recommend if the board would go in order. So the first would be um, number eight, which would be Donna Brandenburg and the motion uh, would be regarding her. I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Donna Brandenburg insufficient. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a support? I'll support the motion. We've moved and supported to accept the staff's recommendation on Mrs. Brandenburg number eight. Discussion on the motion. If I may take a moment. I did, yeah, I just, I'm trying to lean up. Um, Kind of, I prepared a statement as we've been sitting here thinking about all this, try to make it quick. Um, in 2020, and frankly, multiple instances in recent history, um, countless claims, uh, many would call them lies, have been made based on assumptions and conjecture regarding the outcome of the most recent presidential election. Individuals beginning at the highest levels with President Donald Trump use those assumptions and conjecture to pressure this body to at a minimum delay the certification of those results. Thankfully, this board with two members who are no longer with us rejected those efforts because there was not substantial evidence. In fact, there was no evidence to support those claims. In this instance, I will readily admit that far more serious efforts have been made to marshal evidence to support the claims being made by the challengers and the Bureau of Elections staff. However, just as depriving the voters of Michigan their choice for office based on assumptions is unjust, so is depriving them of a choice in the election itself without fully investigating the claims being made and providing complete confidence in the results. Without question, a widespread and disgraceful effort to defraud the voters of the state has occurred. Those who engage in this effort deserve the full weight of the law to come down on them. And I'm glad to hear that it's been referred to the Attorney General's office for further investigation. The burden of proof, however, to deprive citizens of their rights is wholly the responsibility of the government. I have repeatedly rejected the accusations that some have been making in this process that there is a conspiracy by the staff to deprive only GOP candidates of their access to the ballot. That's false, it's irresponsible, and it's unworthy of the people making the claims. The staff has done incredible work with the time and tools at their disposal but this is an unprecedented level of fraud and we don't have a lengthy body of work to rely on best ways to handle this. And I cannot sign on to an admittedly novel process without reference in statute to disregard tens of thousands of signatures without confirming the validity with the signatures on file based on a fraction of confirmed frauds. I agree with my colleagues that this may perversely encourage additional fraud to overwhelm the system because there's not a mechanism in place to properly examine them. But, and I, I'm, I'm wrapping up here, there have been countless instances of innocent people being sent to prison based on assumptions that seemed airtight at the time, just as we've seen guilty people set free because the government failed to prove, to prove their case. I firmly believe the courts need to provide clarity on the conflicting passages that have been an issue here and that my colleagues have rightfully pointed to as potential to justify their position. Um, in light of what was presented today, these campaigns had better get to work rehabilitating signatures and provide much more comprehensive information for the court than they've done here. And as someone who believes strongly and consistently in the rule of law, um, my conscience and intellect demand that I vote no on this matter. Okay, any further discussion? Uh, are you prepared to do a roll call vote over there? Can you? 
Maybe we can have Adam take the roll. It's probably better. Adam? Yeah. Adam's going to do the roll call vote. Adam, let's call the roll. Uh, the question is uh, the Brandenburg uh, adopting the uh, recommendation uh, to not certify. Chair Schenkel. No. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't understand you. I sometimes with the mask it's really hard. Um, yes. Member Don. No. Member Bradshaw. I am a yes vote. Mr. Chair, you have two yeses and two nays. Okay, two to two. It does not pass. Uh, next item on the agenda would be is it nine after eight. Ten. 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 We skip. Nine to three. No, well, I think show it up. would. It would. I think it would make sense, even though I mean it's likely to be a deadlock. I understand, but it would make sense to have a motion on this anyway. I mean, we we Number can't. Nine. Yeah, we can't take him off the out of the process. So. I'll, I'll make the motion. I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Michael Brown uh, insufficient. Support. Ms. Move is supported that we find the uh, report filed on Michael Brown sufficient. Discussion on the motion? Insufficient. Well, oh, we, okay, the, the petition's insufficient uh, and adopt the uh, recommended uh, report. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, I'd like to ask Adam to call the roll. Mr. Chair. I'm voting no. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Yes. Member Daunt. No. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have two yeas and two nays. Okay, number 10 is next on the agenda. James Craig. <clears throat> I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by James Craig insufficient there's support support moved and supported to find the staff recommendation adopt the staff staff recommendation as insufficient for james craig discussion on the motion seeing that i'll uh, let's ask uh, adam to call the roll chair shingle no vice chair gerwitz yes member daunt no member bradshaw yes mr chair you have two yeas and two nays Two to two. It feels uh, next on the agenda is number 12, uh, Perry Johnson. I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Perry Johnson insufficient. Support. Move and supported to find staff recommendation on Mr. Johnson insufficient. It's been supported. I need further discussion on that motion. Seeing now, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Mr. Chair? No. Vice Chair Gerwitz? Yes. Member Daunt? No. Member Bradshaw? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have two yeas and two nays. Votes two to two, it fails. The next uh, item on the agenda is number 13. Uh, report on Michael Markey. I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Michael Markey insufficient. Support. It's been moved and supported to find, uh, to support the staff recommendation as insufficient for Michael Markey. Uh, discussion on that motion? Seeing none, uh, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Chair Schenkel? No. Vice Chair Gerwitz? Yes. Member Daunt? No. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have two yeas and two nays. Okay, that's the, that's the five for the governors right there. And I want the record to reflect that my no vote, I, I wanna use uh, my, my comments along with uh, Tony Donce's reason for my no vote. We're going to the three judges now. Uh, we'll start with 22, Philip Cavanaugh uh, for a third circuit judge. Uh, what is the board's pleasure? I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by 
Philip Cavanaugh insufficient. Motion on the floor to find the uh, nominating positions insufficient for Philip Cavanaugh. Is there support? Support. There is a support. Further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Chair Schinkel. No. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Yes. Member Daunt? No. Member Bradshaw? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have two yeas and two nays. The motion fails. The next item on the agenda is number 24, uh, report on John Malone, Third Circuit Court Judge. What is the board's pleasure? I'll move that the board <clears throat> accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by John Malone uh, insufficient. Support. Move and support to find the staff recommendation for John Malone his petition is being insufficient. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Chair Schinkel. No. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Yes. Member Daunt. No. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have two yeas and two nays. Motion fails. Our last item is number 28. Uh, nominating petition for Patricia Dare, Sixth Circuit Judge. What is the committee's pleasure? I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Tricia Dare insufficient. Support. There's moving supported to find the staff, uh, the, adopt the staff recommendation for Tricia Dare's insufficient uh, nominating petitions. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Chair Schinkel. No. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Yes. Member Daunt. No. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have two yeas and two nays. Okay, we, we're done with the first eight. We're gonna move on now to uh, the non eight, starting with uh, number number 11. Any any uh, questions before we get started on this? If I, if I just could, just to note where we are with these candidates that we just voted on, just for everyone's information. So because there were not three votes, to place the candidates on the ballot to find their petition sufficient. The, the, the disposition of the board is that those eight candidates at this time are not going on the ballot. So those candidates, uh, if they disagree with that, will need to file a lawsuit, hopefully promptly. Okay, uh, we're on number uh, 11. Jonathan, you wanna tell us about uh, Tudor Dixon? Sure, um, this, uh, Petition had a sufficient uh, number of signatures or uh, the staff did review some uh, fraudulent signatures, but nowhere near enough to uh, bring the candidate below the 15,000. Um, the, we also received a challenge uh, and the challenge concerned the fact that Ms. Dixon put on the heading of her petition, uh, a end of term date and the end of term date being uh, in 2026 when in fact, technically speaking, the term ends at 11.59 a.m. on uh, January 1st, 2027. And based on that, uh, the challenge argued that um, all of the petitions were invalid and, should, and, the, and they should be disqualified. Staff disagrees with that challenge. Um, the end term date for this office is not a required element of the heading. Um, and while a non-required element could potentially be disqualifying if it created um, confusion or voters didn't understand what office they were uh, nominating someone for, in this case, we view the difference between 2026 uh, and 2027 to be harmless. We don't think um, that there is a possibility that a voter would be confused by this. Um, you know, it may have been a different matter if it said 2023 or 2024 leading a voter to think this was some kind of partial term or, re or recall or something of that nature. But under these circumstances, we don't think that there's a, um, you know, this is essentially, as we put it, a harmless error to a non-required element. And therefore we would recommend uh, the board determine that Ms. Dixon has sufficient signatures. Okay, any questions to Jonathan? I'd like to call now on uh, witness uh, Charlie Spees. Today's my day. I call on one person and two show up. It's <laughs> happening more than once. Charlie, uh, your license to practice is spell your last name for the record and introduce your guest. 
Charlie Spees, S-P is in Peter, I-E-S, and my colleague, Robert Avers, both with the law firm Dickinson Wright, representing Tudor Dixon. We are going to be refreshingly brief as attorneys go. Okay. Robert, for the record, spell your last name, please. Sure. A-V-E-R-S. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Charlie. We will be extre uh, extremely brief. That being said, would like to reserve three minutes in case uh, the complainant brings up any issues that haven't been addressed. In short, uh, we agree with Director Brader and the staff's uh, memo on this. The only issue that I have to quibble with is the starting point that concludes that the use of the term 2026 is incorrect. And then the staff goes on to say that although it's incorrect, it's harmless error and based upon Michigan's case law, that is not a reason to reject the petition. My only concern is I don't believe 2026 is incorrect. I think you know, just this week, we reviewed the Whitmer administration's press releases from this month, and there were three of them. Uh, one of them on May 11th about fixing the roads, where she talks about by the end of 2022 being when her term ends. And then a few days later on May 13th, talking about fixing bridges, where again, it says, quote, since I took office through the end of 2022. And then again, a few days later on the 18th, again, Governor Whitmer talks about, and this was a press release on, again, starting to fix roads and bridges, uh, talks about through the end of 2022. So I believe under the common vernacular, the end term of this term for governor is 2026. I understand the argument that technically it's not 11.59 p.m. January 31st, 20, uh, December 31st, 2026, that it's really 11.59 a.m. January 1st. But I suspect that if we had put 2027, we would have had the exact same challenge filed, filed and people would have said it was confusing to use 2027. We believe 2026 is the least confusing date to use. Having said that, it's not whether you agree with me or with Director Brader isn't important or dispositive here because both the policy concerns and more importantly, the Court of Appeals decisions are clear that adding unnecessary information, which is what this is, if even if that unnecessary information is not correct, does not cause a failure of the petitions. Okay, any questions? Robert, do you want to say anything? No, thank you. Okay. No questions? Thanks for coming in, guys. On this uh, agenda item, uh, Stephen Lidl wants to speak. Stephen, come on back. And you're all ready to go, Stephen. Oh, you got a handout for us. All right. More stuff for us. Thank you. This is still warm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to take a few more moments of your time on uh, two issues. Um, the first is briefer, uh, but I will move expeditiously through the second. Um, you noted in the staff report uh, that um, the staff had identified uh, what the staff labels a fraudulent petition circulator uh, by the name of Freddie Tolliver uh, and indicated that um, there were four signatures that they had identified among the petitions submitted by Tudor Dixon as having been circulated by Freddie Tolliver. Um, my review of the Tudor Dixon petitions filed with the um, Bureau of Elections indicated uh, that the identified fraudulent petition circulator Freddie Tolliver actually 
submitted multiple sheets. Sheets number 751, 752, 2992, 293, and 4584, which would bring the total of signatures on the uh, fraudulent petition circulator, Freddie Toller, from four to 37, and the total number of fraudulent petition circulator signatures included in the uh, petitions uh, submitted by Tudor Dixon uh, from 177 um, to 110. You know, it has been my experience in reviewing these petitions uh, that the more you look, uh, the more issues you find. So copies of those petition sheets are attached at the back of the handout uh, as exhibit B, in addition to the numbers. Can you just re repeat again, the, the fraudulent went from what to what? Uh, from 77 identified signatures uh, in the Bureau staff report, there's an additional 37 uh, um, uh, on these, and that brings it to 110. So I'm, I've discussed being terrible at math multiple times in this rule. Even if we were to accept that, you obviously agree that that in itself does not disqualify these petitions. No, it makes it clear that uh, that there are part fraudulent, uh, apparently fraudulent petitions that have been submitted by this candidate. Uh, and that is a matter that the board has the ability to consider regardless of the number of signatures that have been submitted. Right. You have the discretion to determine what remedies you might adopt as a board uh, when that occurs. So that's the first issue. I just wanted to make sure, uh, given that the staff had identified Mr. Tolliver uh, as a fraudulent uh, petition circulator uh, of Tudor Dixon petitions, that there were in fact more uh, that I was able to identify. Uh, I then would like to turn um, to an issue. Uh, and uh, given that um, the board has uh, taken some action that ignores the recommendations of your staff, I'm going to ask that you do so again. Uh, this relates to the issue of the expiration of the term of a governor. Uh, and uh, I have some um, images in the document um, that may help just step us through this process. Uh, and the plain language of the statute as well. Because um, when you look uh, at these petitions, uh, two things become apparent. Each of the Tudor Dixon petitions includes a false statement and a certificate on the petition, and that's a violation of MCL 168544C8B. And a violation of the Michigan election law is not harmless. It's technically a crime, a misdemeanor under the election law. And you as a board are in charge, uh, charged with enforcing that statute. So on the first page, page two, you can see a scan of uh, Tudor Dixon petition number uh, 218. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, circled in red uh, that the term of office is included. And then for term expiration date, instead of a date, um, it actually is a year of 2026, which pre presumably would include uh, any date between January 1st, 2026 uh, and December 31st, 2026. Uh, and then I'm not aware uh, of any standard in Michigan law that would say, well, this date might be close. Another date, well, that's a little further away. I kind of know when it's, you know, close is enough and not enough. There's no such standard in Michigan law. Um, close enough may work uh, for talk show radio hosts, uh, but governors are charged with faithfully executing the law. And the plain language of Michigan law, which this board is charged with faithfully executing, is explicit and clear. Uh, this board is not charged with uh, enforcing press releases. Uh, you're charged with enforcing the Michigan election law. And it's pretty clear. The term of office of a governor commences at 12 noon on January 1 following the next election and shall continue until a successor is elected and qualified. That's why we have an inaugural, regardless of who's being inaugurated, on the steps of the state capitol at noon every four years. It's not just because it's close to the end of the year. It's because the law mandates that that occur at noon on January 1st, 2027. So because there is an inaccurate or false end of term date in this petition, um, you have a false statement on a petition. 
And if you look on page three, you will see the language which you were charged with enforcing, the plain language of section 544C 8B. An individual shall not make a false statement in a certificate on a petition. Well, we know we have a petition and we know we have a false statement. The term does not expire uh, in 2026. So what's the certificate? It's not defined by the legislature. It has its plain and ordinary meaning. Let's consult a dictionary. That's what rule of law judges do. What does certificate mean? An official document attesting to a certain fact. Well, we have a document that's filed with government required by state law. We have an official document and it's attesting a number of facts. And one of those is that the term of a governor expires on 2020, uh, in 2026. Again, not accurate. What then is a certificate? Well, the entire heading is a petition, is a, is a certificate. If you look at uh, page four, the statement, we, the undersigned uh, registered and qualified voters of the county of is a series of statements of fact made certified by everyone signing the petition. It meets the plain language definition of a certificate. Now, some folks may argue, well, wait a second. The legislature must have met the certificate of circulator. Well, that's an interesting argument. It's inconsistent with the plain text of the te statute that you are charged with enforcing. The legislature could have said in section, uh, subsection eight, that it's a violation if someone makes a false statement in a certificate certificate of circulator on a petition. They could have said that they chose not to, they did not. They could have said, make a false statement in the certificate on a petition. They chose not to. They chose the words, make a false statement in a certificate on a petition, which could mean one or more. And indeed there are two. There's a certificate of circulator and there's a certification that every voter who signs the, uh, a petition makes that begins with the statement, we the undersigned the voters, then certifying a series of facts. So what's the legal effect of that? Well, if an individual knows at the time a petition sheet is filed that there's a violation of subsection eight, a false statement in a certificate on a petition before filing and fails to report that information on page five in MCL 544C12, um, that's also a violation of the law. And in this instance, we know that uh, the candidate, Tudor Dixon, was aware of the petition and the false statement in the certificate, 2026, for two reasons. These petitions were pre-printed by the campaign before circulation. Every petition circulated were pre-filled and had the inaccurate date of 2026. We also know that the candidate had to have examined the petition to make the statement uh, in the affidavit of identity and receipt of filing that was signed under penalty of perjury by Tudor Dixon uh, on May 19th. You'll find that on page six of the presentation. You can't certify how many numbers are on a petition if you haven't looked at the petition. And so the candidate knew that the petition included the inaccurate date of 2026. She knew it was on there. So what is the remedy? Uh, that is the board, uh, uh, board role for this. The board has the option to impose a number of sanctions for the violation of subsection eight. And one of them uh, is to disqualify from the ballot a candidate who committed, abated, or knowingly allowed the false statement to be included in the petition. Steve, on this issue, I didn't think you were gonna take more than five minutes, but if you can wrap it up. Sure. I think we know what you're trying to get to here. Yep. yep. Thank you. Yeah. We have uh, over did, 20 more cases. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Uh, the last item, um, I'll just note that um, this is not harmless. You know, it is technically a violation of the election law and it's an issue of first impression. Cases relating to um, uh, petitions for initiatives, such as the fracking petition, which were decided for other reasons, and petitions relating to mandatory information on a petition, uh, which is, is not, are not applicable. This is a case of first impression. What do you do when someone includes in a certificate on a petition information that is inaccurate? in violation of subsection eight of 544C. And for that reason, we would ask the board uh, to not approve uh, these petitions given that error. It lastly is, it, it can be misleading. 
we did have 11 candidates seeking the office of governor. Only one chose to differentiate petitions by putting the year 2026 on it. There also are other elected officials in Michigan, while they don't petition onto the ballot, that use the word governor in the title of their office. The Wayne State University Board of Governors are elected officials. They have a different term. They are elected to eight-year terms. So there is potential for confusions. It's not a harmless error. It's a violation of the election law. And we ask that the board proceed consistent with the plain language of the election law and not uh, approve the petitions given that violation. Thank you. Great. Any questions? Thank you, Stephen. Okay, we have number, uh, whatever number we on here, number 11. Uh, what is the board's pleasure? Uh, I move. I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Tudor Dixon sufficient. Motion is made. Is there support? Support. And it's been supported. Discussion on the motion. I just want to just make a statement on this one, and that is I agree uh, with the Bureau's um, decision. I mean, I understand the year on here and, and going through each of the candidates that we had, um, none of them had put a year on there. So, um, but there are fraudulent circulators that have submitted to this board a split decision on whether we're putting other candidates on the ballot. I just want it noted that they are, there are those in there. And I want to publicly say that because I feel that if you are, if you have submitted fraudulent signatures, that you shouldn't be on the ballot, even though you have a hundred of them. Um, this is not a, this is not a, an easy decision. We've not put some candidates on the ballot but here we have a candidate that and all other entities meets the sufficiency, but has submitted fraudulent in the eyes of the Bureau of fraudulent signatures. So okay. thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me a statement. Any uh, further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. I am a no vote. The motion passes three to one. We're moving on to number 14, uh, US Rep, third district. Uh, and we do have uh, Gabby Monchalanchi. Sorry about the last name. Gabby, are you in the audience? She was in the audience because she had a white card. She said, no, no, I'm putting a yellow one in. While we're giving her time, I can just. What's that? Do you want to move on to the next one or do you want Go me to go to the next one? Uh, Joseph Alfonso, are you with us? Looks like Joseph is with us. Congress in the fourth district. Well, Joseph, yeah, you did submit. One, Joseph, please raise your right hand for me. You saw me swear what you're about to say. Taste the truth, the whole truth. Nothing but the truth will help you, God. I swear. Thank you very much. And spell your name for the record, please. A L F O N S O is the last name. Joseph being the first. J O S E P H. Thank you. Go ahead. Hit the red button. Oh, yeah. Hit the red button. Is that better? Okay. Well, I'm here today on behalf of voters of the Michigan's fourth district, especially the community members who signed our petition. We would like to thank the board and bureau for their role as guardians of these electoral process and servants of democracy. I'm a father, a husband, veteran, and a child of immigrants. I was taught that in America, everyday people can serve the public and participate in the great experiment of democracy in good faith. I have served my country, a sacrifice that put my life on the line. Now I want to serve my country as a member of Congress to see the promises of freedom made real. I want this not only for myself, but for family, my community, and those brave enough to stand with me. 
it is anyone's right to run for public office, especially when we have not been fairly represented for so long. Organizing a grassroots movement is incredibly challenging, and I'm sure you all know that. And organizing people in 2022 has been a new kind of challenge. While some candidates bought their signatures, we went door to door ourselves, where every signature was collected by a dedicated volunteer or myself personally. Unfortunately, running for office has become an industry in this country, one that involves either millions of people with a common goal of getting one person elected or one person with millions of dollars busting in with paid influence of social media and canvassing firms. In 2014, John Conyers' name was added to the ballot with less than 600 of the thousand required. This was because a federal judge determined the process that invalidated those signatures was unconstitutional. Because of that, we changed the rules to ensure anyone can exercise their freedom of speech and choice this process will always have room for improvement. I hope to encourage the next generation of leaders by showing them that service, integrity, and hard work is the foundation for good leadership, and you don't need to be in the upper class to prove it. Every one of our signatures were collected with integrity. We are unchallenged, except we have a handful of technical errors made after a good faith effort, as they are not numbers to us but the people that we met and continue to work for today. Petitioning myself allowed me the privilege of meeting these people, finding commonalities amongst the whole community, not one party or the other. We need our communities to have faith in their government because they see themselves in it. I'm proud of the efforts and sacrifices of our volunteers. Despite the challenges of a grassroots movement, we still managed to submit over a thousand signatures with incredibly small margin of error, all but one registered unregistered voter. But every person who signed deserves to be represented in this historical election. But we will prepare for this outcome. All we ask is for you to see all the names as valid. It will continue to be our goal to empower people to vote. And if they want more than one choice for representation, I hope you make that easier for them. Please note that my last name is spelled Alfonso. Just remember A-L-F-O-N-S-O. If that helps, you can write it in because I am Joseph Alphonse and I'm still the Democratic candidate for U.S. Congress in Michigan's brand new fourth district. Thank you for coming in, Joseph. Uh, Jonathan, I didn't ask you to comment on this one first, but obviously he's 41 votes short. Needs to rehabilitate. Any comments from you? Um, so in this case, um, you know, the, the, the cushion that the candidate had was very small. So the candidate had a very small margin of error. Um, in this case, um, the, the, the predominant issues that we saw were either a date error, not including a date, or the date being incorrect, or um, not being in the district, or, or not being in the jurisdiction. So those are the those are the issues we saw, and and they did amount to enough to bring the candidate below one thousand. Mr. Alfonso has not brought anything forward to to re rehabilitate any of those that you're deficient. Correct. I don't have anything other than the documents that were provided via social media and the press. Okay. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question, Director Brady? Sure. Um, in, the, in the cases that you have um, date errors, that there's no date, or um, I'm looking at some other, it mostly looks like dates and some signature, incomplete signatures. There really, is there a way to rehabilitate those signatures when you're just talking about dates? No, um, a signature could be rehabilitated, for example, if, if we determine that um, the signature didn't match um, or, or the voter was not registered or something like that, it's possible that uh, individual evidence could, could rebut that. But this is a formal error that can't be cured. Okay, Joseph, thanks for coming in. And no one else put in a card to speak on this. So what would the board's pleasure be? Uh, does not bring me pleasure to do this, but in light of the report and the, the facts before us, and um, therefore I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Joseph Alfonso insufficient. Well, motion on the floor, sir, support. I reluctantly support too, but unfortunately when candidates, I think the other candidates can tell you too, is that when you are gathering signatures, make sure you have a good cushion 
make sure you're dating everything, make sure you're looking at your petitions. Um, but unfortunately, yes, I do support. Hey, uh, seeing no further discussion, I'll ask uh, Adam to call the rule. Chair Schinkel. Yes. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Yes. Uh, Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. Four yeas, it, it passes. Uh, did Gabby come back in? Okay. I'm moving on here. Uh, we're down to on the agenda number 16. And Jonathan, you want to jump in on this one first, like we're supposed to do? Sure. This is um, uh, the issue in this case uh, with this candidate was primarily heading errors. Uh, so the staff's determination that the candidate doesn't have enough valid signatures is based on um, stickers that were covering required elements, required language on the nominating petition. Um, this is a situation where the, the precedents uh, that govern the, the relevant law do require strict compliance. And so even though in, in many cases, only parts of the words were covered because the, because the words didn't appear as required, a recommendation is to determine that the candidate doesn't have enough valid signatures. Okay, you, you have a, an example included. And I'm looking at that example right now. And so am I missing on the top of a Jackson County? Is that what we're missing here? So, there's two examples, um, oh. including some of the words that that is. Um, so these are these are obviously images. We have we have the actual petitions here if you want to look at them. But essentially, the um, stickers are covering parts of the words that are required um, in in each heading. So street address, rural route is covered. Um, in in the other example, title of office expiration date is covered. So again, these are only parts of the words that are covered, but but the the precedents that govern this do require strict compliance and inclusion of all these elements. Can, can you say that again, Mr. Breyer? That it covers it's covering the, the district. Yeah. Okay, so basically, she's got stickers covering words that are on the petition. Is that what I'm looking at here? Correct. It, it may be helpful to have Can we see the, the actual petitions. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. All right, well, have a seat. Have a seat. Thank you. We'll get to you in a second here. We, we just have to comprehend what we're talking about. That's all. Thank you. You can do it to this one. You can do it to one. It's something totally different. That's the problem. So, Jonathan. This is a uh, situation where is it similar to whiteout the sticker? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, for the record, uh, well, start with raising your right hand for me. Would you just tell me sir, what you say today is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Help you, God. Yes. Sir. For the record, uh, spell it your full name. Would you please? Elizabeth, E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H, first, F-E-R-S-Z-T. Z-T, okay. Go ahead. Uh, tell us why you think what Jonathan is telling us isn't right. Thank you. May it please, may it please the Board of Canvassers. Thank you for meeting with the candidates for state and federal offices today in regard to our ballot petitions. Please refer to my four page submission to the board that I um, gave to the Secretary of State office yesterday. Do you have copies of that? It is on your computers in, in the file. We added it. What are we, what was the question? Oh, her response, sure. Yeah. May I proceed? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you for having us today. However, I strongly disagree with your decision to disqualify some of my petitions and can provide ample, clear, and convincing evidence that the so-called sticker 
was indeed my DIY way of filling in the petition forms using a hard copy printout, which was then cut and taped to each field in the petition. And if I may approach the bench, I can show you that template, show you how I did it. Would you like to see it? This is an example of what you used. Yeah, it looks just like the copy. Why did you do this? Because as you can see, I'm, uh, I know you don't know me, but I'm a very organized, but I'm a disheveled person and I have sloppy handwriting. This is very poor fine motor skills. And so I felt I should type in the information in the headers. And if I may continue. Sure. Please also consider the statement of my colleague, Larry Artis, whose letter that you have in the packet, who collected signatures on my behalf and who readily used the petition forms and who observed me assembling them at the library. And this is Larry's letter. He says, to whom it may concern at the Board of Canvassers, my name is Larry Artis and I was and am a colleague of Elizabeth First. During the last four months or so, I helped Ms. First collect signatures on standard ballot petitions that she provided to me and that she prepared herself at Carnegie Library, a branch of the Jackson District Library in Jackson, Michigan. As such, I witnessed her method of preparing the headers for ballot petitions, which she then photocopied for me using the library copy printer. She created a simple Word document that had each element of the header, name, address, office, district, et cetera. She printed that page and then using a scissors and tape, she carefully affixed the type words into the correct blanks in the header, thinking that this would look more professional than just handwriting them. Therefore, there was nothing irregular or untoward about the headers or, or, or even the Jackson County line um, blank. It was not a sticker. It was simply a tiny piece of printed paper with the word Jackson that she taped to the line, again in hopes that it would look better than her sloppy handwriting. I agree with Ms. First that her signature petition should count and that her name should be allowed on the ballot as we did the work. We collected over a thousand signatures using standard SOS ballot petitions. Please do not hesitate to contact. Okay, oh, go ahead, I thought you were done. Please reconsider the heading errors for the 382 signatures and count these signatures as valid toward my total based on the following further points. Number one, in disqualifying these 382 signatures, you are disenfranchising 382 potential voters whose will was made otherwise known by their intentional act of signing my petitions. Number two, what matters most on a petition is the veracity and validity of the signatures as representing a true and valid registered voter. If the signatures are valid and genuine, they should be admissible and, are allowed, and should be allowed towards the total count. Madam Vice Chairwoman, earlier this morning, you made that exact point that it's the validity of the signatures that counts. Point three, to disallow the signatures is to elevate form over function. The purpose of, and function of a petition is to gather the names of qualified voters who, while they may not ultimately vote for me, they did want to see my name on the ballot. To preemptively thwart that signatory will by disallowing their names amounts to silence, silencing their voices. Point four, using a reasonable person standard. The headers of my petitions clearly reflect the relevant information. While there may be minor cosmetic defects, there was no confusion or subterfuge or fraud to the people who signed. They were amply aware what they were signing and by signing acted affirmative, affirmatively to place my name on the ballot for the Michigan 5th. And finally, I will also mention to this honorable board that in my campaign, I'm the candidate, I'm the manager, I'm the treasurer, I'm, I'm the chief of communications, I'm everything. I'm also not taking any campaign contributions. So like Mr. Alfonso before me, this my campaign as well was extremely DIY. Unless otherwise noted, the signatures on the petitions in question should be counted and added to my total and should not be withheld due to amateurish headers. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jonathan or Adam, 
Do we have instructions on our website about things like this? Well, our manual uh, that governs circulation of countywide petitions does advise candidates to make sure that all the required elements are present. And I believe it does say that that is strict, strictly adhered to. Um, so, I mean, on, on the note of reasonableness, the, the courts uh, and stand up for democracy that the standard for these required elements is strict compliance. Um, so that's that's what the board is bound by, and that's that's what we've communicated. May I respond to that? I, I appreciate that, um, but but your um, your statement that you believe um, goes along the line of assumptions again, unless there's a, a specific MCL that states that, sir. Um, I, 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 I have to challenge and, and rebut what you just said. Again, by a reasonable person standard, all of the elements of the required elements of the headers are clearly visible and legible in my headers. Now they might have been a little bit cockeyed because again, my fine motor skills and even in taping uh, are, are not that great, but in no way were the people who signed my petitions in any way wondering what they were signing or for whom they were signing. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see the, the policy. I mean, you could get petitions for someone and then cover up their name, you know, put somebody else's name on a petition by taping over it. And, you know, I'm not saying that's what you did, but I'm saying that's, that's why the policy is you can't use white out uh, on a petition. It's the same thing as taping over a petition. So that's the policy. So, so you anyway. can't type into the fields of the petition. You can't, you can't affix uh, the, the right information into the fields of the petition. Because if, if you make a mistake out of a petition, you get a new one, start over. Mr. Anyway. Mr. Chair, may I ask a, a question to Director Brader? Um, and I know that it's stated in the policy but one of the things that we do have to look at as board members and we have is the form. And while I understand what your intent was, unfortunately the an element, Director Brader is basically stating that those elements were covered up. And if those elements are covered, then unfortunately that petition is no longer to form. Which elements were covered up? If I'm, if I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the, I've, I've looked at yours that you gave us under street address uh, and rural route that's covered up by the congressional district, as well as the top of district, if any, um, those are elements that have to be on the form. It, I, I've been on, the, I've, I've been on this board since 13. We've not put candidates on the ballot for not putting the correct district on their form, not having the word judicial on the form. But I think this is the first time I've actually seen outside of like physical copies that maybe got a little bit wonky in a copier that the element itself is being covered. And I understand because my handwriting is not the best in the world. Um, but I, I can see where, where we're sitting at this point. If the element were covered, then how, how was it legible? How were you able to read it? The elements were not covered. They were, they were if maybe not fully, completely legible, for instance, a rural route, it doesn't apply to me. I don't live on a rural route. So I, I, I do believe that the, the, the labels underneath the blanks of the header were amply available and legible to the folks who signed my petitions. And you can see that in the example. Any other questions? Thanks for coming in. Thank you. And this number, the uh, no other uh, people put in a card to speak. So what's the committee's pleasure on number 16? Again, as with Mr. Alfonso, this brings me no pleasure, um, but the law states this, it's past practice. It's clear that things are covered up. 
I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Elizabeth first insufficient. I'll support the motion. Moved and supported, accept the staff's recommendation. Uh, further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Chair Schinkel. Yes. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Yes. Member Dont. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Uh, Chair, you have four yeas. Passes four to nothing. We're on number uh, 17. Especially nominating petition submitted by Thomas Barrett for Congress. And on 17, we have Chris Tabilcock wishing to speak. Thanks, Chair Schengen. If I could just uh, briefly, oh, sorry. This, this concerns oh, essentially, oh, I can summarize quickly. This concerns the, the residency and, and the fact that the village address was put on the uh, heading by Mr. Barrett. Um, the uh, uh, the, the past practice of the Bureau and the board is that if the village is wholly contained within the township, as was the case here, that is not deemed as disqualifying. Okay, got it. Uh, and for the record, uh, Chris, spell your last name, please. Yes, uh, Chris Trebilcock with the law firm of Clark Hill. Trebilcock is T-R-E-B-I-L-C-O-C-K. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We all uh, still awake after a long day. Um, I'm on my third day. I'm on my third Diet Coke, so apologize if uh, I'm, I'm talking a little fast. But uh, first, I do want to address just briefly a procedural issue uh, in a footnote uh, that staff said regarding the notary requirement under MCL 168.552. The plain language of this statute does not include a notary requirement. It requires a sworn statement. And I understand that the practice of the board uh, and the Bureau has been to request uh, notarized statements, those requests, one is it's not a rule adopted by the APA, and two, that notary requirement goes to when you're questioning the genuineness of a signature or the registration of a voter. In this case, neither is present. Any sworn statement was submitted uh, as part of this challenge, and you can just look at the difference in the Michigan election law, section 558 paren 4 requires both, quote, a signed and notarized statement. So when the Michigan election law wants a document notarized, it is clear that it wants a, a notarized document. If the Bureau would like a notarized statement, I would recommend that a, a rule be passed in compliance with the APA to make that requirement uh, uh, the power of law. But nevertheless, let's proceed to the merits of this complaint that is properly before the board. And like the two prior candidates you just heard, there's problems in the petition heading. Of all the petition sheets submitted by Mr. Barrett, only two petition headings were correct. All the rest were invalid and do not comply with the law. The two that were correct were actually handwritten in by the person who submitted the, uh, the, the petition sheets. So they weren't the pre-printed ones. It is the pre-printed ones that I can assume were prepared by Mr. Barrett or his campaign on his behalf that were incorrect. And it does not comply with the sheets. And I wanna know why, and I wonder why, Mr. Barrett's petition heading, which clearly contains an error, is being treated differently than the prior two candidates. As, as Mr. Uh, Brader mentioned and has been mentioned throughout today, our Supreme Court has held that strict compliance with the requirements of the Michigan election law is required close enough, substantial compliance, or what has been tossed around today a little bit, a harmless error. That is not in the statute, not the standard that this board is duty bound to apply. In this case, the relevant statute says, the candidate must list street address or, the keyword being or, rural route, and city or township. City or township, not both, one, or the other, city or township. Mr. Barrett did not follow this mandatory language. The Michigan election law does not permit dual jurisdictions to be listed in the heading. He did that. It was wrong, it violates the law, and it is disqualifying. And I just think about, you know, Ms. McConaughey, right? Mr. Daunt's English teacher. 
when he was back in high school, what would she say in this situation about the importance of the words or, or and? Or means you have a choice, one or the other, not both, one or the other. And in this case, the petition heading contains both a city, which is a distinct jurisdiction, and a township. And if we are to apply strict compliance, as we just did with the two prior candidates, we have to apply it in this situation. One thing I note that the staff report who has done a tremendous job across the board and had a lot on their plate, did not address in their staff report, and I wanna make sure the board's aware of this, is that Mr. Daunt, or Mr. Daunt, Mr. Barrett and his wife signed his nominating petitions. And when they came to the place where it said to list your city, they list Charlotte. They list Charlotte, not Carmel Township. It says city or township. And when they filled out their signature as a voter, they listed Charlotte as their address and as their city. But in the petition heading, they include both Charlotte and township. That is prohibited and it does not strictly comply with the law. We got 20 more to do. Are you all set there? I just think, I think that he point. chose, look, we have to hold these candidates to a standard and they have to, when they hand in these petitions, it is meaningful. They file an affidavit. These were sloppily done. If they would have come to the bureau staff, which all the candidates I advise do and ask them to look at the heading, I have no doubt that Mr. Fricassi or Mr. Brader would have told him, look, you filled it out wrong. You got to pick either Charlotte or Carmel, but you can't list both or you shouldn't list both. For those reasons, I would urge this board to apply the correct strict, strict scrutiny standard and rule that Mr. Barrett does not have sufficient signatures to be certified for the ballot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? No, no questions. Let's go. We're going to vote on this one. Uh, John, you got anything you want to add to this after the testimony? Jeanette, do you have something? I, I just I want to make sure that there was no one here for the Barrett campaign. No, there's no there's no card. Exactly, there was. You got a card up here? Yep. Just trying to make sure we oh, got everyone. You. you got a card in. You put one card in with two numbers on it, didn't you? Yep. Oh, man. That's my fault then. Don't tell Tom Baird I did that. But I know you're you're on here. Come on. You put 11 so, and 17. So Charlie Spees and Rob Charlie Avers not, yeah. again for Tom Barrett, and we will be extraordinarily Sorry, brief on this since it sounds like we want to move along and you've got a lot to do. Uh the yeah. Director Brader gets this correct when he explains that both options are correct. So legally, you're fine putting either one of them. And then also he go uh, in your staff report, it goes through the case law, the Court of Appeals cases that explain that adding additional information does not disqualify the petition. That's the legal standard practically uh, because I think there may be some confusion from uh, the complainant here regarding how it works with rule addresses and maybe that's where this came from. Uh, my colleague Rob Avers is gonna explain just briefly how this works. Thank you. So just a, actually a personal anecdote, um, just to sort of demonstrate that this is not a necessarily a, a unique or an uncommon thing. I, I grew up in a, in a rural community in St. Clair County, Michigan. I grew up in a place, uh, Kimball Township, which is uh, very near a small municipality called Smith's Creek. And uh, there is no post office in Kimball Township, but there is one in Smith's Creek. And uh, I can tell you today that um, growing up in my parents' home, uh, my father and I lived under the same roof and his driver's license read 511 Range Road, Kimball Township, Michigan. My driver's license read 511 Range Road, Smith's Creek, Michigan. Same house, same solar system, same driveway. So really that's uh, not at all unlike uh, that of Mr. Barrett, so. Okay, 
Thank you. Any questions? None? I, Let's go. It, it's, <clears throat> I had a question of oh, Director it's, it's, Bader, but I, whatever, you, whatever the chair would want. No, I, we're, any questions to the witnesses? No? Oh, you guys no are not all for set. you guys. Okay. Thank you. The chair, a question to Jonathan? Yeah, I, I, I know we've, we've had this discussion before, uh, Director Brader, and I have one of those situations too where I live, uh, my voting address is actually a township, but my uh, driver's license lists a city. So you're saying in, 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 the, in the staff report that had they just had um, the, um, the Valley Highway, if they had put Charlotte, or Charlotte, sorry, and then Michigan, if, I, I guess the question is, if they had put Charlotte in the city or township, it's still the same thing because if you're pulling them up, it shows Charlotte, but I guess I'm, that's where I'm trying to figure this out because they wrote Charlotte up in the street address, but they put the actual city up there too, but it's not the same city as in the township. I think that's where Mr. Trebilcock is going, that that's a jur dual jurisdiction. Is that a question? It is, because let me, is it, is, it, is it technically a dual jurisdiction? Had they put Charlotte, I could understand it's the same thing, but I, right. I just want more clarification. Yeah. I'm sorry, Director sure. Brader. Thank you, so Mr. If, Chair. If Mr. Baird had been signing a petition as a, as a voter, uh, and he had, he had put in the uh, jurisdiction section, if he had put Charlotte, comma, Carmel Township, we would not, Carmel Township, we would not count that because that would be a dual jurisdiction. We would have listed two different municipalities within um, the heading. And that's actually the next staff report. We're going to talk about that with the next candidate. But in this case, because um, the township is within the mailing jurisdiction within Charlotte, um, it's he did include the required element of, of the residential address as well as the township he lives in. And so in that case, based on the board's practice, we believe that's compliant. Okay. Just and you've already testified. I got two quick points. I need to make, just for the record, to be clear. One is Mr. Barrett's driver's. Two quick points, just so the record's clear. One is Mr. Barrett's driver's license lists Charlotte, not Carmel Township. And two, I, I do respectfully, just so the record's clear, and I forgot to mention this, is upon my review, uh, Chairman Schinkel did sign one of the petitions for uh, Mr. Barrett. So oh, I'm not Am I'm I not impinging anything, but I do want to just note that for the record. I'm the seventh district chair. <laughs> I'm way disqualified. Okay. Anything else? What's the board's pleasure on? What number is this? Number 17. I move. Mr. Chair, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Tom, Tom or Thomas, Thomas Barrett sufficient. Their support. support. It's been moved and supported. Further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Andrew. Chair Schinkel. Aye. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Yes. Member Daunts. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes, but I still think we should have some more clarification on these headings. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. Thank you. The motion passes. Number 18 is next on our agenda. Are we all keep, keep going? Want to take a quick break? We'll keep. Okay, we'll take five until three o'clock. Three o'clock. It's exactly five to four.
It's fantastic. It's easy to follow. It's got everything, and I can shut things out when I'm done with it. Yeah. And not have a bunch of shit to show. It's kind of what stuff to show. <laughs>
Turn that on. Calling it back to order. Three o'clock. We're humming right through our agenda now. We're all the way to number 18. And let me just, uh, I'm just going to see what, how big this agenda is again. We're, we go up to 40. So, but we've already done 22, 4, and 8. So we've done three of them. So we're, we're officially halfway through. I'm not leaving until we're done. And it's three o'clock. So in again. six hours, we've gone halfway. Can we do the other half and two? I don't know. It's going to be uh, tough. We can try it. We're on number uh, 18. Uh, Jonathan, what do we got here with uh, Jake Hague? So this uh, petition for Jake Hogg is um, uh, for the representative of Congress 7th district. Uh, we did determine that he does not have enough facially valid signatures. The predominant issue here was um, jurisdiction errors. Uh, so the, the signer not living in the jurisdiction or um, not properly listing the jurisdiction. There were a large number of these dual jurisdiction issues in this case. So this was mentioned briefly with, uh, with the last candidate. In this case, um, there were instances where someone wrote, for example, Lansing Ingham. And although Ingham is a county, it's also a municipal jurisdiction, Ingham Township within Ingham. So in those cases, the board's practice is, is that those are invalidated because someone has made a dual entry. Okay. We have a, a Shane Flynn uh, who signed a card to speak. Shane's got prepared remarks. He says you can go less than three minutes. Oh, maybe three minutes exactly. Uh, Sean Flynn. Sean, Sean sorry. Sean, sorry. And, and this is Jake uh, Hague with me. Uh, please uh, spell your name for the record and introduce your guest. Uh, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, last name Flynn, F-L-Y-N-N. And this is Jake Hague with me. Do you want to swear him in as well? What's Jake's last name? Hague. Spell your last name? Hague, H-A-G-G. Oh, that was a lot louder than his mic. <laughs> the candidate. Okay, go ahead, Sean. Okay. Yeah, we're having trouble hearing. Good afternoon. Uh, as I've stated, my name is Sean Flynn and I represent Jake Haig. As you're aware, the staff report has recommended Mr. Haig's petitions be deemed insufficient with 948 facially valid signatures, only 52 below the required number. It's been a very long day, so I'm gonna to try to be as quick as possible here. As Mr. Brader already alluded to, the biggest issue we have is dual jurisdiction. The staff report clearly states a dual jurisdiction error arises when the signatory lists two different municipal jurisdictions in the jurisdiction field. The staff report then asserts that Ingham is the name of both a county and a municipality and goes on to recommend the board should determine entries are invalid where the signatory included two municipalities. And they use the examples Lansing Ingham and Ingham Okemos. However, on petition 21 lines two and three, the staff report coded signatures that put only Ingham in the city or township box as error code NC meaning no city or township by the name provided in the county listed. 151 signatories clearly placed their municipal jurisdiction and the county name Ingham, not the name Ingham Township. The staff report is in essence asking this board to accept that, that Ingham written on its own is not a city or township, but then also assume that 151 people wrote in Ingham and another municipality, but forgot to write in township behind Ingham and therefore it's two municipalities. Not only is this implausible, but this finding would disenfranchise the decision of more than 15% of the total number of signatories needed to support a candidate to get on the ballot in this race. Correcting this single mistake would add 151 signatures back to the facially valid list, clearing the required 1,000 signatures. Um, despite the staff report's claim that Mr. Haig's petitions were gathered in Ingham, petitions were also gathered in Eaton, Shiawassee, and Clinton counties, where the staff report does not allege that a similar issue exists with a similarly named county and municipality. Um, indeed, on petition number 216, lines 1, 5, 8, and 9, the staff report recommends a finding that there is no city or township by the name listed when signatories wrote only Eaton in the city or township box on petitions circulated in Eaton County. This should mean that listing Eaton along with the name of a municipality is not two municipal jurisdictions and therefore should not be invalid. This alone would add 53 more signatures back to the facially valid list, putting us at 1,001, not including Ingham. There are further, further 32 signatures marked dual between Shiawassee and Clinton counties. Again, counties where this error has not been alleged. Um, frankly, a couple minutes is not enough time to get into all the issues with the staff report. We found 63 more alleged errors um, as of last night, including but not limiting to signatures marked as crossed out that were not crossed out, signatures marked as no address that do have an address, 
Signatures marked as no city or township uh, when ditto marks or an arrow was used to refer to a city filled in above. Signatures marked not registered when the voter is in fact registered and was found on the registration list. And petitions marked for torn petition headers when it does not obstruct any of the required elements of the header on the scanned version. Um, for the sake of time, rather than go through all of these, I can hand up um, a list of these 63 instances that we've found, and we also already submitted it in the public comment. Um, and if I may, as to the challenge pending, if we do um, have enough facially valid signatures, as to the blank headings, we have already submitted affidavits from all of our circulators that testify to the fact that the petition headers were not blank when they circulated the petition, and I have a further two affidavits that I can hand up now from two of the affiants from the challengers um, withdrawing their claims in that in instance. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Thanks for coming. Oh, Jake, you want to I, say anything? Well, yes, I would like to. Sure. Yes, so um, I, first of all, I want to say that uh, I've been sitting here through this and I give you guys a lot of credit because this is a, a amazing thing that you guys are doing. It's a lot, it takes a lot of attention to detail. Um, and this is my opinion, I'm not a professional, but I think so far from everything I've heard, I have the absolute best argument here so far uh, to reverse the decision. Um, our uh, entire team, as my attorney has pointed out, has signed uh, state statements and affidavits actually uh, countering any of the claims on the challenge. And furthermore, um, our team, including my own wife, uh, because we only had two days to, to find all of this information. Um, my own wife is up till 3 a.m. digging through this, but there's a lot of errors that they quoted were errors supposedly um, that I'm sure you, you, uh, your entire board will be able to see, but they're like clearly not actual errors. For example, many people that were listed as uh, not qualified because they're not registered voters in the, in the uh, district, but actually they just moved to a, like another part in the city somewhere else and they're actually registered voters. There's tons and tons of these. And we only need 52 signatures uh, in total to be reversed, to be back on the ballot. And there's 63 where we found, at least from our, uh, from our attorney searching and ver verifying, as well as our own team, 63, not including the jurisdiction issue uh, that uh, would actually be mistakes or inaccurate um, and 20 or so more that are continuing to come in. Uh, and, and also another thing is, is um, because this is such short notice, I literally just got a uh, word that there's multiple people, uh, including talking to them on the phone. And we do have one uh, affidavit, I believe, that we would like to turn in that states that we, uh, that basically the, the challenge was that this wasn't their signature and we have affidavit that it is in fact their signature. And so uh, our argument here is that, uh, that we are most definitely uh, should be able to be on this ballot today. So thank you so much for hearing us out. Appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming in. Number 18, I see no other cards in. Did you have one for Mr. Doster? Any questions for Jonathan? I have a, I, have, I just have a couple, Mr. Sure. Chairman. Uh, one is, can a dual jurisdiction be rebutted? No. Second, can you use ditto marks? Yes. Um, and I'll just note on the, um, sorry, do you have more questions? Nope, that's it. Thank you. We, we, I believe this came in at 9 a.m. this morning. I understand it's a short timeline for everyone, but we haven't obviously had a time, chance to review these individualized um, responses. Um, but but the dual the dual entry is not something that can be rebutted if, if there's um, you know if they did not in fact write uh, both lines and both municipalities in there or something of that nature we could review that but I don't believe that's what's being alleged here. Okay, what's the board's pleasure? Mr. Chair, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Jake Hag insufficient. Motion on the floor. Is there support? support. Let's move to support and further discussion on the motion. I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Thank you. 
Sorry, um, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Motion Chair, passes. Uh, we're going on at night, number 19 uh, for Paul Young, 8th District. Uh, 19, I don't have a card on 19. So, Jonathan, take it away. Uh, for Paul Young, there was a challenge um, on the grounds. So, so our, our face review found that he had a, a substantial number of signature cushion. Uh, so, but there was a challenge that was based um, on on the grounds of the way that uh, Mr. Young uh, listed his name and his address. Um, we found upon review that the way that he wrote his name, um, you know, it's not required to be his legal name in a, uh, and it was not required to be the specific address that the challenger argued was necessary. So on those grounds, uh, we would recommend rejecting the challenge and finding that the candidate has sufficient number of uh, signatures. Any questions, Jonathan? What's the board's pleasure? Mr. Chair, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed for Paul Young. Young. Sufficient. Our support. Yes, support. Moved and supported. Further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Don. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas and zero nays. Motion passes. Number 20, Chanel Jackson, Congress, 12th District. And I do not have a card for number 20. Jonathan, take it away. So in this case, we again found the candidate had a, a, a facially valid number of signatures with a cushion of 369. There was a challenge that was filed with regard to um, 457 signatures. So we did begin to process that because it called enough into question that it would drop the candidate below 1,000. However, um, after determining uh, that 33 of 35 of them, I should say, overlapped with ones we'd already identified, and uh, we rejected 91 after determining that those signatures were in fact valid. Um, we, there are no longer enough signatures in question that could bring the candidate below 1,000. And so therefore uh, we uh, determined that she has enough and we recommend the uh, board determine that she has enough. Okay, hey, any questions of Jonathan? What's the board's pleasure? Mr. Chair, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Chenille Jackson sufficient. Support, moving and supported that we uh, approve the staff recommendation for Chanel Jackson. Further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Oh, sorry, I'll ask Adam <laughs> to call the roll. Call the roll, Adam, please. I'm trying to move it a little bit too fast, maybe. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Donnett? Yes. Member Bradshaw? Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yes. We have four yeses. Okay, now we're moving off the politicians going back to judges here uh third circuit court number 21 uh go ahead jonathan tell us about it we do have somebody that wants to speak on this we're supposed to believe judges aren't politicians norm no they're not politicians <laughs> you didn't they're they're neutral they're nonpartisan. So, this nonpartisan candidate uh was challenged uh that based on our face review there were 5462 valid signatures so that was a cushion of uh about 1400 there was a challenge made um, by Jeffrey David Hillman. Um, the, the, the number of challenge, signatures challenged were not sufficient to be uh, enough to overcome the cushion. So we didn't process them. But I will note, just because this came up in a couple of cases, that some of the signatures were challenged based on the grounds that they were gathered outside of 180 days prior to submission. That is not a time limitation that applies to nominating petitions. So I just wanted to note that because it'll come up a couple other times. Okay. Um, I'm going to call on Brett McRae. Brett, for the record, state your name, spell your name for the record, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brett McRae. That is B-R-E-T-T-M-C-R-A-E. -T -T -E. Very good. Take it away, Brett. Thank you, and I appreciate your work today. 
I am hoping to set a record on brevity today. I simply urge that you uh, agree with the staff report. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> What's the board's pleasure? I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Sharice Anderson for the Office of Third Circuit Court Judge sufficient. Motion's on the floor. Support. Moved and supported. Any further discussion? Seeing now, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yes. Four yes votes. It passes. We're on to number 21. Or was that 21? That was 21. We're skipping 22. We've done it. We're on to 23. Uh, Third Circuit Judge again. Uh, we don't have a card for 23. Jonathan, take it away. This involves Shakira Hawkins. Uh, after our face review, the candidate did actually have a substantial cushion um, of about 1,400 signatures. However, there was a challenge that put into question over 1,500, um, uh, actually initially over 2,000. Um, but after reviewing, removing the total from the total of the ones we had already identified, uh, there was still a cushion. Uh, there was still 1,500 uh, in question that would uh, be greater than the cushion. As we process those, we did identify um, a sufficient number of invalid signatures that actually took the candidate under the threshold. So the biggest issue was were non-registered uh, individuals, individuals who weren't in the jurisdiction. Uh, we had quite a fair number of duplicates. And so by the time we had processed most of the challenges and done the review, she had fallen below the threshold of 4,000. We didn't process the remaining 188 challenges at that point because she was already below 4,000. One quick question is looking at this report, I, I'm certain I know the answer, but just to be double certain, this is not in any way tied up with the previous issue of the fraudulent and assumptions and things like that. That's correct. We didn't uh, find um, the circulators that were described in the fraudulent petition circulators report associated with this uh, candidate. Thank you. Okay, so, what's the board's pleasure? Uh, Director Brader, the, these have been standard errors that we've found on judicial nomination petitions before. Is that a fair statement? I believe it is accurate that we have found one of at least one of these errors in another uh, petition previously for the same office. What's the, go ahead. I move that the board, oops. I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Shakira Hawkins insufficient. Sure, support. Support. Moved and supported. Further discussion on that motion. Seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Chair Schinkle. Yes. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Yes. Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yay votes. Motion passes. Uh, we're jumping over to number 25 now. Uh, Third Circuit Judge Anne Marie McCarthy. Uh, I do not have a card. Jonathan, take it away. So this is a candidate for the same office. Um, we initially found on face review that she had 5,267 uh, facially valid signatures. Um, there was a challenge uh, that put uh, a sufficient number of uh, signatures in question that we processed the challenge. However, upon review um, of the challenge, we, although it did reduce her number of, of valid signatures, we still found that she had uh, 4,639 valid signatures. Hey, it's the board's pleasure. I just have one question, Mr. Sure. Chair, and that uh, goes back to a couple of questions I've asked earlier when we're talking about candidates that are running for office. Um, did you find duplicate signatures that signed? Uh, I mean, how many how many nominating petitions for the Third Circuit can be signed by an individual? An individual can sign uh, only one candidate's petition for the same office if there's only one of the slots in the ballot. Is that was that what the? I mean, that I, I know the Third Circuit has a number of positions on the ballot, mm -hmm. so that's my question about um, right. possible duplicates. 
So the, the rule would apply once you get over the number of candidates that can be elected to the ballot. So in this case, I'm not remembering offhand how many slots that were up, uh, but however many more than that, you cannot sign. So once you once you start signing beyond that, uh, then your your last signature would not count. Uh, but but if it's two within the same candidate's petition, then both would be thrown out. Hey, Mr. Chair, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Anne Marie McCarthy sufficient. Support. Moved and supported. <coughs> Number 25 for Anne Marie McCarthy. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in. I'll ask, I'd like to ask uh, Adam to call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Don. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Uh, yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas. It passes for nothing. Next, we have number 26, Regina Triplett. Uh, she is here and she would like to testify. Jonathan, why don't you start it off for us? Just briefly, similar to the past candidate, there was a challenge, uh, but after reviewing the challenge, we determined that the candidate still had enough signatures uh, to qualify for the ballot. So you're recommending we let her run. Okay, Regina, what do you have to say to that? I'm just asking that you accept the recommendation. Okay, uh, <laughs> just because I'm supposed to do this, spell your last name for the record, please. Triplet, T-R-I-P as in Paul, L-E-T-T. -T. Okay, and tell us what you think about this whole process. Oh, I'm just thankful to have friends. Hit, hit your red button in front of you. Under the, the light. It's lit. Can you hear me? I'm just thankful to have friends and people in the community, friends and family that um, helped me get these signatures. And it's a very tedious process, especially once you're challenged. Getting signatures is not very fun. Especially in a pandemic. The first 150 is okay. Yeah, but the <laughs> remaining 4,000 and something. After, after 3,000, it gets boring, yeah. Oh, yes. Anyway, any questions for the witness? I would just say that your friends and family look like they did a good job. Thank you. <laughs> They're happy. We're happy. It was us. Might want to speak to some gubernatorials. <laughs> yeah, you should have been helping the gubernatorial candidate. Okay, thanks, Regina. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Uh, what's the board's pleasure? Mr. Chair, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Regina Triplett sufficient. Your support. Support. Any further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Dont. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 48 votes. Passes. We're on an item number 27, Chastity Youngblood. And uh, we do have somebody who wants to testify on that. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, just briefly, uh, as you may recall, from many hours ago, we did start to discuss this one during public comment, um, but the board determined that it would make more sense to talk about that on the agenda item for this candidate. Um, in this case, uh, the Bureau did determine upon face review that the candidate fell below the threshold of required signatures. And I understand um, the gentleman who was speaking earlier um, was raising some questions about the specific grounds by which we found that. And, and I'm Adam is pulling out the, the petition so, they, so that we can discuss that. Okay. Uh, are you Adam Clements? Yes. Yes. What well, your last name for us, would you, Adam? C-L-E-M-E-N-T-S. And are you a licensed attorney? I am, yes. Okay. Uh, wasn't marked, I'll mark it for you. Uh, go ahead and take it away on behalf of Chastity Youngblood. Obviously, um, the board has had an opportunity. It's been a long day. I'm not going to reiterate all of the comments um, that some of the attorneys before me have made. In fact, some of them I, I found to be somewhat disingenuous and a little bit inappropriate as it relates to the critique of the board and some of the work that they've put in. I, the issue that what I, what I would present on behalf of my client and on behalf of the campaign in this particular case is what I think is nuanced for, from other situations is that we don't find ourselves in a situation where we have where Miss Youngblood elicited the services of circulators who um, were deemed to be individuals who had previously been known to have been associated with fraud. What you have in this particular case is um, Miss Youngblood's campaign was challenged to the extent that, that um, there was another attorney representing another candidate who had indicated that there was approximately 16 signatures, 1600 signatures 
that uh, were deemed to be inappropriate, uh, insufficient, fraudulent for whatever whatever term you want to arrive to. But even if you remove that 1600, we were still left with 4000 signatures. Now, as it relates to the staff's assessment, it appears that when you look at um, what's categorized as miscellaneous errors, and then you go back and you read the, the bottom written description, it says that several of Ms. Youngblood's petitions have been printed in a manner that calls for the exclusion of mandatory petition elements. And then there's some examples that are listed and it's listed and attached here. What I'm saying is we have no way of knowing or differentiating how many of the signatures are alleged to be fraudulent. And that's why the 3,900 number um, gets to the point of where it is, or if it's attributed to the amount of petitions that were copied incorrectly. So when we go to do our own independent assessment to try to mount a defense to that extent, if we don't know how many signatures were determined to be um, facially invalid from a fraudulent perspective in order to compare and contrast that to do our own calculations. And it kind of goes back to what was stated earlier about the candidates have the ability to assess this information for themselves. We really don't. And I don't want to be redundant, but I, I do want to iterate the fact that if I don't have the exact number of petitions that are alleged to have been copied incorrectly to be able to separate them from signatures that are alleged to be fraudulent, then how then can we then mount a defense to the allegation that we're not, that we don't have the appropriate number of signatures, which is why we're saying from a due process perspective, we have to be given that information so that we can mount a defense. And then you never know, we may do what other candidates have done once they have an opportunity to do that complete assessment and that's concede. Certainly I'm not in a position to do that here. And if the presumption is that signatures are deemed to be presumed valid, if the staff is saying that they've rebutted that presumption based upon a specific set of information, we're asking for that, that specific set of information that they relied upon, even if we just get the numbers, and then we can do our own assessment. And in this particular case, you don't have that. So I've submitted to you, I, I submit to you that if the presumption is that the signatures are presumed to be valid, then the staff hasn't met his burden to, to rebut that presumption. Thank you. I'd yield my comments for, uh, I'd yield any other time for responses to questions. Jonathan, I'm looking at what you copied in your report here. And can I assume that when they made copies of the petitions before they started filling them out, they cut off a top of the box on the upper right that had instructions in it? Um, it's this part, right? The bottom floor. So, yeah. So, so actually, so to be clear, we, the staff did not identify, uh, obviously fraudulent signatures with regard to this petition. So the issue was not um, the, the authenticity of the signatures. In this case, it was the it was the omission of a required element. So it was similar to the uh, case involving um, the candidate for Congress was first, um, except in this case, it was due to copying. So the 3,901 that uh, we think are not valid are because of that um, copying error that excluded um, the, the required element on the, is it the bottom left? Yes. The bottom left portion of the sheet. Bottom left portion? The circular. The, the W on the warning? Oh. So am I, am I correct oh. in understanding this that the kind of the line by line at the top, the result of face review where it states miscellaneous errors and then talks about dubious authenticity. That is that is a, a typo that shouldn't say that because then right below in miscellaneous errors, it lays out the issue of mandatory elements being removed. Yeah, I think that was not phrased. I'd have to, I'd have to say that that wasn't phrased as clearly as it could have been. This was not about signatures of dubious authenticity. The, the table of contents above could have more clearly indicated that this was a result of, of the heading uh, or, or actually in this case, the circulator statement, um, not having the um, required elements. And it's the warning box we're talking about, right? So basically somebody who made copies of this petition at the beginning of their process, didn't have it squarely on the copy machine. Is that safe to say what happened? It appears to be a copy error. I can't say for sure, you know, what caused it. And then I, am I correct in presuming that it would be the staff's position that that happened 390 times? It happened with regard to sufficient sheets to disqualify 3,901 signatures. I don't know exactly how many sheets that would be, but, 
but it would be in the hundreds, most likely. So as I, as I look at each sheet, and then I don't, again, I'm, in a, I'm not trying to drag this thing out, but I do want to make sure that there's a point of clarification to the extent that I want to leave here and be able to at least assure my client that we're not being accused of fraud because that's what the document says and that's what's alleged and that's what we had notice of. But instead, what we're now being presented with what is appears to be that are letters that are cut off for the lower left portion and we're saying that that's enough to silence the signatures that we, that we believe are deemed to be valid. I'm asking the board not to accept that and not to adopt that recommendation and to allow Ms. K Ms. Youngblood to be on the ballot. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, a technical thing. Sorry about that. Mr. Doug, what's, the, what's I, the board's pleasure? I would like to have some discussion. I, I find when I, I was really, I was unable to discern what the problem Yeah, was. well, he just explained it to us. I, no, I know he's <laughs> just explained it to us, but I find uh, the disqualification of people for this. I know. For such a minuscule problem to be really troubling. And I understand that that is the board's practice and, mm -hmm. and that it is, I guess I would like to better understand why this is actually considered to be really necessary. Is it because of stand up for democracy? Yes, I would say yes. And I would defer to the attorney general's office if they want to elaborate. But essentially, the, the, the court, uh, the board had previously attempted to use a, a sort of a reasonableness standard with regard to things of this nature. And the courts instructed the board that the when it, when it is a required element, it is strict compliance and the required elements have to be on the form. So that's how the that's how we find ourselves with this practice. And I would invite Adam or Heather if you want to add or correct anything I said. And, and, and my reply to that or response, if I may, with all due respect, is that that we don't we don't utilize a robotic process to the extent that we remove the human element of what we're assessing here. You can read every word on these petitions when you have an opportunity to review them. It, we, we're not putting we're not putting these petitions. Um, into a computerized system and then mirroring up the words from a copied petition to a blank petition and say, oh, half of the letter is left off of here. This is insufficient. It's designed to make sure that the circulator understands what their burden is and what their responsibility is. And when you look at what's copied, you can read those words. And it, it takes me back to what I've the same relief that I've been asking for is we're asking you to apply the human standard here, assess the rules. But yes, reasonableness certainly needs to be applied. And to exclude a candidate for this reason is simply not acceptable. Thank you. That's a good appellate argument. Uh, Jonathan, if this person stays off the ballot, we should definitely put this on the website as an example of what not to do, because this is a very innocent mistake right here. And it, they've collected a lot of signatures. Uh, it's only half a Oh, you want to speak on this? Go mm -hmm. ahead. Oh, yeah, you, oh, Peter listed a, a, about 20 petitions he wants to speak on. So uh, you're, prob you're probably saying this should be off the ballot. It, right, right. Oh, for geez. the exact same reasons that Jonathan and the Attorney General have articulated, right? Stand up for democracy has articulated a strict compliance standard to required elements on petitions. We think that they failed to meet this, and we urge you to uh, reject the petitions. Happy to answer any questions. So next time I come up, say this is Mr. Grinch coming up to speak. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chair, may, may I ask Director Breyer a question? Sure, on this go one? ahead. Uh, you know, this these ones that are to form and to requirement are just gut wrenchers at times. Um, unfortunately, this is where we are at. So on these petitions that they have required elements, is there going to be a different kind of, or a separate kind, a, a different way of notifying candidates in that handbook that these are the requirements that could ultimately invalidate signatures by registered voters if it is not on your petition? Is there a different way that we can notify campaigns of these elements? Because I, I know sitting here in this, and I know Norm, we can probably go back to other petitions before our current 
that we, we've had to remove or not place candidates on the ballot because of these form requirements. So I, I unless anyone has any other further, I, it, it is not an easy motion to make, but I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by, uh, filed by Chastity Youngblood insufficient. Support, moving supported. We're on number uh, hmm, 27 to accept the uh, staff report. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Andrew to roll call, please. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Mr. Member Daunt. Yes. Uh, Member Bradshaw. Reluctantly, yes. Mr. Chair, you have three A's and one nay. Three to one. It passes. Round number 29, Amanda Shelton, Sixth Circuit, Judge number 29. Oh, 29, yes, we have somebody who to testify. Jonathan, why don't you start it off? Yes, uh, so, so this candidate we determined had sufficient number of valid signatures. There was a challenge, uh, and this is somewhat similar to the situation involving Mr. Barrett regarding the individual placing um, the village, uh, Beverly Hills, as opposed to um, Franklin um, on, the, on the nominating petition heading. However, the, the board's practice in a situation like this where Beverly Hills is a village that is wholly contained within the township is that um, this can be put on the, the heading and, and the required element um, is deemed to be uh, included. So we recommend determining the petition sufficient. Okay, any questions to Jonathan? We have uh, John Allen back with us. Yes, good afternoon again. Thank Take you. For, away, John. Thank you for having us back. Uh, I know it's been a long day. So we're here today to ask you to adopt the staff recommendation, uh, determining that candidate Shelton's petitions are sufficient, uh, and thus rejecting the challenge made against her by uh, Michael Murray. Uh, first about Amanda Shelton, all of this is in our response, and I don't want to burden the record, but she bought a house in Beverly Hills, Michigan, Oakland County, Michigan in 2004. She has lived there continuously ever since, uh, 22 years, give or take. Uh, she's resided nowhere else. She submitted an affidavit attesting to that fact, and that fact has not been rebutted uh, in any way or disputed. Uh, in response uh, to the challenge, she submitted a bunch of documents, official government documents, which also establish her address and residence is 20285 Coriel Drive in Beverly Hills, Michigan. She submitted the deed and purchase documents for her home in Beverly Hills, her Michigan driver's license, United States Postal Service verification, and com communication from the United States Government uh, uh, Internal Revenue Service. Um, I wanna tell you about Ms. Shelton's efforts to verify that her petitions were correct and compliant. When they, were, uh, when they reflected her address and residence as Beverly Hills, Oakland County, Michigan. First, she reviewed the official instructions on Form 406, uh, which is the back of the countywide nominating petition. And those instructions say that you should enter the candidate's complete name and street address or rural route, the office sought, the district number if applicable, and the term expiration date. All of those things she did, but she went further. She uh, sent a copy of the petition before she had a single signature on December uh, 6th, she sent a copy here to the Bureau and said, this is the form that I wanna use, that I'm going to use, is it okay, is it compliant? Um, she did not receive a response to that email, so she called and she talked to a staff member here who we've identified by name in our response. The staff member said, well, you probably got caught up in our firewall, but read me the petition. Tell me what's in the petition. We read it word for word, including the information reflecting her residence and address in Beverly Hills, Michigan. And we were told that that was fine. And so in reliance on what we were told by the Bureau itself, we went out and began soliciting uh, signatures and, and we've submitted uh, more than enough signatures now to make the ballot. Um, so John, is this the situation where the Beverly Hills is a village? Beverly Hills is a village. So there's no voting precinct there. You don't vote in Beverly Hills. Depends on who you ask. Look, I mean, when you go vote, you vote in Franklin? 
No, sir. I actually vote in Beverly Hills at Groves High School. But you vote, I mean, it's in Beverly Hills, but it's a township. Uh, correct. Beverly Hills is one of three villages in Southfield Township. So, so you vote in Southfield Township. Well, we vote in Beverly, in, actually in Birmingham, because the high school is in Birmingham. That's incorrect. Well, the high school I mean, is in, in Beverly, Beverly Hills. Hills. <laughs> your, voter, your voter ID card. I mean, where are you registered? Well, if you run for precinct delegate, what precinct do you run in? I'm not sure of the precinct number, if that's the question. No, but what unit of government do you run in? If you run for precinct delegate, if you know. I, I don't know. I, uh, I'm if sorry. I could clarify, just based on the qualified voter file record for the individual. So she lives in Beverly Hills, which is entirely within Southfield Township. And um, her, mailing, Southfield her Township. mailing address, her post office city is Franklin. So we have a, a three... Uh, a triple threat there. Triple but, threat. Yeah, but so, but the, the voting jurisdiction technically is Southfield Township. Um, so that would be the township. However, the board's practice is when someone includes a village that's wholly contained within the township, that that's deemed an acceptable inclusion of the required element of the city or township. And I would also note that we did uh, cite in our response um, the, the Bureau's decision letter of June 10th, 2020, which says the purpose of the statutory requirements to print the candidate's address in the petition heading is to inform the voters whether the candidate resides in the electoral, electoral district. In this case, this is a countywide Oakland County uh, race. And clearly by any measure, whether you say Franklin, whether you say Bingham Farms, which is the other uh, village, or whether you say Beverly Hills or Southfield Township, you're talking about Oakland County and everybody knows there's no intent to mislead and certainly no one would be misled. And also all three of these different villages are wholly contained within the, uh, within the county of Oakland. There's no cross jurisdictional issue here. We're also citing the, the guidance from the uh, election officials manual which says acceptable sheet irregularities. And then it says the following irregularities do not affect the validity of petition sheets. It says village or unincorporated place listed instead of township when village or unincorporated place is contained within a single township. We're ready, we're ready to go. Go. We're ready to go. Okay, thanks for coming in. Thank you. What's the board's pleasure on the recommendation? I move that the board accept the staff recommendation. I'm the nominating by Amanda Shelton. Support. I was. moved and supported that we find the staff uh, report. We agree with the staff report that is sufficient signatures uh, for Amanda Shelton. Uh, any further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, uh, I'll ask for Andrew to call the roll. <coughs> Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice yes. Chair. Uh, Member Don. Yes. M uh, Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas. It passes. We're down to number 30. If, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, sure. just, just a polite note. If if you're in agreement with what the staff report is, you can come up and very quickly see, say we accept it, and we'll ask you questions if we have any. <laughs> Good idea, Tony. Okay, we're on number 30. Uh, and number 30, oh, my card here. Yep. Uh, we have somebody that wants to testify. Jonathan, start us off, would you? So this candidate uh, is a candidate for a uh, Ninth Circuit judge, Ms. Camfield. She did have a, a very narrow cushion of 15 signatures on the filing. And in our review, we determined that she didn't have a sufficient number. The major issue had to do with 78 signatures that were disqualified based on, circul uh, based on um, circulator errors. Circulator errors. Director okay. Brady, were those circulator errors uh, dates or not signed? Well, ha the we have the candidate with us. Uh, yeah. Angel, could you spell your first and last name for us, please? That was ahead. Yes, good morning or afternoon as it is now. Um, I'm Angelique Camfield, A N G E L I Q U E C A M as in Mary, F I E L D. Thank you. I just wanna give you a little bit of background into myself before I begin my legal argument to hopefully reverse the, the BOE's recommendation to you and have the board find my petition sufficient. Um, I'm a single mother of three girls. I've resided in Kalamazoo um, back in the 90s, but then again, since 2014. 
I have nobody in my family that's political. I'm not political. I'm just an attorney who has done the majority of her practice for the people. I have been a prosecutor for over 15 years in at least three separate jurisdictions, if we don't count my internship in Saginaw. And then I've also was on the indigent defense uh, contract for felonies for Kalamazoo County as well. I ran my own practice in Kalamazoo. I'm now practicing family law. During this campaign and trying to get the signatures, um, I did not become aware until the middle of March that a couple of our judges were not retiring early, thus not invoking the appointment process. As soon as I became aware of that on a Thursday, the following Monday, I picked up my petitions and I began to get signatures by Tuesday. You'll see from my petitions that are filed with the BOE that I collected a majority of my own signatures. I went to functions, I went to my roller rink, I went to my gym, yes, I roller skate. I also went to um, things at the Kalamazoo County Expo Center, but then a majority of the time myself and my friend Scott McClellan went door to door for about three weeks. During the time that I was going door to door, I came down with bronchitis. I kept going and persevered through the bronchitis. I also fell down my steps and severely bruised my tailbone and had back spasms while I was going door to door. I tell you this only by way of describing to you how important being able to run for this office is to me. And then I will begin now with my argument. I thank you for allowing me to speak this afternoon. And I'm asking that you find my nominating petition sufficient for the following reasons. First, in the uh, circulating and, compass and canvassing countywide petition forms, nominating and qualifying petitions at page seven, a failure to include a term expiration date does not render a petition sheet invalid if the filing official can ascertain a position that the candidate is seeking. The heading information in my six question petition sheets out of 83 provides substantially compliant information and allows the filing official to identify the office which I seek, which is Ninth Circuit Court Judge. Regular term non-incumbent position. A missing primary date does not interfere with the filing officials making that conclusion. Second, the primary date was inadvertently left off as a harmless clerical error are only six of 83 of the petition sheets. Affidavits filed as to those sheets that I submitted to the board yesterday, along with my written argument that I heavily rely on, demonstrate that each of the signers and voters on those petition sheets were told by the circulators, myself, Mr. McClellan and Mr. Lewis, that the primary date was August 2nd of 2022. That is something that was my typical first thing out of my mouth was I'm trying to get onto the ballot for the August 2nd, 2022 primary. This is my history. This is why I think you should sign for me. Please do so. I made sure they were registered voters. Mr. McClellan had been a longtime salesman going door to door for various companies and also had a habitual introduction to the signers on his petitions. Mr. Lewis said, I'm trying to get her on to the ballot for the next election, which would be the August 2nd, 22 primary. So each of those 78 people contained in those six sheets that the BOE recommends you not count were people that I spoke to personally or that two of my very close friends and Nick being also a colleague of mine spoke to. They explained my history. They explained my experience. They explained which race I was going to be in and which position I sought. Each of those 78 people signed for me wanting me on the ballot. Harmless error shouldn't prevent their voice from counting. It should not disenfranchise those voters' voices. This is a democratic process. 
I know that it's already listed in the report that I was not challenged. I confirmed that with the board in the email just yesterday. My six colleagues running against me in the ninth district did not challenge me. They know that I'm qualified and experienced and would be a good judge. If they wanted me off the ballot, they would have challenged me. They did not. Third, in committee to ban frag fracking in Michigan versus the Secretary of State, an incorrect election date did not invalidate a petition. That's arguably a more serious error than mine of them simply missing the primary date when the heading refers to them nominating me in the next primary election. The heading on my petition says that the voters wish me to be nominated into the next Kalamazoo County primary election. An easily searchable date, in fact, if you Google it, it comes up as the very first response at the top. Six had voters verbally informed of that date. Finally, the circulating petitions, again, um, manual mentioned that the board places online, does not provide notice at pages six and seven that a missing primary date is a fatal error that would void the entire petition. As I listed in my written response and an argument to the board, there are um, dual jurisdiction concerns. There are leaving off the seat sought. There are an incorrect address for the candidate or not filling out the candidate's name. That are some fatal errors that are listed, particularly because that was a manual updated in April of 2020 after the decision um, that I listed in my written answer. I'm sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head. We, uh, I, we, we I need believe. to get around the fact that the circulator didn't sign or date your petitions on 78 signatures. That's the issue. Oh, here. no. Stay focused on that if you could. Clarify. Well, sorry I, to clarify. It's, it's an it, error yeah, in the, the report. It's, it's described as a circular error. It's, it's an error on the heading. It's so not. it's an, it errors on the heading in terms of the omission of the date of the election. So we didn't have Oh, we didn't have circulators not signed. The error is on the heading. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking so at your a, report here saying circulator it's error. It's really a heading error. So the heading error, and, and just repeat the heading error to me. Sorry about this, yeah. Jonathan. Well, the heading it, error as, the, is, as the candidate has been describing, it's the fact that the date of the election was admit, omitted on six, six sheets? Six sheets, 78 signatures. Six sheets, she omitted the primary date. It was blank. Correct. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I can ask Director Brader. Yeah. That is a required form. Element, sorry. Yes, it's required under 544C. May I continue, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Thank Just you. Finish it up. Thank you. Yes. Um, so my signatures were collected in good faith with hard work door to door. They are not alleged to be fraudulent and they were not challenged by my colleagues. If all six of those sheets are counted by this board and my signature is counted, which wasn't added into the total number for some reason, with the facially validated 922 of the board or the Bureau of Elections, I would have 1,001 signatures. There were several other signatures that were not in my written response, but I would like to speak to you today um, with respect to petition 73, signatures one and two, um, they were listed on, they filled in Kalamazoo County instead of their city. But when you look at their written address and zip code, it clearly identifies that they live within the county in the city of Kalamazoo in the city of Parchment. So I would like to ask that those two votes or sig voter signatures be included as well. And then you're trying on, to rehabilitate uh, 78 is what you got to rehabilitate here. Okay. So, and it all relates to the date. And, correct. Correct. So, so I, mean, I guess the, my reliance before this board is on um, fairness and equity and hard work and wanting somebody on the uh, ballot that 78 people 
um, and more signed for. And really in the committee to ban franking, fracking, if an incorrect election date does not invalidate a petition, a missing one should not. And I'm asking that that be adopted by the board. That seems a more egregious error than inadvertently missing six dates. Okay, any Thank questions you. of the witness? Nope. No, no, not, not okay. for- Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Jonathan, you see any way around this? Um, I think, you know, as with some of the other situations that the board members have found frustrating and that, you know, it's not something that the Bureau uh, enjoys either. Uh, this is a required element um, that's missing. And the, the, same, the same case law governs regarding strict compliance here. So the fact that this element was not included and it's specifically required by statute, based on that, we would recommend determining the candidate does not have enough valid signatures. Okay. Mr. Chair, may I make a recommendation sure. to our director of elections yeah, uh, and sure. staff? This is, I think, the second, possibly the third candidate that has come before us that us as the board is looking at these staff reports and it's not reflected to what is really being put before us. And I would just hope that I know that there is a ton <sighs> of challenges. I know we are still getting and I will be very brief, Mr. Chair, but I really feel that we that that for us to make for have these discussions and for the candidates and for the public that these reports be a little bit more reflective of what the issues are. And I don't like being hypercritical of staff um, because I know that it is a thankless job uh, that you do on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan. But I just feel that that there needs to be a little bit more to these reports, and I don't know if my fellow board members re feel the same way I do. But I just that's why I asked the yeah, question I, first off. Yeah, I hear Mr. you. Chair. I, I mean, today I, is a little bit different than a normal. Exactly. Day doing this. So you know, I'm not really critical of staff. No, I just they, <laughs> instead of putting circulator or then put the primary date. Uh, they get a break from me. <laughs> no, I get it. I just. So I, I can anyway. also understand on their on, on a candidate's frustration yeah. when this is becomes public and also you. to the media. We're, so, we're on number it. thirty. What's the board's pleasure? I'll 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 make the motion. Um, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Angelique Camfield insufficient. There's a motion. Support. Moved and supported. Further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll ask for the roll call. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Uh, a reluctant yes. Member Daunt. Yes. Uh, Member Bradshaw. It is reluctant, but it is the form. We're moving on to number 31, 30th uh, Circuit Court Judge. Uh, Christopher Wickman, I don't have uh, any card in for this. Jonathan, take it away. The, the question with this candidate related to the district as it was written on the heading, um, they did have sufficient signatures, but there was a challenge related to the way that um, Mr. Wickman wrote and corrected the districts. Um, he originally wrote um, eighth, I think it was, and then, and then wrote over it second. Um, and then he also added second again on top of that. Uh, I assume an attempt to clarify. Um, we didn't view this as something that would confuse a voter or that a voter would read as 22nd. So we thought that he did include the date of the primary here. Okay. So you're recommending there it's being sufficient. Correct. 62 votes to spare or signatures. What's the board's pleasure? Mr. Chair, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Christopher Wickman sufficient. Is there support? support. Moved and supported. Uh, any further discussion on number 31? Seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas. Passes four to nothing. Uh, we're uh, running to number 32, uh, 
Christine Beecher, a 12th District Court judge, and I do not have a card. So Jonathan, let us know what's going on there. So with this candidate, I do want to note there is an error on the staff report. Uh, there was actually a challenge to this. Uh, however, we did not process it because it was uh, irrelevant <laughs> given our own determinations that the candidate didn't have enough signatures. In this case, um, the, the candidate had a very narrow cushion and on, on face review, we found that because of jurisdiction errors and circulator errors that uh, the candidate only had 551 facially valid signatures. So we would recommend determining the petition insufficient. Okay, uh, there's nobody to testify. What's the board's pleasure? I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Christine Beecher insufficient. Support. Moving supported uh, to adopt the staff recommendation. Further discussion, seeing none, I'll ask Adam to call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. I vote Mary Ellen. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Member Don. Yes. Uh, Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you okay. have four yes. Okay, it passes four to nothing. I'm going to pass over 33 for a moment. Uh, Doster's not with us. He's called out by a judge. So we'll come back to that if he can shows up. And I'm also waiting when Gabby, if Gabby shows up, number 14 on our agenda, I, somebody let me know. We'll go back to her right away. Uh, so I'm just going to go right to number 34, uh, District Judge, 12th District. Uh, do I have a card on this one? No, I do not. Jonathan, take 34 for me, would you? So in this case, uh, the candidate um, had a um, 680 valid signatures following face review. Um, there uh, was a challenge, um, but uh, the, having uh, reviewed the challenge, most of the ch signatures in question were ones that we had already reviewed. Um, so with the remaining challenge, there weren't enough to call into question the petition given the cushion. So we recommend determining the petition sufficient. Okay. Any questions? It's the board's pleasure. Mr. Chair, I'm, I have multiple pages open here. I'm trying to make sure I get the right one. Um, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Craig Happen sufficient. I'll support. Moved and supported. Uh, we find the uh, staff recommendation sufficient for Craig Pappen. Number 34. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Uh, Adam, please call the, roll, call, call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas. And that passes. Moving on to number 35. Um, there is no card on 35. Jonathan, take it away on Stuart Collins. Uh, for this uh, candidate, uh, we found 807 valid uh, facially valid signatures. There was a challenge, um, but it did not call into question sufficient signatures to uh, re reduce the candidate below the threshold. So we recommend determining the petition sufficient. Okay. What's the board's pleasure? I'll move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition. Filed by Stuart Collis, uh, sufficient. Support. Support. Moved and supported. We find the staff recommendation sufficient for Stuart Collins. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Adam, please call the, roll, call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yes. It passes. Number 36. Uh, we do have a witness for number 36. Uh, Chair, Chair Siegel, if I might, could we skip to 37? Because 36 has legal issues in common with 33. And I think the board, if they're going to wait on that, should wait on 36 as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why we're skipping. We'll skip. We'll go to 37. Uh, 37. And we do have uh, somebody, Peter, who wants to testify on 37. But tell us about 37, Jonathan. Um, in this case, uh, the, the Bureau found that after face review, this was another one in, in where the candidate had a pretty narrow cushion. And because of circulator errors, the Bureau found that the candidate uh, did not have a sufficient number of valid signatures. Okay, this is a 37th District Court judge, which happens to be number 37. Now, there's a coincidence for us. Um, 
And that's not Peter Riddell looking at me there. Oh, you're Mark. Yes. For the my, record. My name is Mark Corey. Yeah, it's just. I am wondering in this. Yeah, I just. Got, your name real quick for us. Yeah. I got the this report Monday. Uh, Monday. It Mark, does how do you spell your last name? K-O-R-O-I. K-O-R-O-I. Okay, go for it. Okay. Th this particular face review uh, cites circular errors 30, certainly not sign or date petition, et cetera. I got all, all 63 uh, petitions right here. All of them are signed and dated. I don't know what et cetera means, but I couldn't find, I was ever put on notice of any circular errors. Circular errors, I did not receive any type of challenge that cites circular errors. And it's the first time seeing it. They're not saying what the errors are. So it's hard for me to address what they are unless they they uh, they cite it in here. It's, it's I mean, due process, Article 1, Section 17, a state constitution demands proper notice that opportunity be heard. I can't prepare a defense unless I know what the circulator okay. are because I have well, we all my circulator petitions. Circulator errors, there's 30 of them. They have circulator errors. Uh, no, 30 signatures. Sign or date the petition. Jonathan, what do we got there? Uh, we're pulling out the examples. Um, so yeah, to be clear, it's not 30 pages, 30 sheets, it's 30 signatures. And those involved, Adam, can you, do you have the? Yes, it's the dates. So was it that they weren't dated or that that's uh, after the date of the? I don't know if that's dated. I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so so there were, in, in one case, there's an error in the date. Um, so I can pass this one around. There's error on which, which sheet? Sheet 19. Sheet 19. Okay, mine are not numbered. They numbered after they were filed. So I don't have to number it. If you tell me the dates, I can I have them in numerical order. We received a request for copies of that. Okay. Uh, this is. Uh... CIRC petition date. It's dated 019 is the number on the sheet. 49. 019. And it's the yeah, mine's not mine's not numbered by it. Apparently, yeah. your your AC number is the year. It's the year. That's what they're I think the problem is. Yeah. What does that say 2023? I mean. 2000 for 208. 208 is another year. one. For which 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 one? 019. There's no way that's not a 208. Can I see? I'm not sure which one you're oh, talking about. Take a look at it. I mean, there's no way that that's the 2022. Those are the three mistaken in that. Actually, this Every one of my sheets that I did first and circulate them all are signed out of date. In other words, it can't be filed. It's two zero. It's a very small pool, and the sheets are not the best way to start to leave. It's not eight. All sheets are right around the date. Let me see that again. I had been filed the same day, and I put two on top of the two. So this is a two. This is a two. So this is this is looks like two, three. It's it's. Well, I see that squiggle there is a two, and he he put a two over the two, which yeah. makes it look like an eight. <laughs> it's almost like this is a magic act or something. I don't know. It does. It does. I can see why you could see it's two twos as opposed okay, to an so, eight, but it sure okay. looks like an eight. Unless you know you did two so twos. this is 20 signatures. Yeah, all those were Davis. You swear oh, again, I, I would testify. Them. Those are we're all signed the same day. Okay. I was and trying so, to get them in for the deadline. Here's the third. Here's the third one. Oh, and it's because of the, that you can't tell yes. that's a two. Mm, it's a scribble. A scribble. Is a scribble a good enough two? I can test, I clarify signed this whole same day. Those are all signed before I got down here. That's why I thought I was going to show it to me. Well, no, just take a, take a look. It's, it, this, this, the last two looks like a whatever, a line. I can't. And that's 
stick there. So yeah, it's, it's, it's 20, yeah, two zero two snake. Can I ask the director a question? Yeah, yes. We have difficultly knocked off several folks um, for for reasons that we had to. Is this similar to that, where this is required? And yeah, we can kind of sit and. And figure it out and say, yeah, no, we know what that says, but statute says we've got to follow, or do we have some discretion here? I don't know. Because that consistency is going to be important here. So I can can we let can we let Mr. Yeah, Rader? So sure. But the board, but the board is bound by, and again, Heather, please uh, jump in to correct or add whatever you'd like. But the board cannot, in my opinion, consider external testimony as, as to what these say. Uh, the board can, of course, decide what they actually say. So we, we're recommending to you, based on our review, that they're not properly dated because to us, these don't have dates that all um, legibly determine a date that was before, but that was after the date of circulation and is well, an actual 208, date. What do, you, what do you think that meant? Well, to <laughs> us, it wasn't clear that, I mean, you know, I, I understand and that the, the candidate is, is saying that he intended to write 419 2022. Once he explains that that's a but, two, that's two twos well, over each other. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't, I don't think the board can consider external testimony, but the board can decide what these say. If the board decides that these have dates that are um, appropriate, then that's up to the board well, to but decide. If, but but if I, external testimony is going to explain to us what the heck we're looking at, isn't that, isn't that what we're here for? Uh, I, I don't believe that. I mean, you're, you're here to make the factual determination as to what this sheet says, but I, I don't. So if, but if the sheet, and I would say, and again, defer to Heather, if, if the sheet clearly says, you know, 419 2021 or 419 2023, if that's what it says, even if someone tells you that they signed it on a different date, I, the way I understand the law and the president, the court can't consider that. But the court can't, or but the, not the court, the board can't consider that, but the board can decide what these actually say, what you're actually looking at, what it says. Okay. Can we again? Yeah. How yeah, there's a third one I haven't it? seen yet, so I can explain how somebody showed well, there's it There's three of them. Okay. Yeah, I've seen there's two of them. I haven't seen the third, oh, I haven't seen the third one yet either. So happy I've seen the snake and I've seen the, the double two. So which one am I missing? Uh, oh, the 2023. Yeah, right. So yeah. this is the. That's the snake. And that's the double two, and that's the one that the two looks like a three. Well, there's the three of them. That's so all I got three of them right there. You're going pretty fast there. That's the problem. <laughs> Obviously, you don't think it's 2023 yet. Something I can swear to say. Yeah. Yeah. All day, the same day, the day I had to file them down here, I was rushing to get them down. So those that thirty puts me over the uh, the six hundred threshold. In addition, there's some other other ones here that I what, I can. What you're testifying to right now under oath is that all three of those dates are uh, 2022. The they were executed in 2022 okay. and meant to do it. And what I, what I want to do is is say if there are any questions to the witness. I'm going to ask that I'm going to excuse you. Okay. Just, okay. You're excused. And I'm going to ask Peter Rodell to come forward. He wants to testify on this uh, case. I want to get all our testimony in timely. And Peter, you just have you seen? I have seen. I have seen. You've seen it. Okay. I've seen it. I, and I. So uh, obviously, uh, I concur with the staff. We can argument. assume that the witness was telling the truth. <laughs> what uh, would you do if you were us? Uh, I would concur with the staff recommendation at, <laughs> for obvious reasons, uh, but but first and foremost, um, similar to other challenges that we submitted, our, our particular challenge was not actually processed because on the facial review, it was determined that there was an inadequate number of petition signatures. So, uh, and, and if you would have processed our challenge, I believe this particular candidate would have been under the 600. We did not count these particular uh, uh, circulator errors in our challenge. So our challenge had uh, 75, 77 particular uh, signature challenges associated with it. Um, and I believe the, the candidate 
only submitted around 613. He attempted to rehabilitate around 40, which even, even after the rehabilitation, if they were successful, would still not meet the 600 threshold. What am I missing? Jonathan, what's he talking about here? Well, in this case, you know, as I explained earlier, when we don't process a challenge uh, once, if we've already determined that oh, the petition is insufficient. You threw out the 30, so you didn't get into the challenge. Exactly. Okay, so well. We would, we would need to review that geez. and make a recommendation to you based yeah. on that challenge. How much time do you have for that? Uh, well, we would need to do it by the... Yeah. You hear what he's saying? Yeah, we would we would need several days to do the that. The challenge has not been considered by staff other than the 2022. Because they found the 30 that took them under. The 2022 the was enough for staff. They didn't go into the challenge by right. Peter Riddell. So that's a dilemma. If you think the 2022 is not enough to throw them out, then the rest of these challenges have to be considered and they haven't been thought of by staff. So we're sitting here. We're doing our thumbs. <laughs> now, I, I would like to say uh, that I think stand up for democracy is wrong, um, but it is the Supreme Court case law. I understand that um, it it puts us in a difficult position of making really harsh decisions. But if it weren't for stand up for democracy and we had a substantial compliance rule we would be making different kinds of, of decisions, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure which is the harder standard for us. Um, right now we need, we need uh, right now a we way need to go to forward on, on this particular one. And we have uh, a challenge of 77 signatures here. 32 of them were from ind individuals unregistered. I mean, that wipes them out right there. If that's indeed true. It, Peter, it would if we are you, are you personally it. familiar with these 32? I, I'm not personally familiar with the 32. I, I can't speak directly to those particular 32 registrations. I think the, the issue of the challenge is moot because it hasn't been addressed. We obviously don't have time to, to address it. And we can't, as uh, we beat up on for quite some time, at least I did, I'm, we can't make these decisions based on assumptions. And so assuming that the challenge is correct is not going to fly with me. Right. So what we have before us is what the board determined. When I first looked at that, it looked as, as it said 208. And then another looks as though it says 2023. That being said, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Mark Corey insufficient. I'll support that and note that again, when we are dealing with petitions, I cannot stress hard enough, having been in this position for a long time, take your time, make sure that everything's correct. Okay, uh, we have a motion, it's been supported to adopt the staff recommendation. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, I ask, uh, please call the roll, Andrew. Chair Schinkel. No. Wait. Uh, Vice Chair Gerwitz. Wait, I'm sorry. The, the motion was to accept the staff. Yes, and I'm against oh, the motion. Okay. Yes. Member Don. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Motion Chair, you have passes three, three and one, two, one. Uh Okay. Mr. Doster, are you ready? Uh, come on up. We're, we're back to a uh, number uh, 33. George Lyons. Uh, Jonathan, if you can tell us about George uh, quickly, that'd be nice. Yeah, so this is, um, the, the issue in this uh, petition is the designation of the position. Uh, so it's, a, it's an incumbent position, it's running against an incumbent. On the petition sheet, the candidate for some of, of the petitions wrote non-incumbent uh, position. And so based on that, and based on 467B, which requires the um, designation of the office. Um, staff's view is that um, the, 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 the proper element was not there, was incorrect, and it would lead the signers of the petition to believe that um, the candidate was running for a non-incumbent position. Okay, and the issue here is there's only one judge running in this jurisdiction. And the problem is that the petition was filled out incorrectly 
saying non-incumbent when it should have read incumbent. Is that correct? That it's correct that our determination was that it should be disqualified based on the the some of the petitions saying non-incumbent. Okay. Uh, it is true that there is only one position on the ballot in this district. It's only one judge running. This is similar to what we did in the past. What year was it, Eric, that we did, did something similar to this? Uh, it would have been, uh, the, according to the Zyberski opinion that I just passed to you, uh, that was 2018. Tell us what we did in 2018, Mr. Goster. Here we go. A shout. Uh, and sorry, introduce your guest there. Who is let, me, let me let me let me let me start off with my remarks. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, Eric Doster on behalf of George Lyons, candidate for 12th district judge. With me today is George Lyons, who is seeking to become the first African American judge in the history of Jackson County, Michigan. Uh, I, I, I will get address your question. Uh, I don't need much time here. Again, I, as the chair talked about and, and Director Brader, there's really only one issue or one, I only want to focus on one aspect of Mr. Lyon's staff report. And that is the, uh, the reference uh, in the staff report that says designation errors. Um, <clears throat> it says staff identified 80 signatures on petition sheets where the wrong incumbency status was listed in the title of office. Um, that's what that, that that's the, the sole issue that, that we want to bring at this time before the board. Uh, our position is that the staff incorrectly uh, invalidated these 80 petition signatures based on heading errors, where the petition heading may have incorrectly said other non incumbent, uh, may have said either non incumbent or incumbent. And the reason being is that there was only a single position for 12th district court judge to be elected in 2022. And so these heading petition requirements that Ms. the Director Brader cited just simply don't exist. Uh, the office designations set forth in Mr. Lyon's petitions are sufficient to place election officials, candidates, and voters on notice that Mr. Lyons is a candidate for the only position to be elected this year, and that is the 12th District Court. Um, our situation is exactly like the Zyberski opinion that I just passed out. So I'm gonna to get to your chair or question, Chair Schinkel, um, with one small exception. Um, in, in Zyberski, as you have before, because I didn't know if your computers are working, so I brought hard copies. Um, like Mr. Lyons in 2018, uh, there was only one judicial position uh, at, at that time. Um, this isn't like a case like the Wayne District court, the Wayne County, or the Detroit, the 36th district court, they've got, you know, four or five or six positions. So if there was more than one judicial position uh, in Jackson County for this district court, I wouldn't be here on this argument. Um, <clears throat> these judicial categories are not the requirements, the heading requirements are not required. Um, as, the, as the Bureau and this uh, board unanimously adopted, two of you were on the uh, canvassers in 2018 that voted for the Zyberski staff report. And that's all we want here is the Zyberski staff report. Um, in that case, if you'll notice, all Mr. Zyberski did, um, all he put down was judge 2020-25 and the, and the 39th for district. That's all he did. He completely omitted um, any reference to incumbent or non-incumbent. And, and I, and I, I do believe, and I, and I want to make sure that, so I can focus my argument now, um, that the reason why staff is saying, recommending against Mr. Lyon's certification at this point is because in Zyberski, they completely omitted it. And in Mr. Lyon's, the, 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 information, uh, the information may have been correct. So. I don't want to put words in, in Director Brader's mouth, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm focusing. Versus, uh, yeah, I want to make sure that we both agree that for this race, that this information was not required. I, but the difference of our disagreement is that because Mr. Lyons put in incorrect information, or may have put it, I'm, I'm going to assume that he did because I don't even know which petitions you're talking about because we don't have a Excel spreadsheet or a we asked for it, and I understand why we don't have it yet, but I, I get it. Um, so am, am, I, am I correct that that's our 
focus of dispute so I can, before well, I go forward? Well, so I agree that there are certainly some elements in common with Zybersky. I think there's two differences here. So one, one uh, the similarity is that there is only one uh, judgeship that's up. So we would have no, you know, certainly would not have any confusion about what place to put the candidate on the ballot here. So that, that is similar to Zybersky. I think the difference in, in the context of Zybersky, there was a non-incumbent position on the ballot. And so the candidate um, omitting the designation, um, in that case, I wasn't around then, but in that case, the board determined that um, notwithstanding 467B, that it wasn't necessary to specify that. In this case, the, uh, another difference is that there is, this is an incumbent position. So the candidate is running against the sitting judge. Um, it is an incumbent position. And some of the individuals signing the petition sheet would believe signing the sheet that the, there were, that the candidate was running for a non-incumbent position. So I can certainly understand the argument. Um, I don't think we have a direct precedent for this um, that I'm aware of, but, but that's, those are the distinguishing features that, that we see. Okay. So can I ask the candidate why he put non-incumbent when there's an incumbent? Well, <clears throat> pardon me guys. I, <clears throat> this is a case where the judge was just appointed at the end of April. So we had a cutoff date of I think the 12th of April and we screwed up and we got the petitions mixed up. So, so I guess the answer to the question, the, the, uh, they, they had, Mr. Chair, they had both incumbent and non-incumbent petitions. So when he says we screwed up, the screw up was that some of some of the non-incumbent, again, I, I don't know which petitions we're talking that go with these 80 because I don't have them, yeah. but I'm going to assume that they're correct for the purposes of today's discussion. And so, so we must have circulated some non-incumbent when we should have circulated incumbent um, after that April 11th uh, time. After the judge was appointed. Yeah, after the judge was appointed, right. So, I mean, it was a very fluid process. We're not talking about a situation like, uh, you know, that happens where, you know, going in, you're, you're running for an incumbent or non-incumbent. When Mr. Lyons started this process, it was a non-incumbent a, a non position. Then on April 11th, the, 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 the incumbent judge gets sworn in. And, and then therefore, uh, you know, we had to flip, flip the switch and go to incumbent position petitions for anything, I guess what, after April 11th. So, so it's not, but, but that doesn't matter here because the, the, I appreciate Director Brader's candor here. The, 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 the difference is the fact that it was a non-incumbent versus an incumbent in Zybersky is no reason to distinguish uh, uh, Zybersky from Mr. Lyon's situation because if the, if the statute, if the provisions aren't required by statute, what difference does it make? And hold that point. I'm gonna get that to the second. Well, there's, but there's, there's, but there's three blocks here of bad 53, 50. Well, I know, but I'm not. I, I I can't. I don't know what those are. Any any one of these three. Yeah, I know, but I don't know what those yeah. are. I can only come to you today because we weren't given the Excel spreadsheet. We requested it at Monday night, and I'm not trying to beat them up. I realize these folks are really overworked. I'm. I, that's why I'm just limiting it just for today. I'm only limiting it for the, the, the office designation, which to me is, 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 a, is a clear winner for us because what, what by not allowing Zybersky to apply to Mr. Lyons, you're saying, oh, it's okay if you totally omit it, um, uh, you know, totally screw up. But here, if you try to comply, we're going to, <laughs> we're, we're gonna cut, hang you out to dry here. And, 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 and I wanna read something to, to this board and this was a, uh, from a staff report that, that was issued less than three days ago. Um, and I, I wanna, and, and this is from the, this bureau, uh, quote, recent case law also makes clear that the addition, additions in quotes, of information not required by statute does not render the entire petition valid, hyphen, even if the information is incorrect. And they cite the case of, uh, again, the staff is citing the case, Committee to Ban Fracking in Michigan v. Secretary of State, 
uh, and they put this is their this is their reference finding that the inclusion of the incorrect election date and the heading of a statewide initiative did not render the entire petition sheet invalid. And they also cite the raise the wish raise the wage Michigan case the board of state canvassers which was a Michigan Supreme Court from earlier this year, and again they say. This is their reference to it, finding that the inclusion of a printer's union label containing improper font size on a statewide petition sheet did not invalidate the petition because the statute neither expressly nor implicitly precludes the inclusion. So what, what I'm saying here is I, 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 it's clear from Zybersky that this information was not required by the statute. So again, I wanna come back to this first sentence in the staff report that was issued less than three days ago. Recent case law also makes clear that the addition of information not required by statute, in this case, non-incumbent versus incumbent, um, not required by statute does not render the entire petition valid, invalid, even if the information is incorrect. Eric, um, I wanna ask Jonathan, it, on the uh, your staff recommendation at the bottom, it says, Staff identified 80 signatures on the petition that were the wrong incumbency status because of the April uh, swearing in of the new judge. But I'm not sure where I find those 80 when you're going up to the numbers here. Where do I, how do I add up those numbers to get to 80? I, I think I know if I can answer and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong because I thought about that too. I think it's the 62. And here's why I think it's the six, again, they, if I'm not right here, you, Adam, Jonathan, tell me, because I've because I've worried about that too. Because I was like, where do they get the eighty? It's the sixty-two because it says heading errors, incorrect or admitted information, and the heading incorrect designation. So, and the reason why it's sixty-two is because I believe that there were eighteen signatures. Because these guys are really good about not uh, uh, of having unique uh, disqualifiers. So that's why I think it. So in other words, there were eighteen of those eighty that were disqualified for other reasons, whether it was a, oh. a bad date or a jurisdictional error. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the answer. Anyway. And, and frankly, I only need 45. So I'll take 62. 62, <laughs> 62 works, works yeah. just yeah, yeah, yeah. fine. Okay. Anyway, very good. That is likely the, oh, Jonathan, sorry, sorry. Well, the so That is likely the explanation. Um, and it doesn't really matter if it's 62 or 80, because if those are counted, he would have enough either way. Um, but, um, you know, the, the only thing, other thing I would say is that I, I do think that this is a required element under 467B in terms of the incumbency designation. Uh, however, you know, Zybersky with that statute in place, the board decided that in that scenario where there was a non-incumbent position on the ballot and the, and the candidate didn't specify what they were running for, that, you know, that the recommendation was and the, and the board agreed to determine the petition submission. I do think that the context here is different because it's a it's a candidate running against an incumbent where the petition said not incumbent so it's a question of whether the board wants to you know provide that you know determine that that statutory required element is not actually required in this context in the way it did with diversity the assumption is that every voter in this jurisdiction knew when the new judge was sworn in because incumbent versus non-incumbent, it happened on April 11th. And so 62 people signed your petition when it said non-incumbent and there was an incumbent. And did they know that? I mean, this is a technical thing we're talking about. And, 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 and Chair Schinkel, I, I wanna make sure we're doing justice to Mr. Lyons here. I mean, we're, 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 we're talking about, Zybersky doesn't say that, oh yeah, the only reason, all due respect to Jonathan, but, the director Brader, but it doesn't say, well, because it was a non-incumbent, we're going to interpret this statute the way we are. They interpreted the statute the way they interpreted the statute. And they said that these heading requirements, which by the way, the phrase incumbent or non-incumbent as, as the Bureau and the board pointed out in 2018 are not, there's nothing in statute that you can find the word incumbent or non-incumbent. That's not a statutory uh, phrase. Um, they make it, they make it really clear that, you know, this is, this is what, you know, this is what we recommend. And so, because, you know, and they, that's why they cite their obtaining information on appropriate office designation. So Zybersky doesn't limit itself to, oh yeah, there was a non-incumbent here. 
Okay. So I so and but but also again, I want to make sure we're doing justice for Mr. Lyons here because we've got Zyberski here that 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 clearly is in his favor. And then I've, I just read from that staff report. And by the way, I didn't give you the site of the staff report. It was uh, regarding uh, Tom Barrett, who was a uh, Republican candidate for U.S. Representative in Congress Seventh District. So you don't think I'm making this stuff up? That's that's from that staff Foster, report. Your three minutes are up. Okay, I apologize, Mr. Chair. Uh, Unless there's more questions. Any other questions for the witnesses, Mr. Lyons or Mr. Doster? Thanks for coming in. Okay, thank you so We're much. Move thank on you. here. Uh, we have a staff report in front of us for Mr. Lyons. What's the board's pleasure? Just. Nope. You're going to say something, Mary? Yeah, it is the. The person who is appointed to the position, he's only appointed temporarily pending the election. No, there was an opening that was filled. So it was filled April 11th. April 11th. So the petitions he collected before April 11th were no, not. Yeah, I understand that. But, but once the opening was filled, was it only temporarily filled until? Sure. No, they, they become the incumbent at that point. So they then run for re-election. I mean, so yes, they're, they're appointed through the rest of that but, term. For the rest of the term, yeah. but is the rest of the term just this next few months? I believe it's till January. Is that, yeah. So, so the rest of the term is the same position. I mean, he has to run against Mr. Lyons for that position, right? There's one position. That's correct, yeah. Okay, so he's- It was a non-incumbent- Temporary incumbent. It, depending on whether he wins re-election, yeah. I mean, yeah. so so up until, just to clarify the way that the Bureau interprets this is, <laughs> up until the date of the appointment and the affidavit of candidacy filed for re-election, the candidate can circulate a non-incumbent petition. Also on that same date, they can, because there's really no way of knowing. Um, but then from that, that date, after that date forward, that's where, in our view, the uh, incumbent designation is required. And, you're, and you are stating that these 80 that are being that are being booted are because you you can see from the date that they had that non-incumbent after april 11th right april 12th or later for the 62 that matter yes that's correct so, and i move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by george lyons insufficient Support. Moved and supported. Further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, uh, I ask Adam to call the roll. Chair Schenkel. No. Vice Chair Gerwitz. No. Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. The motion Vice fails two to two. So That's just a weird breakdown. What, what <laughs> do we got left here? This, um, the disposition there, just to be clear, is because there's not three votes, the candidate does not go on the ballot, and the candidate's recourse would be to file a lawsuit at this point. Okay. Um, so Mr. Tinney is similarly situated, number 36. I'd recommend we'd skip that one, but I'd recommend we do that one. Okay, Jonathan, you tell us. What number are we going to next? You tell me. 36, Tinney. So this is the same issue, uh, the issue? where, where the, the petition sheet uh, did not list, um, it, well, it listed a non-incumbent position position when it's in fact an incumbent position. 36, right? Yes. And are you Mr. Tinney? I am. Okay, Mr. Tinney, uh, for the record, spell your name uh, uh, for the uh, our court recorder here. First name is Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, last name T-I-N-N-E-Y. Okay, uh, and Jonathan, just to get us up to speed, is it the same type of thing? There was nobody there and as an appointment was made? I think on this one, it wasn't an appointment. I think it was always an incumbent, or is that not correct? There was an appointment. Okay, there was an appointment, I'm sorry. So it was, it was the same issue where the, the petitions that we're recommending disqualify, which in this case are all of them, were circulated after the position was filled. So it was an incumbent position as of the date that these petitions were signed. And the petition indicates it as a non-incumbent position. When did the position get appointed? 
is that the 20 is that the seventh is that what i'm reading in here or what was the date i believe it was january 7th 2022 is the date that the uh, position became an incumbent position thank you director Berter. okay mr Trey, tell us you you've listened to the last yes, round sir. of testimony how how does your petition differ thank you um so an accommodation of door knocking and meetings set up by others, I collected near 300, citizen, 300 signatures from the citizens of Taylor. When I was beginning to collect signatures, I visited the state of Michigan's pertinent websites regarding this, and every section that, I, that pertained to my potential candidacy was marked as non-incumbent candidate. For this reason, my petitions were then titled as non-incumbent. It was an honest, albeit, or, and in my opinion, reasonable belief that the heading was correct. However, there is, as stated in the previous, there's no reason to distinguish as there is only one other person up for election this year. This is not uh, multiple judicial uh, positions within the 23rd district court. Um, and therefore it's, as was stated previously, apparently it's, no, it's not statutorily required um, for the incumbent, incumbent or non-incumbent to be listed on there. However, in my elevator pitch, I had explained that uh, Judge Salamone had retired in November of, uh, or, the day before the uh, November 2022 election or 21 election, and a uh, appointee was appointed therefore afterwards. Um, and Governor Whitmer had appointed that place uh, after the election. Because of this, there would have been a special election this fall, and I'm attempting to collect enough signatures to get on the ballot for the primary in August. I then reviewed each petition uh, sheet prior to submitting them, given the fact that there was a sitting judge. Um, that had been appointed, I honestly, albeit incorrectly, uh, believe that they titled cor correctly as I was the non-incumbent candidate and therefore filed the petition sheets uh, on April 15. When I turned my petitions in on April 15, the staffer who accepted my petitions and affidavits did not make any mention of the error uh, in the titling of either. Had I been notified then, I have no doubt I would have spent the weekend in Canvas Taylor voters and attempted to cure the issue by getting at least 200 signatures with the correct title. It was not until Amy Lovegrove from the Bureau of Elections contacted me around noon via email on April 19 was I first alerted to any possible issue. I was allowed to correct the affidavits, but was obviously not allowed to correct the petitions. A written challenge was filed April 25. A copy was not provided to me until nearly 2.30 p.m. on May 3rd, with a response required to be entered by May 6. If not for the constant efforts of an attorney to attempt to get a copy of the challenge, I cannot guarantee that I would even have been served with, the, uh, with a copy to respond to, even seeing what the merits of the challenge was, even though the Bureau had been able to contact me via email less than two weeks prior. With only two days time, after a full day of work each day, I was able to read door knock and meet over 100 citizens who had previously signed my petitions with a notary to have them sign affidavits to the fact that the situation was explained to them, that they were not misled, and that they knew that there was a sitting judge that I was trying to run against. If I knew I could have brought more and handed things out to you today, I would no doubt have got contacted the other uh, and try to get it all. How near many did you contact? Um, I turned in 104 affidavits. Wow. That was in two days. Again, after work. So between the basically the daylight hours that I had left after work. And wh why did you put down non-incumbent again? What were you thinking? Because every time that I visited the state of Michigan's website regarding uh, the by potential candidacy every link that you click there's it's separated between incumbent candidates and non-incumbent candidates so i had to always access the areas that were the non-incumbent candidates so that's in my albeit incorrect assumption was that because everything that i had to click was not incumbent i included that on my uh, petitions to inform the voters that i was not the incumbent but that i was in fact challenging the sitting judge and then um and again, going back to the point where I had turned in 104 petitions, using that trajectory, had I been given notice on April 15 that there was a titling error and I would have had the entire weekend plus two other days to collect signatures, I have no doubt I would have been able to, again, clear the 200 hurdle with the correct title. My response, uh, my response was entered on May 6. However, the eventual staff report generated by the Bureau of Elections was also not sent to me as others had theirs done. Rather, I had to hunt for it. And again, somehow the Bureau seemed unable to email me 
though I have received communications regarding campaign finance in the interim via email. And in fact, within the last two hours, I just received another uh, one to my campaign email regarding uh, uh, candidate training uh, or candidate committee training. So they have my email on staff, but are on file, but they have been unable to send me the challenge and the staff report within any, in my estimation, reasonable time. So due to the lack of confusion and the fact that the signatories were not misled, the issue is clear that the three letters on the front of the word should not invalidate the entirety of the signatures presented. If there are multiple positions up for election this year in the 23rd District Court, the argument that would hold more water. But there was only one position up for the election in this cycle, and the voters were explained the dynamics of my candidacy. Additionally, the Bureau of Elections itself was able to identify the specific race that I was running for when one of its own officials, Amy Lovegrove, flagged the issue and contacted me, albeit four hours before the deadline. Clearly, there was no confusion on the part of the Bureau of Elections. For the Bureau to say that in the most recent staff reports that one type of incorrect heading or an expiration date was incorrectly written and there was an allegation of fraud in that person's, uh, uh, in their staff report, and also another where there's listed two cities, that, that those are liable as harmless error, and then to turn around and say in a different race, that an analogous error is fatal, is arbitrary and capricious, flies in the face of common sense and fundamental fairness. As was stated before, your mandate is to canvas and confirm the requisite numbers of signatures. That has been done in my case. There was no allegations of uh, forged signatures or uh, that they were obtained by fraud. Looking at the totality of the circumstances surrounding the issue, no signers were misled. The Bureau of Elections clearly knew which race the petitions were intended for and the lack of procedural due process and even informing me what the substance of the challenge was and the fact that there is not a real a necess necessity for a distinction in this case. I ask you to reject for the, the Bureau's recommendation and instead find the petitions were valid and therefore the 300 signatures that were collected or near 300 signatures, well in excess of the 200 needed, make me a valid candidate and allow the people of Taylor to determine who the next judge should be in November and not to dis disenfranchise them. Okay, Thanks. Michael, uh, you're working hard at this uh, and you're running against, uh, you wanna run against somebody who's never run before, appointed. That is correct. So uh, in effect, you're running against a, an appointed incumbent, not an elected incumbent. That is correct, sir. But uh, still an incumbent uh, by the definitions we use. And we just went through this on the previous uh, case. So I, I think I know what we're going to end up doing, but I'm sympathetic with you. And you're working very hard, especially getting 100 affidavits. Give me a break. That's that's hard work. So uh, anyway, what, any questions to the witness? Yeah, you knew the person who was appointed to the position was appointed before you started circulating, right? That is correct, ma'am. So you knew that person had was the incumbent. I knew that they were the incumbent. You knew that person was the incumbent, but you you designated a non-incumbent position because you were not the incumbent. That is correct. I didn't want to mislead the voters into thinking that I was the appointed judge. I wanted right. them to know so that I was. You misunderstood the designation that you were supposed to be making. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Any further questions? What's thanks for coming in. Thank you, sir. I will excuse you. Okay, board. What do you want to do here? This is just another one of these brutal calls where gentleman is working so hard did what he thought was but we're, we're bound and, and tied on on the fact that this was incorrect so i move that the board accept the stack re recommendation find the nominating petition filed by michael tinney insufficient support move and support it is further discussion on the motion seeing none adam please close the, call the roll mr chair yes Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Dunn. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Well, motion passes. Uh, I'm going to go to run the 38 and 39. Is that okay, Jonathan? Yeah. Uh, I, well, Gabby's not here yet. Okay. So, okay. She might show up. Okay. Let's just run. I'll, I'll try run to go. Brenda Richard. Sorry, yeah. So number, th <laughs> we got three more to go. We got 38, 19, and then 14. So, okay. 38, so, nine, so 38, 39, and 14. I'll, I'll go quick. So Brenda Richard. Brenda uh, Richard. Let's do 30, not 38. We're on right. Right. So let's she go. had, she had sufficient signatures. She had a narrow cushion. She did have a challenge, but after processing the challenge, we still determined that she had 102 valid signatures to an excess of those required for the uh, position. <laughs> I'm telling you, the sound system in this room isn't the best. I'm sitting 
10 feet from Jonathan. I can't hear every word he says. Sorry. She had a, she had two more signatures. Oh, than she's the got enough. You're yes. saying yeah. you're recommending sufficiency. Okay. What's the board's pleasure? Is there anybody here for this one? No, I don't think anybody uh, filed for 38. Unless somebody raises their hand. No. What is the board's pleasure on 30? I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Brenda Richard sufficient. Support. Move and supported. Further discussion on that motion? Seeing none. Let's have a roll call. What do you say? Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Don. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas. Okay. Uh, You know what? Uh, let, let's uh, we'll go, we'll go Brian Jackson next. Somebody wants to testify. So I'll just yes, no. I'll just note quickly that we determined that um, there are sufficient signatures here. The challengers made several arguments that the uh, bureau disagrees with. Um, one involves the affidavit of identity, which isn't relevant to the board. Um, but um, the uh, the uh, the others um, have to do also with this incumbency non incumbency designation. In this case, if the candidate filled out the uh, nominating position the same date the position was filled, we determined that either incumbent or non-incumbent was acceptable, consistent with the policy with the other candidates. Um, there was also an argument that was made about the office designation that we thought what was uh, appropriate on the petition. And then there's an argument about the typeface uh, being larger than the minimum required, which we determined to be acceptable. And then the remaining challenges, we didn't find uh, to be enough to overcome the cushion. Okay, who do we have in front of us here? Thank you. Uh, my name is Reed Felsing. That's F E L S I N G here on behalf of Mr. Jackson. Okay, to my left. and you're an attorney, and I'm Brian Jackson. You are the candidate. Okay, well, we'll let the advocate speak first. What do you got for us? I wish the board adopt the recommendation. That's Thank all you. you need to say. And I, I would like, Mr. Jackson <laughs> would like to add a few more points. And if you had any follow up questions, my law clerk, Jack, uh, Jack Rucker, will answer any Court, questions. 54A, you guys from around here then? Absolutely. This is my running route. I'm a mile away, City Hall. Right okay. Right you're, you're in your running territory right here. Okay. Yes. Any comments? Uh, just again, uh, ask that you would. For the record, give us your name. Yeah, please. sure. Jack Rucker, R U C K E R. Okay. Uh, we would just ask that the board accept the report by the Secretary of State. What's the board's pleasure? And the the challengers are not here to contest any of this, correct? I've not seen them, so uh, Mr. Jackson would also like to just make a brief statement as well. Sure. Okay, Brian, go ahead. Very brief. Thank you. I just want to point out two points that make me it sounds like it's different than everyone else. Um, first, the actions I did to ensure that the petition language was accurate. Um, I emailed the Secretary of State and asked which designation should I use, and that's in my um, in my uh, attachments there. And I was told to use non-incumbent until the governor appoints somebody. And then on March 16th, when she did appoint somebody to start in April, I was a little confused, like appoint. I wonder if that means I should switch. So I emailed a second time to the Secretary of State and she ensured me that um, the appointment technically starts when the person files, which was on the 18th. So I used non-incumbent throughout all the way until the 18th and that's why it remains non-incumbent. And I also, to make sure the signatures on the petitions were accurate, I vetted each one. And if you could see my uh, 120 different petitions, you could see over 200 signatures were stricken and that was done by our campaign as I went through the voter rolls and made sure. So each of those 200, I did make a, ah, 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 no, 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 but we still uh, got them <laughs> off and still had hundreds left over. So thank you for your time and your consideration. There's something about us up here. We, we can sympathize with what you go through. <laughs> okay, very good. What's the board's pleasure? Mr. Chair, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Brian Jackson sufficient. Support. Move and supported. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask Brian to call the roll. Chair Schinkel. Yes. Vice Chair Gerwitz. Yes. Member Daunt. Yep. Member Bradshaw. Yep. Yes. Or Mr. Chair, you have four yeses. Or nothing. It passes. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>
And you're number 40. We have one more to do, uh, but we have, is there number any other business submitted before number 14. the board? 14. So just the last one, uh, Chair Schenkel, is number 14 on the agenda, Gabrielle uh, Manilash. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. We have somebody wanting to speak on number 40, but anyway, uh, let's, let's go well, to we got it. We got to do the candidates first. So number we got, we, we're going to get kicked out in five minutes. So number, number 14 is uh, Gabrielle Manilash. Sorry again for pronouncing that wrong. Manilash candidate for uh, third district in Congress. We determined that she had insufficient signatures. The predominant issue here were that the signers were not in within the jurisdiction, not within the congressional district. She was here earlier. Um, but she's not here now. And you, you're saying insufficient by how many? Oh, geez, uh, she was many. 34 short. Want to make a pitch for her or just call it a day? Well, I just wanted to make sure, like, when you're talking about jurisdictional issues, these are these and date errors, these are things that are cannot be rebutted, correct? Correct, unless there was some evidence that the person was actually registered in the jurisdiction, but based on our review, they were not. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move that the board accept the staff recommendation and find the nominating petition filed by Gabriella Man Manalosh insufficient. Court. Moved and supported to accept staff's recommendation on Gabby. Uh, further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Mr. Chair. Yes. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Member Daunt. Yes. Member Bradshaw. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have four yeas. Well, what do you know? What time is it anyway? 4.56. 4.56. So, so as, as we get to other business, as, as we get to other business, uh, Chair Shingle, and I think we have one speaker, I just want to note the board should be prepared to hear from the Attorney General about lawsuits, which I'm sure are pending or may have already been filed. Just some quick updates on what we reviewed based on what was submitted today. We did look at the affidavit that was submitted by Perry Johnson's campaign. Um, the individual signature did not match the qualified voter file, nor did uh, the other signatures on that sheet appear valid. We're happy to show that to you in the qualified voter file if you would like. Secondly, um, we, we there was a, uh, regarding Mr. Markey, um, the, the, the first name of those individuals was, was correct, but the last name may have been incorrect on the, on the fraudulent circulators. They may in fact be the same person using multiple names, but just to clarify, I think that was the confusion there. So that is all I have. And uh, if we have, we, I guess we have three minutes left. Okay, well, we got a Warren Councilman. He's raising his hand. You know, we've been here since nine o'clock. It's I'll make all it, yours. Make it real quick, sir. And if we stand up and leave on you, please forgive us. Sir, Spell my name, name is- For the record, spell your name for us. Yes, my last name is Kabasinski, K-A-B-A-C-I-N-S-K-I. -A -A -I. First name is Eddie. Um, I am Warren City Councilman representing the 5th District. Okay, I, Eddie, uh, raise your right hand for me. You saw him before, what you're about to say, say it's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, sir. Okay, go for it. Sir, real brief, I want to announce to the committee that I am a honorably discharged military police corps veteran. I served two tours, one in Somalia, one in uh, Desert Storm. So if I don't stand up straight correctly, it is not a sign of disrespect. It is because I have a back injury. Uh, second item is uh, this board uh, removed me from a position um, for disqualification uh, that was a non-incumbent position. It was for House of Representatives District 14. Uh, signatures were not required for this here. Uh, a fee was to be paid, um, and I did do that. Uh, I was, uh, this is as a result of the redistricting. Um, I originally was in District 28. Uh, District 28 was all in Macomb County. Uh, because of the redistricting, it was going to be uh, in October of uh, Wednesday, October the 20th. Uh, the redistricting commission made a uh, recommendation that that area is now going to be number 12 and along with number 11 in Macomb County. Um, that was going to reduce our representation in Warren down to one uh, state senator and one state house of representative. Um, as a result, uh, we wind up having the new district 14, which we would have an additional representative. 
this is not an incumbent position. There was nobody running for this position. I submitted my intent to run for that after we were told uh, that the redistricting commission renumbered uh, all of the House representatives districts in that area. Uh, it was originally 28, which was all in Macomb County. When because of redistricting and a dip down in Detroit, I had to file with the state. I did go ahead and file with the state, not knowing that I had to rescind or withdraw the uh, filing that was with the Macomb County. I was not aware of this, nor were any of the other candidates that were a result of redistrict in Macomb County. Um, it was not done intentional. There was not an intention to file a false affidavit, false report, false statement. The attestation that was done that was accepted by Amy Lovejoy uh, was uh, an incorrect filing. Uh, the filing was then rescinded um, and then a fine was assessed due to the filing in Macomb County that I was not aware that I had to rescind. I did file appeals with Anthony G. Forlini, which is the county clerk. I filed two appeals when I found out about this item. Neither appeal was heard. When I brought this this Miss Lovejoy's attention, she said, because you appealed this, these are not fines that you owe because they were being appealed. It's the same thing as a traffic ticket. When you go ahead and you file a court case to challenge the traffic citation, you don't owe those fines until the judge assesses it to you. Um, sometimes they have a bond that is placed against you, but that's not what happened in this case. I was then told that I needed to go ahead and cure this here by paying the fee and then worry about it later about challenging it. I did do that. The fee was paid to Anthony Forlini against my better judgment and my principles uh, to get onto the ballot. I did refile by April the 6th. Uh, the state of Michigan website, uh, Jocelyn Benson's website, along with the county clerk's website, indicates that they, you are supposed to get a response within seven days if your paperwork is filed incorrectly. This did not happen. That was done by Wednesday the 13th. No notification was given. I did call both the state and the county to make sure that I was going to be qualifying on the ballot. They did say so. Yes, you are qualifying on the ballot. April 6th came around. I mean, April 19th came around. And I was not notified by anybody that there was a problem with any paperwork filings. Uh, that was the last date to file. Then I got notified on 17, uh, Tuesday, the 17th of uh, May, notifying me that I was disqualified because of a affidavit, the initial affidavit that was filed um, with Macomb County. None of the candidates that are running in Macomb County due to the redistricting would have been aware that there was going to be a change in number. We are still all running for state house representative districts. So the filing is still correct with the with the change of the number that should not make it a false report or a false attestation just because there was a number change that was done by the redistricting commission that none of us candidates would know about. So that was that is my uh, anyway, dispute this, on this item. You're the only person in this boat. And Jonathan, I'm getting calls from people that have been thrown off the ballot by you guys. Yeah. And they some, seem to think they can come to us for relief, and they can't. And I asked you, right. where do they go? Right. I think it's court of claims. So it, this decision was made by the Department of State. So uh, you would need to file a lawsuit to challenge that. Sir, I would like to make the point just last point I'm going to make on this and I will leave. Uh, a lot of us candidates have put a lot of money into these campaigns. I'm a Warren City Councilman. You see I'm wearing jeans and a polo shirt. I put my money that I get on council back into the district. I don't keep the money for myself. I use it for the needs in the district. Now a lot of elected officials don't do that. I do that. I've got my campaign manager here. He can attest to that. My campaign financing records show that I put the money back into the district. I don't keep it for myself. I get a military disability, a pension, and a retirement. That's it. So I am truly a public servant. It is duly elected in the city of Warren. I am not trying to defraud the voters. I am not trying to deceive the voters. And I'm not trying to deceive this board to tell me that I need to go ahead and hire an attorney at $1,000 per hour, because that's what most of Corona has to do right now. You can't get an attorney to fight these claims. And I don't have the resources for it. I don't. So it's disingenuous to tell a candidate that's a grassroots candidate that's just putting their heart into this, doing this job, that wants to represent their community, that we have to hire an attorney and we have to go to court and we have to face off against the attorney general, 
the Jocelyn Benson and Gretchen Whitmer and against you board people. I don't wanna do that. I just wanna represent my district. That's all I wanna do. Thank you. Sorry about that. Is there any other business to come before this board? Jonathan, you got anything? No. Is there any updates from you? I'm sorry, is there anything from the Attorney General's office? <laughs> Uh, we we're still waiting for a determination on the Court of Appeals in the Graziano case. Nothing has changed other than that. I just want to say my first several years on this board, I averaged like 17 minutes a meeting. I really was proud of that. <laughs> and I haven't been able to do that in many, many years. Long time. <laughs> so, anyway, it's been a pleasure. Are we ready to adjourn? Without objection, we are adjourned.